question by Eleni Paleologu, who I can see on the screen. And the title of her paper is Following Schliemann's Finds. Good morning, Eleni. Can you see now, please? Can you hear me, Eleni? Uh, can you see? No, we see we, we, we see your screen, but we don't see the PowerPoint. I, sh I, I think you should open your PowerPoint first. Maybe you should stop sharing, then open the PowerPoint, and then share the PowerPoint. Stop sharing. Stop sharing for a while, and then open the PowerPoint, and then share, mm. and pick the PowerPoint. Stop share. Yes. Now, and op share now, again. Open, now open the PowerPoint. Open. Open the PowerPoint, and once it's on the screen, then share again. Uh, can you see it now? No, we're not seeing anything. Share. Uh, if you go to Zoom and then share, and you should see the PowerPoint. I have opened this. Share. Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't know exactly what to do. Okay, are, are you in, in Zoom? In Zoom? Yes, go to the screen in, in Zoom and then share screen. And then pick out the PowerPoint. There you go. 
Is it? Yes, yes. Now we see your screen and you can uh, begin the PowerPoint. Very well. Is it okay now? Yes, yes. But make it big, but that's... Sorry, it stopped now. Oh, oh. Is it okay? No, 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 take away the other screen. Take. Close the, 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 close the, fo the file folder. Kiri Eleni, o Kostos Paschalidis ime. Me akute? Kiri Eleni? Ε, κάντε minimize αυτό το, αυτή την οθόνη, αυτό που βλέπουμε τώρα. Α, μπράβο. Λοιπόν, αυτό βάλτε το στη μεγάλη προβολή. Κάτω, εκεί, λίγο πιο αριστερά το γένσορα, είναι η μεγάλη προβολή. Το κουμπάκι... Λίγο, ε, κάτω στην πορτο, υπάρχει μια πορτοκαλή γραμμή κάτω στην οθόνη σας. Τη βλέπετε την πορτοκαλή γραμμή. Με ακούτε, κυρία Ελένη? Δεν ακούω καθόλου. Ε, Α, ακούω δηλαδή, δεν ακούω καλά. Ωραία. Υπάρχει μία πορτοκαλή γραμμή κάτω. Αυ mm -hmm. Τη βλέπετε. Ναι, ναι. Μπράβο. Εκεί υπάρχει αυτό το κουμπάκι που πα, ε, ναι. περίπου κάτω δεξιά το πατάμε για να μεγαλώσει η οθόνη. Να μεγαλώσουν τα slides. Αυτό. Όχι, όχι, όχι αυτό. Αυτό. Ό, όχι, πιο αριστερά λίγο, πιο αριστερά. Θα σας καθοδηγήσω. Πιο αριστερά, λίγο, λίγο. Πιο αριστερά, πιο αριστερά. Ναι. Όχι, 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 όχι. Πιο αριστερά. Μα όχι, όχι, όχι. Ε, αυτό, μπράβο. Ναι. Ε, όχι, όχι, πιο δεξιά, πιο δεξιά. Κυρία Ελένη, πιο δε... Ακόμα το επόμενο. Δεξι... Πιο δεξιά, πιο δεξιά, κυρία Ελένη. Πιο δεξιά, όχι, πιο αριστερά. Τώρα πάτε πιο αριστερά. Πιο δεξιά. Δεξιά, δεξιά. Κι άλλο, κι άλλο, κι άλλο. Κι άλλο, κι άλλο. Όχι, όχι, δύο κουμπιά πιο δεξιά. Ένα, ένα. Ε, ένα, ένα κουμπί πιο δεξιά και το φτα... Όχι αυτό, 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 πατήστε το. Περιμένουμε, μπράβο. Is it okay? <laughs> Φτάσαμε, <laughs> καλή επιτυχία. Thank you, thank you very much. Can I start now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, buongiorno, kalimera to everybody, to all of the colleagues. Uh, Heinrich Schliemann's excavation at the Argolid, specifically to Mycenaean tearings, resulted revealing in a short time great monuments and numerous finds, and they shed light on many aspects of life of the people of late Bronze Age in Greek mainland. The uniqueness and the, the variety of the finds might be expected since he conducted the first big scale excavations at important sites well known through the Homeric epics, the ancient literature and the oral tradition and by chance and estimation at the right point. But it is amazing that there is no topic of the Mycenaean archaeology which could not, would not make its first appearance at these finds, whatever they are, pottery, metallurgy, weapons and vases, craftsmanship, uh, jewelry, stone vases, as well as architecture, funeral and vernacular, barrier practices, religion and so on. Looking for the appearance and evolution of glass industry in mainland Greece, since we encounter great numbers of simple and uh, especially relief glass seals, uh, glass beads, the latter being an emblematic item of the Mycenaean palatial culture, we are met with the funeral offerings of Schliemann's first main achievement, the grave circle. There, in grave one, among a number of impressive objects, small and fragile glass beads were found. 26 of them cylindrical in shape and four like, like rectangular flax spacer beads of the so-called Nuji type, but rather made and exported from Crete. Glass as a vitreous material was artificial and precious because um, 
because the uh, high knowledge of uh, how to be acquired for its raw production. Although they used primary materials were simple and, simple and accessible. It consisted that uh, the glass, it, it is considered that the, the, that the craft um, of glass making was invented in the fourth millennium in Mesopotamia and or possibly in Egypt, where scarce artifacts were produced and its popularity reached a peak at about 1600 BC and quantities of glass objects circulated all over the East Mediterranean. At this time, it was imported as a raw material to main on Crete, where it was worked in various uh, Minoan forms. It is from Crete that during the prepalatial period, glass objects in the form of simple beads found their way to the mainland, first re revealed at the shaft grave one of circle A, later at grave circle B at Mycenae, and the further excavations mainly from tombs. During the palatial period, 14th and 13th centuries, glass objects in the form of simple relief beads, inlays, ornaments of textiles and seals were adopted and became an integral part of the Mycenaean culture as a property of the upper class and as a few impressive items for the broader population. It is evident that the Mycenaeans estimated the qualities of glass, its exotic appearance, the transparency and similarity to precious stones as lapis lazuli, the possibility of not living even recycling waste pieces and the bright color blue by choice. It had also acquired the symbolic value, magical and uh, or medical, augmented by the motifs depicted on the decorated surface. The relief beads in lace and ornaments, consisting a separate group with common features and evolution, were shaped in stereotype molds, in the negative form of the representation as were the stone seals, where the smelted glass was pressed. Their shape ranges from to, to, to everything globular, cylindrical, circular, discoid, uh, and simple, uh, simple often. Uh, 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 yes. Yes. Serial to Yes, sorry for forgetting. Uh, the shape ranges from the globular, cylindrical, circular discoid for the simple uh, open engraving with lines uh, beads to the rectangular plaques with one relief surface from open mouths to the cutouts in the shape of the motif, seed or flower, usually made in double mouths. The motifs look coming from the usual known repertory of the pottery, frescoes and glyptic as plant motifs, papyrus, roset, lily, vase, uh, and uh, from the marine environment, as octopus, argonaut, and abstract motifs, a spiral. The rarest and most elaborated motifs are animals, fantastic beings, as sphinxes, demons, and human figures. The objects, called in strict sense beads, were strung in jewels, necklaces, bracelets, or diadems, which are highly visible on the female representations of frescoes and rarely found at their primary position at the excavation of undisturbed burials. A prominent example at the, the cult center of Mycenae is the fresco of Mytinea, receiving a necklace 
of various colors and materials, possibly of glass too. The objects of the second group, which are without perforations, with a flat black surface, were glued as in lace on furniture, wooden boxes, and possibly on textiles. The third group includes ornaments of various shapes and types, which are skewed on the garments through the perforations at the edges of the decorated relief surface. An overlapping between beads for jewelry and textile ornaments might exist because small jewelry beads could be attached to a luxurious uh, funerary costume too. The chamber tomb eight, uh, situated at the east group of the cemetery of Asprochoma at Mycenae, yielded a number of more than 35 circular relief glass ornaments, which uh, had been hewn uh, on the costume of, or the shroud of, the, of uh, a deceased. The tomb was constructed with a large chamber, as you have seen here, four, meter, four and a half meters by five, including a bench along the right side to the entrance, and the long dromos, 11 meters preserved, but estimated 17 meters as the most tombs of each group and the, its side uh, uh, tomb. The roof had collapsed. The door in rubble masonry was fallen down, and the tomb had been disturbed in antiquity. The offerings and the bones of more than one burial were scattered around. The collected pottery, most of it fragmented and mended, consisted of more than 18 vases, including two cooking and three tin covered vessels all dated to late Atlantic 3A2 ceramic phase. The tomb was robbed of uh, its metal offerings, indicated by remnants of gold, silver, and bronze. The relief the glass ornaments are classified in two types, according to their size and the representation. The first type is bigger in diameter. You see some more of the first type. And here the drawings of uh, my colleague Kostas Paschalidis of these uh, glass objects. Uh, this first type uh, is bigger in diameter, two and a half uh, centimeters, with a maximum thickness in the center of 70 millimeters, flat at the back surface, having a curved front relief surface evidently made with the use of an open mound. A composite scene is depicted with two horses pulling a dual type chariot, carrying a charioteer. The horse's bodies are plastically rendered. Um, their manes are elaborately braided in tarts and they look walking at steady pace. One charioteer is standing holding the reins and the an almost upright stick. There is no indication of uh, um, of any clothing, head cover, or armament. All of the relief representations are similar, but not identical, because on two other versions uh, of the ornaments, a palm tree is added in the um, in the field at the back of the scene between the charioteer and the horses. Evidently. The palm tree was added uh, on a more on one or more of the used mounds in order to differentiate and enrich the scene. Later addition of motifs used to be a, a usual practice witnessed on uh, cast glass seals, and it was considered in accordance to the purpose of creating different ceilings in case they were used for sealing, which has not been proved. The artisans of our ornaments rather intentionally elected to enhance the picture with a palm tree as an indication of the environment and as a symbol of the depicted event. The second type 
of ornament is smaller in diameter one and a half centimeter and the thick uh, it is discoid almost discoid and it is about uh, 50 millimeters uh, in thickness um, it bears on the relief front surface the figure of uh, an equine evidently a horse having the mane braided in parts behind and the side of the body and the, at the side of the body of the animal and human figure stands the upper dress torso is visible but no feet and it looks female it is we are asking if it is an awkward representation of a human ride in a horse or rather an awkward representation four almost equidistant perforations are discerned near the edge of the periphery at the thinner points of the um, ornaments, thus some of the suspension holes are broadened and um, a breakage of pieces is caused by corrosion. It is evident that this type of ornaments are not steady enough, so they could not have other use than uh, be skewn on a soft cloth. The perforation should be made while the fluid glass was in the mouth by metal wires from back to front. They are badly corroded, and as a result, the color looks yellow whitish, but at some points it uh, preserves remnants of gray, of, of, uh, gray glaze. The original color before the corrosion should be blue, as most of the glass objects in the Aegean, by preference to the special symbolics of the color related uh, to the uh, uh, magical property of uh, regenerating. Besides the aforementioned objects, the great amount of beads, inlays, and ornaments in glass, shaped in vase, mostly, twigged with leaves, uh, double organas, and uh, of ivory in uh, engraved with engraved rosettes, uh, cut out motifs of eight shaped shields, demonstrate that the occupants of the tomb had at their disposal impressively luxurious costumes and the furniture. Certainly, the majority of the relief motifs on glass beads were inspired or copied from the Mycenaean repertory, uh, the Mycenaean pottery, and the bands framing the frescoes as spirals, vase, argonals, eight shaped shields. Although they look, all these motifs have supplementary, mo supplementary motifs, they are presented as the main object on the rectangular plaques and cut out ornaments manufactured respectively in open and both open and double mounts. The composite multifigural scenes where more than one motif is represented are rare. They depict human figures, animals, fantastic creatures as preferably genie, griffins, sometimes associated with another figure and uh, or a construction altar uh, tree chariot. The origin and inspiration on a, of every scene has to be searched in the independently, but we cannot avoid observing the repetition of the Mycenaean repertory known through the frescoes and the pictorial pottery. Parts of images of the palatial pictorial programs were reproduced on pictorial pottery, seals and signet rings in partial units. Their subjects were already repeated and preserved as long as um, the ideology of the society recognized and accepted their meaning. It has been also observed that sometimes elements of a composite scene as the ritual jug held by demons, the biconcave altar, the flower offered by a woman, by women, and the more objects associated to the cult were reproduced on a single matrix for a relief bead. The earliest scene in vitreous materials at Mycenae is represented but the uh, inlay plaques well known from the Tholos tomb of Genie where two groups of two antithetical genie holding jugs offer libation to a central altar. At uh, the cemetery of Dendra, the corroded plaques found in the Tholos tomb with the, the relief depiction of a woman riding an animal. 
and uh, a male figure beside the chimera, the mythical hybrid creature, inside, and another case, inside the Acropolis of Medea, two seated female figures are seen on a steatite mound for relief glass beads. At present, it is indicated that multifigural relief scene on Eleni, glass... Eleni, Eleni, sorry, I think you forgot again to the slides. Uh, sorry? I think you forgot again the slides. Uh, I have not many slides because I was... Okay, I okay. okay. my apologies, my apologies. Please continue. Because uh, the things are well known. Okay, Th my apologies. Thank you. I only like to have a closer look at this. Um, there are no slides of this. Uh, there are, there, we have no pictures from the dry. It is an interesting representation, but uh, it is only guessed because there is, uh, the, the objects are corroded. Um, at the, the present, we think that these multifigural relief scenes on glass ornaments were an innovation practiced only in the Argolid. The Asprochorm relief ornaments belong to a group of rare art artifacts which represent an attempt in part of the glass workers to exploit the properties of the glass during late Atlantic 3A2, but it did not develop further and the experimentation stopped enough before the decline of the glass industry after the destruction of the Mycenaean palaces. The engravers of the stone seals had also the skill to engrave the steatite mounds in negative, destined to be used by another specialist, the glass worker called Kuvanovoko. According, uh, according to linear B documents from the house of the oil merchant at Mycenae, who in his turn would transform the liquid glass heated at the right high temperature to brilliant precious ornaments. The two crafts had a close interaction, possibly practiced in the same workshop, a supposition excellentio, uh, since such a workshop has not been identified certainly up to the moment. It is also demonstrated that by the two heraldic, by two heraldic compositions, one on a glass plaque from Idea with two opposed genie, the favorite fantastic creature for glass, irrigating a tree, and a steatite mold from Sarah with two griffins facing a column, a type of representation suitable for seals we mean this heraldic type, a matrix on a mould from Mycenae, also engraved with the genius water in a palm tree, is also proper for oval relief glass builds, uh, uh, as are evidently the rest uh, matrices on its uh, surface. The chariot imagery was very popular and recognizable since the beginning of the Mycenaean era. Schliemann revealed its first uh, low relief representations on the stone stele of the shaft graves of Circle A, as well as the golden signet ring from the shaft grave 4. On these early chariot scenes, the horses are galloping in a quick movement, while the charioteers embarked on the box-type chariot are in aggressive action, grasping the reins bearing or using weapons, fighting or hurting wild animals. The harness horses on the relief ornaments from Asprochoma walk peacefully to the right. The charioteer stands inside the dual chariot, uh, fashioned during his time, holding the reins and the upright stick. He does not bear any other attribute to give more information about his identity, costume or oh, yeah. weapon. Yes? Um, he's just the charioteer. 
In contrast, the horses on the chariot are the center of interest with detailed uh, rendering of the mane in tufts, the body, the four spoke wheel, the frame of the chariot. The palm tree of the type Phoenix Theophrasti in the backfield uh, having a religious symbolic character of regeneration indicates the environment of a sacred grove where a parade takes place in a processional way depicted here partially by one chariot. On the pictorial crater from the Chambers tomb cemetery of Naplia, a chariot uh, is seen among four palm trees, a much clearer evidence of a grove and a similar religious connotation for the scene. The second type of the relief deed, where a female figure and a horse walk side by side, look belonging to the same iconographic subject, and they parade at the same procession. The clothing of the figure, of the figure is not clear, and uh, nothing provides more a clue to the interpretation, more than clear interpretation. Both images are inspired by a broader depiction of chariots, either at a seasonal expedition for water or hunting. Okay. Okay. I don't think I'm lost. Both images are inspired by a broader depiction of chariots, either at seasonal expedition or war for, or hunting, for war or hunting. There are numerous chariot scenes represented on various means during late Aladic 3-8, uh, which could certainly influence the craftsmen of our ornaments. But the primary source uh, should be the wall paintings. A fragmentary initial scene of hunting has been identified on the frescoes of the destroyed building, antedating the house of the oil merchant, dated in late Atlantic 3A2, contemporaneous to our relief bids. At the same time, the ceramic workshop of Berbati manufactured and exported a great production of pictorial chariot craters. The chariot images of the amphoroid craters are interpreted under various views, including their association with funeral races. The emphasis on the chariot itself indicates its symbolic meaning. Uh, as a prest prestige vehicle, which might be used only by a person of the upper class or other belonging to the palace authority. The linear B documents from Pilos contribute to our understanding of its production and control that its production and control was a palestial affair. The aforementioned supposed presence of a female figure beside the horse is not unexpected to such a scene since we have, we have faced uh, I cannot change the slide. We have faced the, uh, the couple of women watching the boar's hunt of the Tiris fresco. Uh, I, it, it is not possible to say I'll try. Possibly I see. You share. Yes. 
sorry for the all this delay. I don't know why. Did you maybe uh, start again? Is it okay now? Well, we see we're still seeing the crater. Can you feel? Yes, but I cannot change it. I don't. I'll try to. Uh, sorry for a moment. I'll try to change it. Here. Can you? Okay. Uh, no like it to the, if you go to the lo lower left corner, do you mouse? No. Lower left corner. There's a little area. So press that button. Okay. Uh, and this and, is and also please mind the time. There's uh, three minutes left. The male figures are also discerned on fragments of wall paintings of chariot uh, uh, pictures from the Acropolis of Mycenae and the Palace of Knossos. It has been widely recognized that at least in late Bronze Age, the industrial workshop, uh, are workshops are related and protected by religion and specific deities. Thus, the mention of Potininia Ikea Potnia Ipia, mistress of horses, refers to a female deity, protector of horses and chariot industry. At the chariot workshop of Knossos, she is namely Atana uh, Potinia, the goddess Athena. Consequently, women had a prominent role as charioteers and supervisor of ceremonies and events carried out with the participation of chariots. Coming back to the material of the unique ornaments, we have to acknowledge that the only attested glass workshop was also excavated and recognized by Heinrich Schliemann at the Acropolis of Tiris. He had found glass paste pieces and uh, finished inlays, which were recently studied, analyzed, and provided further information about Mycenaean glass industry. Tiris as a hardware town receiving goods from the East was the ideal place for the um, establishment of a working glass place. The exact position of the trench and the possible architectural remains, remains at the Acropolis have not been identified for the moment. The cargo of Uluburun carried 175 glass ingots, beside other goods addressed to the argolid, a raw material manufactured primarily in Egypt. The main program of Thierry's workshop was to make beads and inlays to be used for every needed purpose, as we observe at the remnants, the mishapen objects, and the finished beads kept uh, at the National, uh, Athens uh, National Museum. Heinrich Schliemann was also the first to reveal two steatite mounds uh, for casting glass beads at the Acropolis of Mycenae. Later, four more mounds were found, and uh, a possible workshop existed at some piece not uh, precisely identified yet at women at Mycenae always. Knossos has also yielded mounds, and it is another certain workshop in the Aegean, followed by Thebes, where there is evidence for working activities, despite that only two mouths were revealed. Apart from other mouths, one was found in a tomb at Psarani Archeos, perforated to be strung as a jewel and amulet, but it is doubtful uh, if it, uh, the purpose was to be used in a workshop. No mould has been found with the engraved representations of the relief beads from Asprochoma. Neither a similar depiction has been recognized on the garments of the human figures of the Aegean wall paintings. We encounter some ornaments on female dresses with a repeated depiction of lotus and bird at the wall paintings of Crete, Thera, and Philacopi, uh, possibly in embroidered applique or painting technique, but no complete pictorial representation has been seen. 
Thus, we might suppose that the special decoration with ornaments sewn on the cloth might have an exclusively funeral use for the costume of a deceased or a shroud. But uh, their unique appearance in one tomb is not enough evidence to make a rule. The same ornaments skewn on exceptional garments might be worn in life and death as well. The rest uh, usual relief beads found in the top indicate a similar function, so they might be skewn on the same garment. The circular shape of the ornaments is also unique among the relief beads of uh, their time. They remind their contemporaneous glass seals, especially the unusual relief glass seals, which were also made in a mould, engraved in the negative, following after the long time production of ordinary glass seals in Italio. They are differentiated <coughs> only by the perforation which is horizontal at the seals. On the contrary, the holes for suspension are vertical on the ornaments from Asprochoma. Eleni, Eleni, you, you should slowly finish, or not slowly, you should finish. Uh, uh, yes, I'm mean, close to finish, very close. Uh, um, there are no, there, uh, there, there are no uh, found ceilings of these seals and they, they are not worn, so it is possible that they equally serve decorative purposes. Summing up, it is demonstrated that the relief ornaments from the chamber tomb 8 at Asprochoma are part of a prestigious costume or shroud because of their exotic and elite material nature. Their elaborated relief representation of chariots, horses, and human figures, and their uniqueness as artifacts. The deceased dressed or covered by this clothing should be bright during the burial, prophecies and ekphora, and the position in the chamber of the tomb. Among the features which intensify the status of the relief ornaments and their honor, the horses and the chariots have a prominent role. Their numerous representation in various artistic media are considered as a display of power and wealth related to the palace. Thus, the picture might be completed if we have a closer look at another chariot manufactured in clay, a local non-elite material, uh, a terracotta chariot model found inside a modest chamber tomb intact after its last burial. The chamber tomb symmetry at the site Bacurora, here north of the Acropolis of Mycenae, uh, would be characterized poor in the size and construction of tombs as well as, as the offerings. The exception is seen from the terracotta model tomb, uh, mo terracotta model, where unique finds were revealed. First, the chariot model, then a tiny cylinder seal, and an Egyptian choroid. The tomb had the long use, and the potter is classified from late Teladic 2A to late Teladic 3A ceramic face. The last late Teladic 3B1 burial was undisturbed, while all the rest of were found scattered in the chamber, specifically the chariot fragmented in five uh, pieces, 11 vases, a bronze tweezer, and some small beads, two made of gold, four of stone, stereotype and rock crystal, and seven globular glass, be glass beads. Uh, the really exotic objects the cylinder seal and the choroid have not to be deposited at the same time with the terracotta chariot model since the time span of the tombs use is very long. At the moment, we focus at the moment which uh, might be contemporaneous to the relief representations from Asprochoma. It is a summary schematic representation but it contains all the elements of the picture. The horses made in the round stand on one um, support for every pair of legs, front and back. The traction system is partially present over their necks and behind them at the chariot. Uh, two human figures of uh, an unidentified gender stand inside the chariot under a parasol supported by a column emerging from the floor. 
a tube uh, band runs around their shoulders and on surface them together by a relief ring. Eleni, Eleni, you really have to stop now. You really have to finish. You, I have to stop. Uh, it, it is just one paragraph. Yeah, please be, be quick. Long. Sorry? Please, yeah, please, it, uh, please finish. Please conclude. Uh, then I have to say, say just the epilogue. A great number, it is similar to the I'm going to, this, uh, uh, to the to the scarf that is around the, the 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 persons of the ivory trio a great number of terracotta chariot models have been found in the Aegean, mainly in tombs but also in sanctuaries and settlements their contextual occurrence has been analyzed recently by Taller and Vetters and has been considered an inclusive medium for the less for a less integrated part of the society the content and the construction type of the tomb classifies it among the modest well-furnished chamber tombs its occupants should be prosperous but not wealthy it seems that they belong to the group of people who were not in acquaintance with the palace imagery and had a far view of it but had the chance and a privilege to take part to it through a local artifact. Of course, this advantage for certain individuals or families was given by the palace who had the control on the production and distribution of the special objects displaying the official ideology. Thank you very much. Sorry for all this. Thank you, Eleni. Thank you. Um, we'll be back for questions at the end of the session. So we'll continue our uh, program. And the next speaker is uh, Lena papazoglu Yudaki, and she will speak on following the traces of early palatial Mycenae, remarks on a large red marble basin from the palace of Mycenae. to everybody. Uh, we all know that we are here that uh, the legend of Mycenae has not actually started with Pliny. Rather, the opposite is true. Mycenae's enduring fame in antiquity and the still visible rhymes in the 19th century led Pliny to the site. It is safe to say that the pioneering excavation of Heinrich's Gleeman and the splendor of the stuffed graves confirmed the millennia-old legend and initiated Mycenaean archaeology. Mycenae has been the center of research for the Mycenaean world for almost 150 years, so it's, it seems hard to say anything about Mycenae today without giving the impression that we are simply reciting the known evidence. 
I'm not an expert on the field regarding Mycenae, but my experience in the prehistoric collection of the National Museum at Athens for many years made me realize that there is still room for discovery. The soft graves have been the focus of attention for 150 years, but recently, through the thorough study of the human bones and some insights from Panayotis Stamatakis reports, we came to know better the individuals buried in them, their faces covered, or not, with gold masks. Slima's successor, Christos Tsundas, started his work at Mycenae in 1886 and continued for more than a quarter of a century. He brought to light the palace and the later Greek temple, the Tsundas house associated with the Mycenae cult center, and 103 chamber tombs dug on the hill surrounding the citadel that reveal a socially stratified and prosperous community. We may consider now his methods, his methods inadequate after 130 years, but we must give me credit for taking the challenge to excavate extensively settlement strata inside the Acropolis before turning his interest to the Tholos and Chamber Tombs cemeteries. The material from the Chamber Tombs excavated by Christos Tsundas have been published by Agnes Akelariou, but we do not have a comprehensive account of his excavation within the walls except for his own extensive reports to, to the archaeological society, especially in the first years, and some articles published in the Archaeologie Ephemeris. Another valuable source of information is the inventory books of the prehistoric collection and Tsundas diaries. It is less known that Tsundas had been the virtually the curator of the prehistoric collection in the NAM from 1896 to 1904, though he never got ofi officially the title. He was responsible for the registration of all the prehistoric finds in the inventory books, starting with the material from the soft graves. It was Christos Tsundas who defined Mycenaean archaeology with his early publications, and he provided the first synthesis with his book on the Mycenaean age as early as 1893 in Greek and 1897 in English. The problem is that there is little or no information for individual pieces coming from the settlement strata within the citadel. We have literally to follow the Ichni and speculate about their date and function. So, According to the inventory book of the prehistoric collection, the large red marble basin, which is 50, uh, 56 centimeters in diameter, comes from Tsundas excavations in the area of the palace in 1886. It is mended from large fragments. It's restored with plaster, about one quarter of it. It has a low, large base, which is flat but slightly carved upwards. And there is a heavy lip which turns out. The material is deep color red marble with tiny white inclusions and some larger pebble is thought to be the Laconian Rosso Antico. It is decorated with broad deep carved relief running spirals on the body and on the lip there are also spirals in raw relief or incised. What is interesting is that the surface is clearly weathered, weathered from extensive use and the elements of nature, from water. It was probably placed in an open space and there are some signs of water flowing, especially on the lip. This is in direct contrast with the polished, well-preserved surface of the fragments of the decorated facade of the Atreus Tholus you have seen, or even uh, the, the th base of the throne from the palace of Pyrrhus that I were either buried into the ground. Tunda's lengthy report to archaeological society includes a plan 
of the large area covered by its first excavation season on top of the Acropolis. No information beyond that exists for the context of the basin, so we may only speculate about its exact finding spot. The question of its function remains also open, but the shape clearly alludes to the stone basin found near the final throne room of Akonosos in the corridor of the stone basin. It is located now in front of the throne, but uh, its fine spot is beyond this. The importance of water in rituals in the Mainon world is well established, and so is water diachronic importance in religion. A date in every late Heladic 3A2 may be assumed on the verge of the destruction of the palace of Knossos, then under Mycenaean authority, as we mostly believe. The legitimate question why this basin could not be used in a later palace at Mycenae cannot have a straight answer. It is not necessary to date everything that is found at Mycenae and has no clear context in the late Heladic 3b. Besides, in the entrance of the palace at Mycenae, uh, it was found by uh, Papa Dimitriou and published by Milonas. We have again a table of offerings, again in red marble, which is according to Milonas Rosso Antico, with running spirals on its sides and shallow, buzzing like depressions. So at the entrance of the later palace, we do have a place for rituals in the final days. The impact of Knossos will literally define the early Mycenaean era. We know that the world annex for the supreme ruler is considered a loan from the Mainon world, and the wealth of the sass graves is largely imported from Crete. It is no news that Mainon artifacts connected with ritual activities were known also in settlement strata. Since the discovery of the written right on well, and the stones bull's head rita excavated a century ago in 1920 by Alan Ways. As objects, these writer are included in every discussion, paper, or book on ritual basis, but usually no mention is made to their exact fine spot or their specific function at my scene. Unfortunately, the right on well was located in the upper west slope an area covered mostly with Hellenistic buildings that are not studied recently. Some fragments of bull's hair rita coming from the site at the house area, that is around the cult center, are considered to be washed down from somewhere higher up, why not the southwest slope? Understandably, the, si the situation is even worse with Schliemann's and Sundat's finds which are mostly treated simply as high quality artifacts. It is left for us only to spe speculate what really existed on Mycenae before late Heladic 3b. This is the case of the plaque of the ivory lady sitting on the rock that comes from Chunda's excavation. It presents an example of excellence in art that could be associated also with Knossos already published in 1912 by the then curator of the Nam Valerio style, remains today without an exact provenance. It is assumed that it comes from the Acropolis because it is not registered among the tomb furnishings. It is often compared to the later Ugarit piece and recently to the one from Echania that both come from burials and are later in date. The posture of the Mycenaean lady on the rock is much closer to that of the goddess on the ivory box found recently in Mothlos on Crete, or the so-called Ring of Minos, though these divine figures are not sitting on the rocks. But the goddess sitting below a tree on the rig from the Acropolis treasure at Mycenae has the same posture and actually sits on hardly visible rocks as his first publisher, Valerius Stais, has already discerned. A date in the 15th, early 14th century may be assumed. A few years ago, Galanakis Degan has brought to our attention 
a fragment of painted plaster allegedly coming from the palace of Mycenae and Chunda's excavations, depicting a procession of a man in Knossian style. In this case also, there is no context and the exact day is a matter of debate. The architectural plan of the early palace at Mycenae in late Hellenic 2b, 3a, early 3a2, this is palace three according to friends at Seldon, where this stone basin or the lady on the rocks hypothetically could belong is not known. Georgios Milonas, the excavator at Mycenae has provided a conjecture sketch plan and Elizabeth Friends had elaborated further. We turn again to Alan Ways, who was a very meticulous excavator and left extensive reports on his work. Besides his own co important contribution in the field, I really appreciate him for making a thorough effort to include Sliman's Stamatakis and Chunda's finds in his reports, thus providing, wherever possible, a more complete picture of the excavated area. We may have here a testimony of this early palace at Mycenae. I'm referring to two tiny rooms at the feet of the massive block of rock that forms the higher plateau at Mycenae. Their orientation is different from the later palace and it is not included in the late Hellenic 3B palace plan suggested by Elizabeth French. This, these are the rooms where two unique works of art, the ivory triad and the plaster head were unearthed. Here we see again the area um, of the Acropolis where the, these rooms are, and the artifacts that were found in them. The ivory triad remains a unique masterpiece. It has been the center of attention for since the day of the dis in 1939. It is the closest to have in style and date, I think, with the lady seated on the rocks. As to the small plaster head, six meters in height, has a vertical hole in the neck for attachment. It was originally thought to be a male, but the idea that it's actually a woman has also been put forward. And from a recent excavation, a chamber tomb from Asprohoma at Mycenae, it was unearthed, this female statuette made of plaster, which is securely dated in late Hellenic 3A2. So the technique was not at Mycenae from this time on. Uh, there is no head on this uh, figure, and uh, Hélène Paleolo has suggested we may look in another tomb for the head. Among the number of small artifacts found in the same rooms, it's a faience cylinder seal of the Mitanni common style. It is similar to the one found in chamber tomb 517 at Mycenae, excavated and published also by Alan Weiss, a dedicated for Ada for the seal. More recently, this type of cylinder seal will found in the Uluburun shipwreck, all point to a day in late Hellenic period. These seal cylinder, cylinders present human figures, animal and trees, and are considered so common, on, at least at the Middle East, in the 15th, 14th century, that their place of manufacture cannot be established. They are used for the dating of houses and settlements because it is said by people working in the Middle East that people do not consider them valuable enough to keep as heroes. Of course, the situation at Mycenae may be different. But anyway, we don't have the pottery associated with these finds because as Alan Way says, uh, this deposit uh, was lost during the war. This area of Mycenae holds other secrets as well. Close to this room is the finding spot of the Milonas hoard of bronzes hidden between the massive stones of the retaining wall and close to the staircase leading to the palace from the west, excavated in 1975. This hoard may be dated to the end of the Elithiladic 3B. It includes a sword of type F 
and a fragment of an ingot, apparently the handle of Enoch's height finger. From my scene, we do have a large, complete, intact ingot from the Chundas excavation of Mycenae, which was found in the same area according to his diary of the excavation of 1899. Schlu uh, Chundas mentioned explicitly the women's entrance to the palace, what we know now as the West Entrance. The ingot was published promptly and he has a rough sketch of the piece in his diary. The ingot was published promptly in 1906 by Nikos Voronos and it's housed now in the Numismatic Museum at Athens. It belongs to Taipei, which is dated around 1400, and the date may be suggested also by the bulk of copper ingots from the Uluburun Red. Its real counterpart, however, comes actually from Sardinia, a fact that is already known by Svoronos. They even share the same imprinted sign on the back side, and both must have come from Cyprus. As far as we know, the date of the Sardinia ingots are a matter of debate. But for me, it's hard to, to understand why an intact piece about 6 to 34 to 5 centimeters in size, 23 kilograms in weight, could be found intact in the final days of the palace at Mycenae, whereas all we know from ingots found in Mycenaean hordes of the final days are small copper fragments and even recycled bronze in bumps. I would suggest that this ingot was buried and forgotten in a disaster that befell Mycenae, possibly a common development in earthquake, at the same time the ivory triad room has fallen into oblivion. It is now impossible to reconstruct the architectural layout on the plateau, apparently in any phase of the palace life, due to its continuous habitation and its post mycenaean dedication to the realm of the gods. If we follow these traces of early Palacia, pre palatial and early palatial Mycenae, not only in deposits of pottery that uh, had escaped later habitation, and I should, uh, I should add early digging methods, but in architectural remains, we have to refer to the elaborate plans provided by Ken and Diane of old on the west side of the Acropolis near the Lion Gate. This includes the Ram House, and we have to remember that at the time the cult center area was outside the walls and easy to be approached by the community of Mycenae. We see here the house below the later Ram House, well bull leaping seen adorn the walls. And recently we have the relief plaster head of a bull from the Plakes house outside the walls, which testify once more that early Mycenae was culturally at least under the Knossian influence. Uh, William Taylor and the excavation of the temple complex with terracotta figures and Milona's work in the area he named the cult center complete the picture. Finds from the area suggest a late Helagi 3A2 date for some of the terracotta figures and uh, the Amenophis plaques or the scarabs found in the cult center at Mycenae. Even the ivory male head, the very well known head that caused much debate at the time, is similar to the stone head from Naxos dated in the late Helladic 3A2 period. Of course, all of these objects could have easily survived in later days as objects of prestige. The recent excavation of Petra's house outside the wall has provided an example of a complete large building which is destroyed by the earthquake in late Helladi 3A2, never to be inhabited again. And we have, they have also painted plaster on the walls, some impressive argonas. So it provides a capsule in time for this period. 
Substantially remains of the pre-palatial or early palatial period have been excavated in the known palaces at Thiris and Pylos, but understandably there too the whole picture is missing. Here it does. That's an object from Thiris, a plaster table close to Thera, and this is the palace of Pylos and Delson's drawings about the early palace. In other sites, like Thebes, we have a large important building rich in finds that betray in role in trade, the house of Cadmus, was built in late Helladic 238 and destroyed before late Helladic 3b. The same apply, applies to house A at Agios Vasilios, a place meant maybe for ritual activities, which was occupied in late Helladic 2 to 3 and destroyed in late Helladic 3 a 2. Sites, other sites, like the Menelaio in Laconia, testify to the rise of significant settlements in the early Mycenaean period, which manifest their power with the monumental architecture, but which finally did not evolve into major palatial sites. The same may be said for Iclena in Messenia, which was finally incorporated into the Pelian Kingdom. And even in Achaea, we have a large building with basements and upper story, which give an idea of a monumental architecture in late Helladic 2, 3a, 1, early 3, 2. For all of us working in the periphery, it is common ground that the early palatial period is a turning point in the Mycenaean world. The rise of the palaces had had grave consequences in other prominent sites in the Peloponnese and beyond. I could refer to Mitru or Pethkaya in Thessaly. Important settlements fade or even abandon while the known citadels and palaces, Mycenae, Thirins, Pylos, Thebes, with apparent addition now of Agios Vasilios in Laconia, are all using extensively linear B script to establish their authority in the late Helladic III period. Closer to Mycenae, Argos was a very important fortified site in the mid Helladic period, and we know that it was Mycenae's rival in the classical age. Maybe that rivalry has started earlier when a large building partly excavated but covered with wall paintings that testify to its importance was destroyed in late Helladic 3A2 period. The same applies to the monumental architecture of the Tholos tombs that are plundered and abandoned in late Helladic 3A1, early 3A2 in many sites in the Peloponnese, including the Argoli, Dendra, Kazarma, Kokla, and Mycenae itself, with the exception of the Atreus Tholus and the Tholus of Clytemnestra. It would be interesting to know more of the inner developments of the citadels and palaces during this very period in terms of architecture and associated finds, their interaction and competition with neighboring settlements, which they had so successfully managed to overshadow. Unfortunately, there is apparently little space left for us in order to understand the pre-palatial and early palatial period of the major centers beyond the material from graves and the study of mortuary practices. In terms of settlement material, it is evident that even the disjecta membra of the sidel at Mycenae or Tiris may add to the picture. As an epilogue, I chose to say that Mycenae never again regained the importance in hand in the Bronze Age, but early on it had entered the realm of legends and it had become part of the common Greek heritage. Mycenae, then a rather insignificant town, took part in the Persian Wars and it is listed among the cities that defended the Greek world on the column of the Delphi now in the At Meidan in Kostaninov. Its fame endured the defeat and destruction 
and 463 by neighboring Argos, which is not listed in the column. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lena, uh, for this wonderful paper. And while we're changing the PowerPoint, I just got a sign that I should uh, mention that the presentation of uh, Professor Moroni that was canceled yesterday will be at the end of this morning. At which time? At the end of this session. So before coffee? No, no, before lunch. Yes, at, so before lunch there will be the presentation of, uh, of Moroni. And So the next presentation and the last presentation in the session is by Maribilesa Gillespie and also Kim Shelton. Uh, terracotta figurine production at Petsa's house, my scene in again, late Hellenic 3A2. Can you hear me? All right. And everybody can see the slide. Perfect. Here's the. Uh, Can we get rid of the top bar? Perfect. Mm. Yes. Mm. What's it supposed to say? To get rid of the black. Well, we can go better. Still get the bottom bar, but that's okay. Try one last time. Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm very grateful to be here with all of you today. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started if you can hear me. I gladly admit that Juno had a cow head in pre-Homeric age and that only her sacred epithet had remained at the time of Homer. Schliemann penned this line in a letter to Professor Max Muller at Oxford in February of 1874. In the following month, impatient and upset that he had not yet received a permit, Schliemann described to Muller how he had managed to sink some illegal test trenches around the Acropolis before receipt of his official permit. Within a few days of commencing that operation, he exclaimed, quote, if I have gathered so many idols of Juno and so many cows in those quite insignificant excavations, I must find many hundreds and very likely thousands of them in clearing away the 15,000 cubic meters of rubbish over the first, that cover the first terrace. 
Thus it is evident that Juno was the patron deity of Mycenae and that the cow was her sacred animal, end quote. Schliemann went on to defend this claim in subsequent letters by explaining the goddess's stages of development from cow-headed monster in earliest times to female deity with the cow as her sacred animal and eventually onto forms of Hera and Juno that we're familiar with from the historical period. When he thought his permit was nearly in hand in April of 1874, he assured Muller that I shall commence the works this week and where I'm hopeful to bring to light in less than a month's time, among many, many interesting objects, hundred tangible proofs that Hera Boopis was originally a cow-headed monster. Once Schliemann did begin formal excavations in, on the Acropolis in August of 1876, he was careful to include in his letters to Muller regular updates regarding how many idols he had recovered. Within a few short weeks of beginning work at Mycenae, in a letter dated to September 6th, Schliemann explained, of cow and horned female idols, Already more than 700 have been found. I've highlighted only a few lines here, but Schliemann's correspondence with Muller illustrates for us that finding idols was not only a welcome result of his work at Mycenae, but it was even a primary objective of his at the beginning of his explorations. This ardent interest in idols and Juno grew out of his work at Troy, where he discovered many of what he called owl-headed idols that he interpreted as early manifestations of Glaucopis Athene, he received much criticism for this interpretation and expended a great deal of effort in defending his ideas in articles and letters. He felt that proving Juno's early affiliation with Mycenae and the Argolid would strengthen his position about the Trojan terracottas and that the two together would be the smoking gun proving the prehistoric existence of these deities whose most important aspects were later crystallized in the Homeric epithets. From the outset then, Schliemann followed in the footsteps of the goddess, Thaichnitis Theas, in his endeavor to find proofs of the Trojan War and the earliest stages of Greek religion at Mycenae. If he had worked a little downslope and to the northwest of the Acropolis, how would Schliemann have interpreted an entire warehouse full of female and bovine idols? Would he have considered them Agamemnon's sacred storerooms, temple repositories, the abode of a priestess? How would he have explained the mountains of potteries, pottery fragments among which the idols were recovered? What I sh show you today cannot confirm or deny Schliemann's interpretations regarding Hera Boopis or her sacred cow, but it can give us some interesting insights into figurine production at Mycenae and especially into consumer preferences during the rise of the palace and at the height of palatial society. You've already heard about Petz's house, <laughs> its location and its evidence for pottery production, so I will jump right into talking about figurines. While we have Schliemann's ideas fresh in our minds though, let me start by drawing your attention to Rum Gamma which Kim showed us yesterday, a room that was mostly excavated by Papa Dimitrio and Petsis. They found many figurine fragments in the north end of this room during their first exploration in 1950, at which point they interpreted the space as the next in a series of storerooms, but when they found even more in 1951, amounting to approximately 200 figurines, they changed their minds and suggested the room should be considered a house shrine. And I bring this up again because even though scholars after Schliemann had rightly criticized his hasty employment of figurines as direct links to Homer and to the Greek pantheon, terracottas were still considered primarily religious objects that needed to reside in a specialized space, and any space they occupied was therefore special. When work was renewed in the site, uh, at the site in 2000, Kim picked up where Papa Dimitrio and Petsis had left off in 1951, and finished excavating room gamma, revealing a wide staircase and figurine joints, among other things. And she reinterpreted the space as an entrance to the building complex, complete with a paved ramp to make it accessible to wheeled vehicles. The assemblage of figurines and pottery at the north end then probably represented a shipment of Petsis products that was ready to be distributed when caught in the sudden destruct destruction of the building. I like highlighting her reinterpretation of the space because it sums up the progress made in figurine studies during those intervening 50 years, which call for in-depth contextual analyses to guide our interpretations of figurines. So the rest of this paper builds upon her interpretation of Rum Gamma and adds in material from other areas of the workshop to examine the figurines as just another class of objects that was manufactured to meet customer demand and that was distributed alongside other common wares. As you've already heard regarding the pottery production at Petsis, 
The thousands of vessels preserved show a preference for limited range of shapes, all crafted with a wheel at high quality, with extremely finely executed decorative motifs, or completely undecorated. And the most popular shapes are piriform jars and stirrup jars, both decorated as well as undecorated Kyleke's cups and bowls. Some of these pots were mass produced and standardized, but others still show individuality and artistry as well. So alongside these vessels, Pets as craftspeople were manufacturing by hand and at high volume terracotta figurines within the same spaces and using the very same clays and slips that they used for the pots. And like the pottery also, the production range for figurines shows a preference for a limited number of standardized types and decorative motifs, but as before, some still bespeak more individualized and labor-intensive production. So let's take a closer look. Uh, in terms of overall production during the LH3A2 period, Pets as Crafts people were making female figurines, animal figurines, combination figurines, and also models of furniture and boats. So far we've studied over 1,100 figurines, but this number grows every study season and there's still more to excavate, so this is just the beginning. Out of that roughly 1,100, 594 of them, so more than 50%, are bovine, 352 are female, and 172 are the remaining types, chariots, furniture, other animals. The numbers are a little misleading though because bovine figurines each have four legs, two horns, all of which snap off easily and leave us with a lot more bovine parts. So if we do a minimum number of individuals for all figurines, counting only the pieces that surely represent one individual figurine, we see actually a preference for females. Uh, we're only dealing with the phi and psi types of female figurines at Pets' house, along with some variations of them, and the bovine figurines represent the moment in their development when they move away from more naturalistic decoration and transition to very standardized linear decoration. The same actually goes for the females, so let me use that as a starting point to highlight two aspects of figurine manufacture that we can really appreciate in the Pets' House collection. One is the simultaneous development and increased production of abbreviated forms in both figurines and vessels, and the second is evidence for craftsperson attribution. So, production practice number one. Even though the general development of figurine types is understood thanks to the late Elizabeth French's work, I thought I might still illustrate for you the step-by-step -step development of the most popular types of figurines within our 3A2 repertoire because it gives us an idea as to what types really pick up in production as a response to increased demand, as well as the range of types people were choosing from. So I'm calling it a production practice because we get to see it happening alongside the vessel types produced here too. A good example of the in tandem development of a figurine shape alongside a vessel shape and their sort of gradual journey together towards standardization and stylization is the female phi figurine and the kylix. Sorry for this next slide. <laughs> I'm showing you a very schematic view of how the kylix developed out of its predecessor, the LH2 and 3A1 goblet, into kylikes for both individual consumption and into oversized versions for shared consumption. And the important takeaway here is that at Pets' House we have the whole development, development from top left to bottom right. So at the moment when the rounded bowl kylix really becomes the primary product, we also get the introduction of the carinated kylix. It's an entirely new shape that represents a class of fineware production that is truly industrial in nature, mass numbers, basic characteristics without consistent clay finishing, and very little evidence of what we might call quality control. As you know, the kylix goes on and becomes the most ubiquitous shape and the longest lived one. In the same vein, <laughs> uh, we see the development of the phi figurine beginning with its predecessor, the LH2 and 3A1 proto -phi. Even though the main period of use for the workshop is 3A2, you learned yesterday that there are remains of an earlier structure at the north end of the complex, and in this area we have found much LH2 and 3A1 pottery and early figurines, especially protophys. So here are a few examples that could exemplify an early stage of figurine production at Pets' house because they're all similarly constructed and decorated. Heads are bulbous, big applied eyes, and sort of randomly decorated with dots and lines. Bodies are rendered with long pronounced arms that are applied to the body and positioned usually with the left hand reaching up between the applied breasts and the right resting on the belly. Not many have preserved stems, but like the one here, we know they tended to be quite short with nicely flared bases. 
The decoration on these, like the goblet, stands out because it's so elaborate. Fringe along the shoulders and chest, crosses or stars on the breasts, horizontal blob bars on the arms, and lots of other wavy lines and dots all over their torsos. So these elaborate examples precede this next wave of proto five figurines that still show naturali naturalistically rendered breasts and arms that are applied to the body, but the decoration is now entirely linear. Sometimes the arrangement of the arms is reversed. None of these have their heads preserved, but we do have non-joining heads that still feature large applied eyes, though with more paint on the face overall. Um, their stems are stretched out now, but still some still retain the bell skirt flair that the earlier examples had, like the one in the middle. Um, the three shown here, or the, the various ones shown here, represent the range of sizes present in our collection, although there are fragments of slightly smaller ones too. And I want to note that range of size is something that is important to pets as potters because for every shape, be it a vessel or a figurine, we have a range of sizes accounted for from extra small to extra large. Protophies phase into the so-called phi A type, which is almost the same but without the plastic limbs, just another stage in the simplification process. Uh, the Phi A's are not a very well represented group at Pets' House, but we have enough to know that they're made in several sizes and that their stems become more and more columnar and their decorative lines fewer and fewer until they culminate in the Phi B category. So you saw a preview of these yesterday. The female Phi B represents the peak stylization of the Phi type at Pets' House and the most numerous category of female figurines. The Phi B's do show variation in some aspects, but not in overall composition. Discoid body, columnar stem, raised base. They usually have triangular bare heads, although some do wear little short hats. And most have applied plaits or braids down their backs as well. Decoration is universally linear all over their upper bodies with just a few lines down the stem. And at Pets' house, these figurines outnumber all the other female types uh, three to one. In conjunction with the development of the super stylized Phi B, we get the introduction of the new Psi type into the Pets' house corpus contemporary with the introduction of the new carinated kylix. We have examples that are very much like their 5B counterparts in body shape and application of the decoration. And we can see that the heads and arms are not quite standardized yet. So here are a few variations with and without hats and from pointed to paddled arms. And while at Pets' house 5B remains queen throughout the life of the workshop, it is the side type that in subsequent periods takes over and becomes the most widely produced and distributed type until the end of the Bronze Age or even beyond, like the Kylix. The bovines go through the same process of standardization, which I show you only very quickly here. Basically, the movement from the early, more naturalistic forms, this, you see one with a painted hide, one with a dewlap on the far right, uh, it's hard to make out, uh, to kind of wavy varieties, and then ultimately culminating in the super standardized linear one type. Here too, a variation, the spine one type, is introduced along with the female psi and the carinated kylix. Finally, production practice number two, <laughs> craftsperson attribution. So we know that attribution is a fraught topic in any period, but we'd like to highlight for you some aspects of figurine construction and decoration that we believe can be used to identify craftspeople. So because the groupings we're showing you are based on features of their sculpting and the application of their decoration, we think that figurines were consistently manufactured by one person at a time or by teams of sculptors and paint painters that consistently or at least occasionally worked together. So I'll start with the examples from the bovine figurines. The first group is restricted so far to the spine one type and in every case is characterized by a long cylindrical snout that is very well shaped and flattened at the end wide crescent-shaped horns. They're always decorated with the central spine beginning at the very tip of the snout and extending all ov over their head and down their back to the end of the tail. And their most distinctive feature is their wide painted eyes. If you're not convinced yet, that's okay. Here's an artist in that is identifiable in more than one type, linear one, spine one, and a driven oxen combination. Thin cylindrical torsos, tall splayed legs, one of which usually does not touch the ground, wide set horns, thin, nicely shaped little snouts, and tails that are tucked be between their back legs. These represent the peak of bovine standardization at Pets' house, and their de decoration is stylized to the point that some natural features, namely their eyes, are completely left out. The lines just engulf their faces completely and continue over the whole body. 
And since there are three different types of bovine figurines here, you can kind of get a sense of the range of products available to customers and the choices they might be making when selecting and acquiring figurines. So speaking of range, let's move on to the females. Here's an artist group that includes both examples of Phi B and Psi types. Defining characteristics include prominent applied breasts that are well placed on the body, flat discoid or triangular bodies, and slightly bulging columnar stems. Only one example preserves the head, sadly, but she wears a low polos. Again, the decoration is really consistently executed across all examples, very thin lines all over the upper body, evenly spaced, always ending in a curve towards the figurine's right side. Thin waistband, thin vertical lines on the stem, and even their plaits have very thin horizontal bars that look like diagonal dashes. And I'll wrap up with my favorite group among the female figurines because it contains Phi B, Psi, and transitional Kurotrophos examples. We're a bit luckier with this group and at least two heads are preserved, one for a Phi B and one for a Psi. You can see that the Phi B had a bare head while the Psi wears a short polos. They all have low natural waists, shortish stems and applied plaits. The decoration is identifiable especially by those plaits because they all have horizontal bars at the top and then the vertical line decoration takes over in the lower half. And on the front of their bodies, the lines always curve to the left before the waist, on the back always to the right. The photos shown here help us get a sense of the consistency of their form and decoration across the different types as well as the different scales and sizes that one artist or duo could produce. So the photos we've shown you today do not include all examples within these artist groups, just a representative sampling. We've identified about 10 craftspeople, or at least groupings like this, at Petz's house, and there are likely more. Anyway, so much for the high volume production. Let's just close by taking a brief glance at some of the more specialized, labor-intensive types of figurines found at Petz's house. A nice place to start is with the standardized types, actually, but with those that were specially embellished. So the Psy figurine, for example, looks like the others I've shown you, but she has a much more elaborate basket polos than her counterparts with her, the short hats. And this lovely bobbit is consistent in shape with his linear friends, but adorned with quite beautifully executed enclosed chevron panels. Sorry, most of the figurines that you're seeing now are in a pre-conservation state. Another important group of female figurines produced at Petz's house are the Kurotrophoi, Phi B, Psi, and transitional Kurotrophoi are all accounted for in a range of sizes. Um, combining human and animal elements, we have driven oxen like the one you saw earlier. They're usually decorated in standard linear way, but we also have bull leapers or bull wranglers, sometimes they're called, as well as chariots that combine linear and more sort of imaginative, imaginative decoration, such as this one horse, one driver chariot that we're still putting together, um, and there are many other chariot fragments as well. We cannot leave out the furniture models, of course. The most common pieces in this group are tables and stools, as well as both three-legged and four-legged thrones, some with and some without occupants. So when we add in these extra types of figurines to the repertoire of the standard females and bovids, we find that Schliemann's insistence upon Hera and her sacred cow doesn't quite encompass the range of idols that were actually being produced at Mycenae and distributed to customers. They perhaps speak to a wider pantheon that we get a glimpse of from the Linear B records, deities with many aspects and probably specialized cults. For example, perhaps Gurutrofoi were made by commission for customers traveling to sanctuaries like the one at Afaya on Aegina. Perhaps the chariots, driven oxen, and bovids were deposited at sanctuaries like the one at Agios Constantinos on Methina. Perhaps the more standardized types were used for community level participation in state-sponsored events connected to the monumental tombs, or processions or feasts, probably along with their Kylix counterparts. All types seem to have been appropriate for private funeral rites or gifts. And as Elizabeth French and others have argued in the past, they need not have, been, they need not have had specialized meanings to begin with at all. They were possibly only imbued with religious significance under certain circumstances. So to wrap up, Schliemann's fascination with the idols and his appreciation of the fact that they're great quantities were meaningful and important is still impressive. He wasn't thinking economically at the time, but we hope that we've shown that figurines too can yield information about changes in customer choice, demand, responses to those changes by craftspeople, and perhaps throughout the life of the workshop, the increasing intervention or influence of the palace itself. 
We still have a lot of work to do. We continue to follow in the footsteps of the goddess and in the footsteps of Schliemann and the many um, wonderful scholars who have followed him. And we hope that you will stay tuned for this pro as this project evolves. Thank you. Oh, the thank you slide doesn't want to load, but it's there. <laughs> Leave it on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. So we are now at the um, uh, end of the first session, and there's room for discussion. Uh, I guess we have about 20 minutes uh, for uh, for discussion, and we'll follow the same procedure as we have at other cases, uh, w following the various papers. Could you bring? So if everybody is there, including our Zoom community. Are you still with us, Heleni? So I'd like to begin with... Hello. Okay. Yes, hello. So I'd like to begin with uh, uh, questions on the paper of Eleni Paleologo. Uh, Paleologo, who has any questions in the hall? Are there any good? Lena. Kalimera, Eleni. Lena Papazoglu. Marcus, ne? Marcus, Eleni. Lena, Marcus. Uh, can you comment a little further about the burial associated with these finds, the date, the pottery maybe, the context of this uh, uh, glass beads you saw? Uh, you mean the date of the Asprochoma? Uh, of the glass beads, yeah. The glass beads from Asprochoma. The date? The burial associated. The is late Atlantic, um, uh, late Atlantic three, uh, two, uh, um, A2. A two, and there is pottery associated. Uh, yes, there is a lot of pottery. There is. Uh, um, I have said that there are uh, about uh, because everything was broken. Uh, Eighteen uh, faces uh, are collected, and. Uh, we have the date. All these tombs of this type are dated this uh, from late Atlantic one to late uh, to late Atlantic uh, three uh, a. Uh, there. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are there any other questions, Ulrich? Yeah, just a brief comment on the glass ornament which did not show a chariot. Uh, I was wondering whether rather than an inept depiction of a rider, that may actually be a groom quite similar to the ones shown in the Megaron, or at least reconstructed by Rodenwald in the Megaron paintings from Mycenae. It would be, uh, I, I think, a very interesting parallel to have that combination of grooms with horses and the chariots. And thank you for the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. I, I don't think that uh, somebody is riding. I think there is somebody who walks by the side of the animal. Are there any additional questions for Eleni? I actually had one. Uh, you mentioned that these glass ornaments are, su are sewn on funerary costume and perhaps also on uh, uh, costumes to be wear worn uh, during daily life. But at some point in your lecture, you seemed to suggest that they might all also have been used as seals. And are there any indications that they could have been? For example, do we have ceilings or are there any other indi indications for different use? I'm sure, I'm not sure that I hear well, I don't hear well, and I'm not sure that I have understood well. But um, I, these uh, objects cannot be seals. They are in relief, and they are uh, um, 
very fragile. They could not be used as seals. And they are not big, strong enough. They are ornaments. They have, uh, they have the perforation at the end. Everything indicates that they are uh, ornaments hewn on the uh, on a garment. Okay, maybe I maybe, think. maybe I misunderstood. Thank you. Next question. Kalimera, akugome imi dora basiliku kalimera. Kalimera sa skiri. Ti ginete. I have, a, I, have a, I would like to have a comment of you. I think that your the second bid. Uh, you, you showed is a, an extreme shorthand of uh, two horses and one person sitting behind the horses uh, as, as if uh, the person was sitting on the chariot. What do you think? Uh, you mean... It uh, is a mere sidomography, the second psyphos, because it has four or five eyes uh, four or five ears and only one uh, one body but I think it is a kind of shorthand for two horses and uh, a chariot a person looking as if sitting on the chariot what do you think uh, I think they, they should do this if they wanted to have a representation of a chariot I think that it is uh, both walking and uh, supporting uh, close to uh, close to the animal uh, for the moment, but and I think that the execution is different. Possibly, uh, it is from another engraver, the second uh, ornament. Uh, they will have um, different work, okay. different execution. Next. I think so. Thank you. I think we. Uh, I'd like to talk, have a discussion about this. It is really difficult. Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions for Eleni Paliologo? Then if not, thank you. Um, are there any questions on the paper of Elena Papazoglu? First, I would like to congratulate uh, Lena on a masterly presentation of the finds of recent years, which I hadn't realized how much we could now put together to illuminate the late Atlantic 3A1, 3A2 periods in terms of architecture and other materials. One of the things that remains in debate is the exact relationship between my known Crete and Mycenaean Greece in this transitional period. Um, a long time ago, I was involved in drawing uh, some examples of Cretan pottery of this phase and came to realize that if you just looked at drawings, in many cases, you couldn't tell the difference between mainland and Minoan. Um, only if you could have a photograph with the color or a clay analysis in many cases, would it be possible to distinguish between them? And so um, the contribution you have given us this morning is a very important um, group of information so that we can start comparing all the other aspects of exchange between the two regions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Well, I, I think it's obvious that uh, culturally, at least, Knossos has a great influence at the Mycenae. And for us working in the mainland, we think that the Palace of Knossos is in Mycenaean hands at the time, though colleagues in Greece, uh, in, on Crete disagree about this. But I believe it's possible to say that it was the first great Mycenaean palaces and all the other palaces in the mainland was affected by the architecture, and of course they imported or imitated finds. Thank you. Thank you. Personally, I believe that the, the extreme distinction between Mycenaean and Minoan material culture is uh, very much due to a revision. Uh, uh, 
Um, are there any other questions to Elena Papazoglou's paper? Anybody have an additional question? Then, if not, we turn to the last paper by Maribelesa Gillespie. Does anybody have a comment or question? Um, Belisa and Kim, thank you very much for this. I, I um, attending the papers of um, Peter's House throughout all these years, I, th I think that this is the Uluburun of the mainland. It's a precious pottery cargo, the most precious pottery cargo we ever had in one site, which sunk in the ground. Therefore, we have the absolute synchronism. And what we call typology uh, finds a happy moment here. So um, um, attending the attribution um, project of yours, which is brilliant and impressive. I'd, I'd love to know if you could identify the same, let's say, person behind vases and figurines. If you, if you could see right-handed or left-handed people in the manner that they draw the lines, and how many crafts people have you identified in, in figuring? I, did you mention 10? But you showed four, okay. And I suppose that you, you have many more in, or another show in, in, in the pottery show. So how, how far can you go with the attribution thing? That's the question. Thanks for your question, Kostas. I'm gonna stay close to Kim so she can <laughs> add <laughs> to this answer. Um, so far, we don't have any really reliable way to identify a craftsperson working between figurines and pottery. Um, there's no kind of place for a one-to-one -one comparison in the execution of the decoration especially. Um, one thing that we have a lot of in the figurines is fingerprints. So in the future, it would be really exciting to do some fingerprint analyses. Uh, we don't have as many in the pots, if I understand correctly. We have like one or two yeah. painted ones. Um, but at least for the figurines, it's really promising in terms of figure, uh, fingerprints. We have them, it would be great to know if the same, um, you know, people were working between females and bovids. For example, like none of the groups that I showed you cr included people and, <laughs> um, at least females and uh, bovids. And it's the same for the furniture. What, would you, what else in terms of? Oh, yeah. I would say that we have maybe four or five so far, um, at least one that's doing pictorial, probably two. Um, it's e in some ways, it's easier with the shapes. Like I have certainly potters, like a, a s small number of potters, larger number, though, of, of doing the decorating. So I can see potentially like Belisa suggested, it could be there, but the way the um, most of the banding is done while it's on the wheel, that's all hand done. The motifs are very different that they're using. So there may be something we can find because it's usually on those casual elements that they do repeatedly that you find the signatures rather than the, in the more elaborate motifs. So fingers crossed, maybe we can we can get that get to together at some point. It would be interesting. I will say that I've suggested before that possibly women were um, based on ethnographic analogy, that when there's industrialized pottery, it's mostly the men doing the pottery and the women doing the decoration and doing the handmade figurines. So within these two areas, we could see, in fact, the involvement of you know a whole family unit, potentially. We have handmade miniatures, which would be great to see if we have yeah. fingerprints on those yeah. that correspond with the figurines. Yeah. That was a question. Uh, thank you for this uh, global analysis. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you why you used the word production. I mean, Production is a material uh, process, 
And this material means that could be mistakes, that could be bad, uh, bad uh, formed, or, or um, I don't know, um, I, I, I don't think uh, the Petzl style could be an atelier. It, it could be perhaps a place to an assemblage, a place to, to share, to, 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 to share and disperse, uh, disperse these, uh, these objects, perhaps. I mean, since they are titled objects for the most part. Um, another uh, uh, question I would like to put is, uh, I don't have an idea of the numbers. I mean, it must be, it must be many. Uh, um, and um, uh, you, it is a, a nice thing to, to put them in parallel with, with the pottery, since we must do uh, some clay analysis, of course. If they are, uh, the, clay are the, anal the clay analysis puts, puts them in parallel with the clay fabrication, the fabrication, perhaps it could, perhaps not. One thing that I remarked, and I finish with this, uh, but it's quick <laughs> between us, uh, is the fire, the firing. Uh, it was different. I mean, uh, it may be fired in different occasions, because some of them have other colors. You could see that some of them were more fired than the others mistake or, it, or by it, because they wanted to do uh, like this. Perhaps uh, this is also a nice w another way of uh, a classifi uh, making a classification. Perhaps could be interesting. And um, I stop here and uh, again sh congratulations because it, it, it was a very interesting uh, conversation. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, firing and finishing, all I can say at the moment, we don't have evidence yet of what, how the things were fired together, whether it was only figurines fired at once or figurines and pots together. But both the pots and the figurines are made and decorated with the same slips. And often in the same vessel, you see variations in the coloration of those slips. Um, but I agree that technique is an important classification system that we can try to uh, work on at Petz's house. Um, I call it production because <laughs> we have so many, and I didn't go into a very contextual analysis of the rooms, but uh, Lynn pointed out yesterday that we have an area we think was used specifically for the potting. Um, there's access to water in that same space, what else am I missing? Um, we have kiln. <laughs> true. <laughs> there, a kiln um, still being explored, I think. <laughs> yeah, clay wasters. Um, yeah, and there's yeah, other open areas. We have figurines being reworked as tools and other sort of workshop practices like this that I didn't talk about today, but that show that you know, they're associated with lumps of pigment, perhaps, and other kind of indications of working the clay in the same space. I forget what the middle question was now, <laughs> but we'll talk about it later. Okay. Okay, we have time for two questions. And uh, Poppy, you are li I've seen your hand, but first we go to uh, on screen, uh, Vasiliki Pliatka. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning from Athens. Um, actually, I didn't really have a question, but I, I really wanted to comment on my Melissa Gillespie's and Kim Sheldon's paper. I'm really amazed with this systematic approach, and I realize how valuable this whole work will prove for all of us working on publishing new material in the Argolid, and especially in evaluating already published material. Uh, starting it with new features and potential in mind. And I refer here to, to the vast uh, publication work already done by Professor Yakovides and others, of course. 
I think your work on attribution sounds so very promising. I mean, I already see similarities with figurines from House M in the Citadel, and I'm very, very excited to be able to confirm that at least some of the Pegasus figurines ended up there. So I really want to congratulate you. That's it. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to comment on this? They thank you. Um, thank you very much for showing us uh, this uh, very rich uh, material and so well. Um, I would like to ask you uh, if you uh, have made any thoughts about uh, the female costume um, and eventually any reconstruction of, uh, of the garments uh, shown on the fee, uh, figurines. Thank you. Um, I personally haven't. <laughs> uh, I think it is interesting, in, especially for the early wave of Phi figurines, like the proto Phi. Those are it, it kind of exciting because they're so embellished, right? Like they have all these fringes and lines. You know, whether that kind of signifies some attempt to represent a garment that was worn or trying to be, you know, uh, d depicted, or whether it just kind of shows that. It's a time in the production sequence of the workshop that the figurines were not as in high, not in as high demand. So potters or sculptors had more time to sort of elaborate, and they could kind of cross-reference each other <laughs> and see, you know. So I don't know. I it's not something that I've worked on. I think it's quite possible, but because linear decoration is applied so widely across so many types of animals and bovids, and even in preceding time periods from the early Bronze Age even. I mean, I hesitate to really throw too much interpretation at it. I'm trying to avoid it right now. <laughs> Maybe in the future I'll come back to this idea, but uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I've made some costumes with the figurines. Um, and it's quite difficult because there's two alternatives. One is the showing um, uh, way the, the material goes. So the stripes aren't actually stripes. They're just folds. That's one possibility I made. And the other one is you actually have stripy stuff. And so you, you can wear it in two different so that it can do it in two different parts. But, I mean, you know, it, it's quite easy to make, but it's not not any idea that it's real at all. I think there was a further question. A comment and a question. Already this morning we have heard studies of high value objects, the glass and the stone and the ivory. But what uh, Maribelisa has shown us is what we can learn from low value objects, items which are in some ways, single-use objects. We either find them in sanctuary contexts, if we understand those contexts, or we find them as broken pieces. And so uh, this is going to be the important contribution to what are they for, ultimately, the whole range of contexts in which they're found. I know that Lisa French would have been enthused if she could have heard your paper such clarity. And I do have one question. You've identified individual craftsmen and your illustrations, I, I was certainly convinced by that. Obviously you haven't had time to look more widely, but I'm wondering whether you mentioned figurines made perhaps for Agena or for um, Methana. Once you have the time, do you think you're going to be able to spot the same craftsman in other places? That's a thought, but we would look forward to more in due course. Thank you so much. Yes, that is sort of, I'm shifting now from Petz's house to try to look outwards. So. I'm only just beginning. I haven't gotten the permissions yet <laughs> to look at the extra collections, but that's something that I'm hoping to do 
and there are out of 31, I think, um, figurines from Ophaya that were given NAA analysis, 25 of those were shown to have the Mycini Barbati NAA signature. So m it would be wonderful to look at those now to see, you know, can we also identify a craftsperson and really kind of pin it to Petz's house? Or, and if not, then that's cool too. Like, <laughs> where else, you know, are they a Barbati or somewhere else? Um, so that's kind of the goal. Yeah, I think we've identified some through the glass cases, maybe at Methana, maybe from some of the cemeteries around Mycenae. There's one from the Citadel area that Kim has seen that I haven't seen. There's one from the British School Excavations that is the one, the female one that had the phi and the psi. We have one of those, but unfortunately it's from a, a mixed context from the British excavations, but it's definitely, definitely that craftsperson. So stay tuned, great question. Thank you, are there any other questions for this paper or perhaps somebody wants to address a general question for to contribute to uh, the discussion? Or we could go for coffee. Then I suggest we go for coffee. Thank you very much for uh, this session.
siamo. Quella è la mia borsa. No, mettila, mettila a terra, guarda. Allora, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin this session. Let us begin with session with Eleni Costantinidou Sibridi, who's going to speak by Zoom, and also in the name of Nicolas Papa Dimitriou and Akis Gumas. And the title is uh, The Gold Kilikes of the Mycenae Acropolis, Tracing the Technology and Origin. Yes. Elimera. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, giving me, giving us the opportunity to present our work by uh, Zoom conference. Uh, can I share the screen? Can you hear me well? Because I hear you with finger balls. Okay, one moment. <clears throat> Is it okay? No. Can you see my screen? Ah, yes, I turned off the camera because I don't have a good reception, but can we, can you see the PowerPoint? Excuse me. Can you see the PowerPoint now? No, it's only your name. Okay, may I start? No, not yet. Okay. After Schliemann's departure from Mycenae on December 1876. No, 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 sorry, sorry. There is not yet the picture on the screen. Yes, the, the green, the green, uh, the green sign, condivision. Okay, I'm, I'm putting, I'm pressing the button, but it doesn't do anything. I'll try again. Okay. Okay. And now? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, Splendid, yeah, yeah. here we are. <laughs> Okay, I'm ready to start. Yes. After Schliemann's departure from Mycenae on December 1876, Panagiotis Tomatakis stayed on in order to complete the cleaning of the trenches and leave nothing behind in the fear of illegal digging. Having worked all the time uh, in the shadow of Schliemann, we could say that this period was a reward well deserved for Samatakis with the amazing unexpected discoveries of tomb six and the so-called Mycenae hoard. The treasure of golden utensils and jewelry was unearthed on January 1877 to the south of Bear Circle A at the ruins of the building now known as the Ramp House. The treasure currently exhibited at the National Archaeological Museum Athens was unfortunately never properly published by Stamatakis. All the available information can be traced in his valuable archive, his reports addressed to the Archaeological Society, and articles in the newspapers of the time. As it was expected, 
This outstanding discovery did not help the already tense relations between him and Schliemann. Instead, it caused new confrontations as Schliemann claimed the publication of a new find for himself. Thus, in the McKenna edition of 1878, chapter 11, is devoted to the golden finds of the brave south of the Agora. Apart from the four kilikes which gave us the motive for the presentation today, the hoard included a 100 bowl, a small iron attached on a curved plate, probably the rim of a vessel, five heavy rings of gold and another one of silver, two signet rings with a val bezel and concave figure bed plate, one of them bears a multi-figured religious scene, and the other animal heads in two registers. Both of them date to the 15th century BC. Certain coiled accessories and two spiral wire ornaments. Their presence is of great significance as it relates this hoard to contemporary European ones. Both types have been unearthed, especially from the 16th century BC, in tombs and hoards in Central, Eastern Europe, and Italy. The coiled plates have been generally interpreted as hair ornaments, which distinguish members of the elite who wore a plated coiffure. The diameter of the horse specimens correspond to that of their European parallels, which despite their wide distribution, have more or less the same of 3.5 centimeters. This further means that the production of such herrings was controlled by specific centers and perhaps they also functioned as a kind of ingot. It should not be a coincidence then that parallels of such ornaments in the mainland are only found in the other well-known hoard from Tyrins, with which the Stamatakis hoard shares more common items, like the signet rings we already saw, and the tubular granulated beads. The type, also known from Mycenae chamber tombs and Dendra, dates to the second half of the 15th century BC. It is not a popular Mycenaean shape, and the fact that several of the beads in both treasuries are much worn and have missing grains shows that perhaps they were already heirlooms at the time of their concealment. It is worth mentioning that such beads of a superior quality are also known from Katna, Syria, bearing also a zigzag wire design on the surface. Perhaps the most impressive find of all is the set of the four gold kilikes. The shape in clay with a deep bowl and the elegant foot is seen from late minon to later Ladic to be, probably following or imitating metal prototypes. The Kilkes drew our attention for the interest they present, both archaeologically and technically. Archaeologically, because the cases of Mycenaean identical artifacts with distinct features are very limited and mainly in different contexts. As for example, the silver inlet cup from the Tholos Tubantendra and its parallel from Engomi, or the shallow cups with gold-plated rim and handle, and the decoration of a whole shell pattern known from several sides of the Peloponnese. Of course, the cases of Kokla and Dendra, with the sets of silver and bronze vessels respectively, show us that they must have been more originally. However, the discovery of the four kilikes still remains impressive, mainly for one feature. The lovely, and as Helen Davis had called it, dramatic detail of the dogs biting the rim. It is a feature unknown in Mycenaean art, except perhaps from a distant relation to the sword's handle with the lions biting the grip from Grave Circle B, and the ritual vase from Aliki Attica with ring-shaped handles ending in animals' heads on the rim. However, in central Anatolia, such handles appear from a very early date. In the pottery of Kultape, levels 2 and 1b, heads of bovines and other animals, including dog, are depicted biting the rim in a similar way, on four handle bowls and big spotted jugs. The motive also appears in later dates in the region. Perhaps it is the outgrowth of a long studying tradition in a wide area, as we also see the application of plastic animals either on the handle or on the rim of the vessels. Sorry. In Troy from ceramic phase three. 
Technically, the keelkies present features that are not at all typical in the Mycenaean metal vessels, like the tubular handles instead of strap, and the formation of two separate plates joined by riveting. The latter can be seen on a kylix from a warrior burial in Kuvaras at Armenia. The excavators consider it a heirloom and describe it with elevated strap handles affixed on the rim with two bi-headed rivets and one lower on the body. The Kuvaras and the Horde specimens show an advanced knowledge of the hammering technique and a high level of familiarity with various types of anvils. Hammering is one of the basic metal working techniques that we tend to underestimate in relation to other more complicated or more impressive ones. However, as any of the other techniques, it too has its secrets which are worth studying. This was one more reason why Akis Gumas, our team's goldsmith and researcher for ancient techniques, chose to test it in practice by reconstructing one of these kilikes. When we see this picture, the first thing that comes in everyone's mind is that all four of them are the products of a single workshop and were destined for the same person. Each one of them consists of three parts, the body, a round bottom bowl with a vertical rim, the leg, and the cast dog-shaped handles. A closer inspection, however, reveals the hands of more than one craftsman with different degrees of skill. A proof of that is also the different thickness of the walls, which means that they were not made by the same person or at the same time, as they would have been raised by a disc of equal dimensions. This was also confirmed by the measurements and XRF analysis in the chemistry laboratory of NAM, which showed a variation in weight and alloy composition of the four vessels. The most elegant, with perfect analogies, is this one. The two separate parts make a smooth curve and the riveting is almost invisible. Every detail betrays the work of a great artist. None of the other three is like it, either aesthetically or technically. The joining of the stems, which are slightly larger than the bottoms of the bowls, results in an obvious seam on the outside. The rivets are disproportionately large, and the fact that the walls did not have the necessary thickness to withstand the hammer strikes is probably responsible for the extensive conservation treatment with layers of chrysocolla and glue performed in modern times because of the cracks they suffered. The cast handles were attached on the wall by a rivet with a small rounded head inside and at the rim by a small inconspicuous rivet driven through a dog's nose and chin. Details of the dog's features, including leashes around their necks, are incised. It is not worthy that the dog heads are different in each vessel, indicating that the craftsman did not use the same mold, but rather walks of a single use, and each one of them added a special detail to their dogs. As for the breed depicted, the long nose and the pointed ears imitate hound dogs, like the ones represented to be on guard on the famous Tyrion's fresco with a wild boar's hunting. It is tempting to suggest that the set may have belonged at some point to a nobleman who enjoyed having wine for his partners after a good hunt. The experiment, for obvious reasons, was made in bronze. The difference of hardness between gold, of the consistency that XRF gave us, and bronze is not too big, with the gold alloy being harder. To begin with, Gumas made two discs of 7 tenths of millimeter thickness to finally reach 3 to 3.5 tenths, the thickness that is of the Mycenae kilikes. For the raising of the body, Gumas made use of a wooden surface with circular depressions, similar to the stone anvils rebuilt in Comos Crete, for example, in order to acquire a hemispherical shape. The leg was more difficult and was worn through a tube for two days before it could reach a minimum diameter of less than a centimeter. The tools used, the anvils and the hammers, were wooden at the beginning because the marks of the original calyx show shallow strikes which can only be achieved by wood. 
Metal tools were used in the last stage after the vessel was formed for the riveting and in order to give a smoother outline. Unfortunately, we are not able to complete the experiment in time for the conference, but we will do it for the proceedings. So as it still continues, here you see the two parts just placed one over the other. Our examination so far indicates that one of the kilikes of a clearly superior manufacturer and stranger to the Mycenaean technology could be an import or the work of an itinerant craftsman, perhaps from the East, bringing his own traditions, and served as the model for the other three, which were probably of local production. We have no way of knowing whether the latter are contemporary to the first one or were made at a later date. It is possible, however, that at least the one helix, the signet rings, and the tubular beads were concealed in a later date, even some generations after their manufacture. The Kuvaras parallel from the sub Mycenaean burial is important to that direction, as it highlights the role that Camellia held in the post palatial Mycenaean society. Along with the European types of artifacts present in the hoard, and the other elements that were also found in the tier's treasure, could that confirm what Josef Maran suggested, that such assemblages could be the possessions of elite members who are striving to participate in a network of socially and economically powerful people in the Mediterranean and Europe? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you in the discussion at the end of the session. Uh, now, Thank you. Uh, now is the uh, Gypsy Prize, uh, Kim Shelton and Jacqueline Meyer, um, revitalizing the Beatles, recent advances in the study of animal subsidence at Mycenae. Prize. Obligatory, can everyone hear me? Okay. <coughs> so, yes, I'm Gypsy Price. I'm giving this paper on behalf of myself as well as Jacqueline Meyer, but Mary is in the back to help with questions at the end. She is our zoarch expert, and I'm our bioarch. So, most of the animal specific kind of zoarch demography stuff is from her, and then I'm the isotope specialist in this case. So, um, she'll be able to help me out with any questions. Schliemann's excavations at Mycenae paved the way for almost 150 years of archaeological investigations, which are largely focused on the elite people that have come to exemplify the site in the late Bronze Age. While Schliemann's campaigns focused on elite burials, quote, rich in gold, unquote, most of the eco-facts, quote, rich in data, unquote, were overlooked in the early days of archaeology at the site. Faunal remains, which are an ubiquitous and versatile resource, which played a major part in the social, political, and economic infrastructure at Mycenae, are one such ecofac. Faunal remains, like so many seemingly mundane materials, were historically an afterthought in archaeological pursuits. They appear to have often been discarded in the field and are still commonly relegated to appendices and publications. 
This, of course, is not to say that they were absent, entirely absent from early interpretive narratives, yet animal roles were largely based on art imagery and iconography, which reflected not only elite lives, but idealized elite experiences and relationships with the natural world. However, animal remains preserve even more detailed information about Mycenaean subsistence practice and how it relates to social inequality, economic change, and human environmental interactions. In Schliemann's case, as we are all aware, he was particularly taken with Homeric epics and Greek mythology. In his writings on Mycenae, he often referenced lions and oxen and cattle with an emphasis on their regal and mythological nature. One such example, of course, is how he notes um, that many bovine representations at the site, he connects to the ox-eyed Hera, the champion of Greek, championess of the Greeks, if you will. It's important to also to emphasize that these human animal narratives were, not, were often not predicated on the faunal remains themselves, but those iconographic representations of animals. So rather than looking at what's actually there, we've been basing those types of, of interpretations largely on um, uh, more kind of pretty, the pretty objects, many of which we've seen uh, over the last couple of days. So jewelry such as the stag signet ring and the bull riton from the shaft grave four, um, sculpture, including the Lion's Gate, of course, the, the, the famous Lion's Gate, and other mortuary materials such as Agamemnon's mask, with, well, Agamemnon's mask, which, looks, which even looks a little bit like a lion if you kind of squint and look at it sideways. As we move through time, it becomes apparent that there was a great potential, or that there's great potential in the study of ecofacts such as animal rain, remains. In the mid-20th century, we see the formalization of zooarchaeology itself, and it's during this time that faunal remains were not only routinely recovered and retained during field work, but obsessively quantified. At Mycenae, we have this first generation of zooarchaeologists, like Albarella and mainly David Rees, to thank for these important data, faunal data sets. These lists help to identify which animals were or are present and where, which body parts are represented, and whether the animals were old or young at the time of death. These are of prime importance for further studies of species-specific aging and sexing methods, survivorship curves, and butchering practices. At the same time, another glimpse into human-animal relations at Mycenae was afforded by the decipherment of Linear B. Although it's difficult to reconcile the faunal data with Linear B records, as stated by Halstead, Together, these records, records can yield a detailed picture of past access to herd management strategies in the form of livestock and dead stock records, herd management, and associated secondary projects, such as, um, such as consumptive pra practices, including feasting, distribution practices, um, and including ritual dedication and payment, as well as more mundane uses, which we will get into in a little bit. Uh, more recently, Advances, yes. more recently advances in chemical analyses such as isotopic analyses have revealed insights into the lived experiences of animals during life and death down to the individual level. Certain components of human-animal interactions including dietary and environmental factors are integrated into the biological tissues. Isotopic signatures recovered from these tissues inform the, clim the climatic, geological, and environmental context in which these organisms lived, uh, in which an organism lives, allowing for unprecedented access to the object biographies of animal resources inscribed in their biological tissues through associated me metabolic pathways. Today I'm gonna talk about a little bit about carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and strontium, um, although if we want to discuss further other ones, we do have additional data, but just to get you ready. <laughs> Thus, today, we now have the ability to ask and produce data sets to test hypotheses about not just what animals are present in the archaeological record, but why they are present and where they, uh, why they are present where they are, and how their lives were intertwined, intertwined with those of the humans at the site. Uh, theoretically, we also recognize fauna for what they are, a unique type of resource in that they are living, breathing, interrelating beings that interact with humans on multiple levels. Because they are good to eat, and as Levi Strauss suggested, quote, good to think with, unquote, they are ubiquitous in archeological assemblages. In some cases, fauna, fauna are commodified and provide primary resources, mainly meat, 
on which humans may subsist, and or secondary products such as milk, cheese, hides, and bone tools, which are obviously economically and politically important. In others, fauna are objectified and served as prestige items, proxies for violence, and metaphors for social relations. Most importantly, faunal resources operate through all levels of society and political hierarchies and transcend political and social hierarchies. Sorry. It is here that we turn to the work that Jackie and I have been conducting at Mycenae. Today we will largely focus on the faunal remains recovered from a large well deposit in room Pi, which consists uh, well deposit from Petsis House in room Pi, which consists of over 25,000 identified samples so far. As Kim and Lynn spoke at length about the social and political context of Petz's house yesterday, as well as the general depositional history of the well deposit itself, we're going to skip those details for now, but if you need a reminder, we can add that later. So with that in mind, let's dive right into the data. Be prepared for charts. Our recent taphonotic, taphonomic uh, analysis explored the faunal remains recovered from different excavation levels within the well. This study focused on a sample from only the northwest quadrant of the deposit, so in that previous slide, it's that little pie thing up in the upper left of the well. Um, cluster analysis was used to group together samples from adjacent levels with similar taphonomic attributes, such as weathering and fr bone fragment size. Here they are simplified as cluster sample groups A through G. These groups were used to compare different samples of fauna, fauna recovered at different depths of the well. And just a couple of general trends that kind of come out of that for those who might want to know more depositional context. At the bottom, not surprisingly, we see a lot of kind of uh, smaller critters. We see uh, martens and rodents, but perhaps surprisingly, actually quite a few dogs, which if you need a question to ask, Jackie would love to elaborate on <laughs> later. In the middle deposit, there are samples with more calf rinds, pigs, so calf rinds being goats and sheep, calf rinds, pigs, and some small game. And then as you move to kind of the top, top half of the well, there's much more mixed taxa. In the upper deposits, starting in group C, with a mix of cattle, hare, dog, and shell remains. So most of those cattle are coming from the top half of the well that we'll be talking about today. So as you can see, there's a lot to work with here, and certainly a wider range of taxa in this one site feature than appear in iconographic representations at the site. Thus, in the interest of time, and as an homage to Schliemann himself, since he's the reason we're all here, moving forward, we will focus largely on cattle, um, though we will be happy to elaborate on what were arguably more interesting animals that are present in the assemblage during the discussion. Proportionately, cattle constitute a relatively small percentage of the domesticated livestock that were present in the assemblage, especially when compared to pigs, um, especially when compared to pigs, which are the most abundant taxes in the well. And here's a couple pictures to distract you from the numbers. By comparison, um, just to give a little bit of regional context, the faunal assemblages from Tyrans contained higher proportions of cattle remains, comprised about 26 to 36 percent of the livestock uh, according to NISP, which is what we're using here. Um, cattle representations are also much, or is also much higher for the ritual deposits at Sengiza at 54% and Pelos at 88%. Thus, cattle appear to have played less of a role at Petz's house, in the Petz's house economy than in other sites in the region. This likely speaks to the industrial residential function of Petz's house and the high risk involved in the management uh, relative, the management of cows relative to the more abundant pigs, sheep, and goats. Basically, cows are big, very thirsty, um, and you need space, water, and time. Not everyone can devote that. Unfortunately, as is kind of indicated by your pie chart right here, detailed analysis of cattle demography was limited by the low abundance of cattle remains. Yet, some things can be discerned. Our analysis of cattle ages based on established rates of bone fusion revealed that survivorship was moderately high, with a large majority, about 70% of the cattle present, having lived to at least 30 months of age. More than half of the cattle survived to the oldest age class of 48 months. So basically these, cattles, these cattle are, you know, persist into adulthood um, where presumably they're much more useful, the little baby cattle. Um, thus culling appears to have targeted prime aged animals. Of the mandibular third molars that were present, for those who care about teeth, two teeth from adult, which you should, two teeth from adult animals were fully in wear and one had just started to erupt, representing a relatively younger individual. So basically, based on the bones, 
mostly adults. Those are the teeth, of which there's only three, correct, that we could actually age. Mature <laughs> two-thirds of those three teeth are adults, and one is getting there. Um, about 73% of the cattle provisioned survive to around 35, 30 months of age in the later Hellenic uh, 3B2 period at Tiran's, just as, again, some, a little bit of regional context. So this is, this is pretty consistent and expected. Basically, there's no real reason to kill a young, a young cow unless there's some kind of cultural indication that you should do so. They're much more useful as adults. There is some evidence of pathology, but observed pathologies were not characteristic of what we would expect from traction animals, so things that were carrying things across mountains and et cetera. There were a few examples of cattle elements with woven bone growths, including on a fragment of a maxilla, an articular facet of a thoracic vertebra, and a rib fragment. Bony growths were recorded on the distal portion of a scapula and covering the surface of the acetabulum of a, acetabulum of a single innominate, so that's in your hip. These alterations are common in advanced age cattle, uh, and the cattle likely persisted long enough through disease or nutritional deficiencies that the conditions altered their bones. So not only are they living longer, but even if they're not living as long, um, they're being taken care of so they're not worked too hard, basically. Oh, yeah, so there's, there's your taphonomy. Oh, um, sorry. I skipped that one. Regarding element representation, which is important, it is most likely the meaty axial and limb bones represented uh, at, at the pet, in the pesticide assemblage. So that means the ribs, the upper forelimbs, um, and then the lower hind limbs, things that you would see in a butcher case, basically, if you were going to go eat something. There's a lower representation of things like head and feet, which are bulky and hard to manage. So likely most cattle butchery occurred elsewhere as opposed to at Petz's house itself, and more of the meaty parts were brought into Petz's house. So again, they don't have a big cow and they're just all mounting on it. They're getting pieces from somewhere else. Um, as if that weren't enough quantitative data for a 20 minute talk, we will now turn to a sample of the isotopic data and see how the integration of isotopic analyses helped to inform the nature of the cattle population that wound up in the, in the well at Petz's house, at Petz's house. As mentioned previously, the amount of cattle remains in the well are limited. So I want to remind everyone they're looking at a rather small data sample here, so I'm not gonna hit you with a lot of statistics uh, for these in the um, isotopic data. Oh, Dietary information can be inferred, uh, inferred from carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen signals from bulk bone and tooth samples, which provide a homogeneous signature, which reflects an average signature over time. So basically, these three are like your holy grail of, or holy trinity of dietary information. You're looking at things from plant, protein, and fat kind of components of the diet. Here, what we have here is um, we, have diet, uh, we have isotope data from boss, which are your cows, which are circled in red. We also have our capra and our ovis, which are our goats and our sheep. Um, and then we also have sus, which are our pigs. We are gonna be focusing on the opens, the, the, like the non-filled diamonds in the red blocks, um, but I can elaborate later. Um, so as you'll see, there's only three. So again, not a lot of statistical analysis here. But basically what we're looking at here is there's a, there's a lack of variation in the two charts to your left and in the bottom right, uh, which means that for both carbon values and those, uh, for those carbon values and oxygen values, there's just not a lot of variation there. So basically they're gonna be, uh, sub they will have been subjected to similar dietary and climatic conditions. Things that are consistent with what we would expect from grazers, feeding mainly on terrestrial three plants, including known late Bronze Age agricultural products such as wheat and barley, so agricultural fodder. Um, the oxygen values suggest res residency in lower altitude, water adjacent, warmer conditions, such as those that would have been experienced in the Argolid or the Corinthia, not surprising. Nitrogen values, which are the ones um, in the upper right, as you see, are a little more spaced out. Um, while, the two cat while two of the cattle exhibit similar nitrogen values towards the lower end of the chart, um, one exhibits a slightly elevated nitrogen value. This suggests that the third cow may have had access to either marshy or marine gr grasses or agricultural residue composed of leguminous pulses or manured crops. The lack of a marine signature in the carbon isotopic uh, ratios report reported to the left <laughs> um, give credence to the latter explanation. So they're probably still being fodder with agricultural remains, but it's just sli slightly different than the other two. 
Seasonal data can be obtained from cereal sampling of teeth. So you see in the lower left, we have a tooth with a bunch of little ch -ch 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 marks and says teeth kind of uh, uh, crew or, or crystal, the enamel in the teeth crystallizes um, in succession. You can get an idea of an annual signature as you move from the cemento enamel junction, which is the CJ that you see listed uh, towards the apex or the top of the teeth. Basically here, what is important to see, so in your upper left, you are looking at um, carbon and oxygen values. The carbon are the diamonds or the blue, and the oxygen are, uh, is the squares or the red at the top. You see wiggles in the oxygen because it changes over the course of the year, so you can f figure out where the cooler, wetter months are versus the warmer season, which would be the summer, of course. And as you can see, there's a flat line, relatively flat line there with the carbon. So basically, over the course of the year, they have a very consistent um, diet. They're not probably moving a lot or being foddered differently, so they're probably using agricultural stores to fodder them and et cetera. Um, on the right, this is a little more complicated. Strontium on the top, lead on the bottom. Basically, you're not seeing a lot of variation. On the top right, we're gonna focus on the A or the red box. We only had one that gave good data, and they basically stay still. So since heavy isotopes are predicated on geological um, kind of uh, environment, if we see lots of wiggling there, then you would see um, that they were moving from one place to another. Our cows aren't doing that at Petsa's house. They're local and apparently pretty boring. Um, so the takeaway from these, oops, the takeaway from these graphs that we see here basically is that generally there's very little seasonal variation in the carbon or strontium values in the sampled cattle population at Petsa's house. Thus, they are experiencing a consistency in diet throughout the year, which may have been obtained through a year-round foddering with agricultural residue or surplus and do not appear to be moving seasonally. So what does it all mean when we pull it all together? Because there's been a lot <laughs> that we've talked about in the last 10 minutes. So basically, if we're talking about the cows at Petsa's house, we have a relatively small cow population um, that, was, that made its way into the deposit. So that's the only thing we could look at. Um, they, re they all reached prime age before they were culled, so we're looking at adults. In life, they were relatively healthy. They didn't work too hard, so left, led a relatively cushy life, and mostly experienced similar management pro pro practices in that they largely ate and drank consistently throughout the year and don't appear to have moved seasonally. So you got home bodies that are comfortable in front of the television or whatever the equivalent was, and they have their snacks with them at all times. Um, in death, those that ended up in the Petsis house, well, likely did so as meaty pieces. So again, it's not a whole animal, you just got bits and pieces that are good to eat that are coming to the house. And they were cooked with meat on the bone and consumed for subsistence. Um, so this is not a fun, as some might <laughs> assume, a fun uh, feasting deposit. These are just basically some kind of mundane food source that is supplementing their diet in a very small proportion of it. If we're to step back and kind of talk uh, a little back, and, or step back and provide a little bit of context and perhaps fodder for discussion later, pigs and calf brands are much more important than cattle in the Petsa house model economy, and, which is evident in the fact that there's lots more of them. Um, following previous economic models uh, for faunal economies at the larger settlement of Mycenae, this suggests that Petsa's house likely had more direct provisioning of animal resources um, as opposed to indirect provisioning, and we can elaborate later if you'd like to. Moreover, the, uh, the fact that there's lots and lots of pigs there uh, point to some likely independent faunal provisioning, uh, fitting the picture of relatively high autonomy for Petsa's house that was presented uh, by yesterday by Kim and Lynn, uh, which we saw. One possible narrative which fits these interpretations is that cows were used locally, um, or the cows that were accessed by Petsa's house were used locally, perhaps for milk, and then ended up as mundane foodstuffs once their use life was up. But of course, more questions remain, as is always with good research, right? So who managed them? How did they end up at Petsa's house? Was there a meat industry in which meaty portions could be procured by the inhabitants? Or were, they, or were these received as rations in the form of payment for services rendered? Was there a distinction between these cows and those that were consumed in other contexts, such as those within the fortified citadel on the top of the hill? We are considering these and many other questions about human-animal interactions in our ongoing work at Petsa's house. These numbers, just as an example, these numbers are based on about 25,000 identified elements, and I think we're up to over 30 now. Yes, nod, got a nod. Um, as we've demonstrated, multi-proxy context-based analysis of the faunal, of faunal refuse from, uh, from this industrial domestic 
complex provides new insights into the lived experiences of fauna down to the individual level and separate, um, and separate from the elite assemblages of the fortified citadel at Mycenae. While most, the most immediate goal of our ongoing research at Mycenae is to explore intersite variation in animal use and deposition within the different rooms of Spetsas House as we're bringing in material from not just the well, but outside of it as we move forward. It is our hope that similar integrated analyses of other Mycenaean faunal assemblages will be conducted with an eye uh, at other sites and within the site of Mycenae itself will be conducted with an eye to addressing the larger faunal economy, not just at the settlement of Mycenae, but within the uh, context of the larger Bronze Age community. Um, because basically we have a lot of data, but not much to compare it to. So get your animal people working on it. <laughs> Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Again, we will be back in the discussion. There will be a lot of questions. Uh, now may I introduce Maria Emanuela Alberti, who's going to speak of uh, Alexandra and the others, textile work areas at Mycenae. Non parlare così in fretta, per favore. È vero no. che ci sono 20 minuti, ma no. no. Buongiorno a tutti. <laughs> I hope you hear me as you heard the person before me. You before me? No? Cosa? Che così? Così. Okay, but I don't see anything here. Yeah, okay, that's that's fine. Um, yeah, we can get closer. Okay. Um, buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti. I wish to thank a lot uh, Robert and Massimo for accepting me for this conference and obviously to organize, for organizing this conference. I think we are all enjoying it very much. So yeah, thank you so much for this. And I want to speak uh, today about Alexandra and, and her colleagues and the others. Let's, let's have a look. Um, it doesn't, it work, does it work? No, come si fa? Con ma con mouse. Ah, è questo. Ah, davvero? Con mouse. Okay, Alexandra and the others. So this paper is based on my work on Mycenaean citadels of Mycenaean peeps during my Marie Curie um, scholarship at Sheffield. And it's part of the forthcoming volume, very forthcoming, uh, Palace Towns, the economic organization of Mycenaean Thebes during the late Elladic 3D2 and 3D periods. It is based on published evidence, so there are obvious limits and misunderstandings, so I really would like you to give a feedback, per perhaps afterwards, but any, if there is any mistake, any misunderstandings, please tell me before I publish, that would be very important. Okay, so as many of you know, I think most of you know, uh, there is this tablet from the ivory houses that lists a series of women listed by their names that receive the Minia beddings. And there is this other tablet from the ivory houses, another, another structure, the ivory houses listing women listed by their names receiving oil, olive oil, a special kind of olive oil. Mm. As you see here, uh, some of these names are some of the names are the same. You see the Mano, uh, Anna, uh, Kera, So. And in this first tablet, in the second line, I don't know if you see, can I? Uh, you see the, the arrow? 
Yeah? You see Arika Sadara? This is Alexandra, okay? So we have an Alexandra and these colleagues here, and then Ada, some of the colleagues of Alexandra here, and these two trade names, Eropakeia and Akitiria, um, who are obviously uh, textile trade names. Mm. So according to most scholar, these two tablets concern textile workers. So all the name li names listed here should be of textile workers. Theoretically, we, we, we assume this without discussion. Um, but where did all these textile specialists actually work? This is the main problem. Um, the tablets tell us that Mancini and Mancini wool deliveries and textile workers are recorded with no place names. So possibly they had to be at Mycenae itself. This is for Mycenae. And this is, also, this is true also for Thebes and for part of the text from Pylos and Knossos. So we have to think that most of the textile units are probably located in the center. But where in the center? Are they in the Palatia core? Are they widespread in the lower town? We don't have serious indications from the tablet. So used to use As we all know uh, linear, from linear B, we know that the textile industry was quite specialized on large scale and was very important for palatial organization. And we don't go further on this. Um, so the question is not uh, to establish whether Mycenaean textile production was important, but to find in the, archeolo in the archeological evidence convincing parallels to the linear B information. Um, so, and do have enough archaeological evidence for this, and presently the amount of material evidence available to reconstruct the industry is still quite scarce and not homogeneous. Notwithstanding significant recent improvements, especially thanks to CTR, the amount of published materials remains limited. Um, few assemblages have been fully published, meaning the catalog, fully published, and is especially in the Horia and Tirins. The situation is improving, and especially uh, yeah, the Center of Textile Research in Copenhagen and many other projects are linked to the activity of the center, and uh, these, are, these are now a, a generation of scholars working on textile, um, did some work about it, and especially a special, a special achievement is the publication of this book called Tools and Textiles, Text and Context, TTTC, in 2015. Uh, where the analysis of textile tools from various Bronze Age material sites are provided, is provided, and the book includes an illustration of textile tools from Nidea, from Thebes, from Tirins, and from Mycenae as well. But it's not full catalog, this is a synthesis of the evidence. It's very important because if you have to consider, if you make a thorough analysis, you need the catalog, and we don't have the catalog. So, provisional observation of Mycenaean textile tools based on Nihorian theories, and this is okay, this is true, let's say, also for the other Mycenaean sites, speaking Helladic Mycenaean sites. During the palatial phases, textile tools are different from previous and following phases. The, we have a predominance of small satellite spindle walls and presence of discard loom weights. So, we guess that there is a possible specialization in fine threads and compact fabrics. It's a guess. At the end of the period, spool shaped loom weights appear, and in post palatial phases, the spindle walls have a wider range of dimensions, and also this, the, the loom weights have various sizes. So the, what we can imagine is that during post palatial phases, the production was more varied and less specialized. And you see here the graphic. You have, um, if I can do it, let's see what it is. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used. Um, okay, here you have in on your okay this side you have the uh, Mycenaean palatial stuff, and the other side you have the post palatial stuff from Tirins, and you see the peak of dimension of um, uh, spindle walls. They all clustering uh, together in in the larger in the the, the lighter um, side. So. Uh, about work areas, you know that it's very difficult to find a proper work areas, and there is a possible and generally and general, very, very common superposition with repositories for work activities, and that in for 
during palatial period, we have various productions in the same place, so cross crop was quite common. Um, especially ivory carving, glass working, jewelry making, uh, that make, includes obviously metal and store working. All this stuff uh, recur in palatial workshops in Mycenaean period. And the, the idea of carving, the, or store working, let's say, is very important and has been uh, suggested that the uh, Koiro Woko, Koiro Ross, make of all the stuff, was a very important craftsman for the prestige production of palaces. Textile tools and Mycenae, again from publications. Um, poss poss possible textile tools are ubiquitous in the, rep the reports, at the mansions, uh, clay spindle walls and spinning of spondilia, steatite buttons, cubia steatitis. And when the data is given, often we have groups of circa 20 items, but we should understand what that means. Uh, only in a few cases, loom weights are recognized or mentioned. Um, the assemblages of textile tools are seldom published and even more rarely weighed. That's very crucial to weigh textile tools. Um, a recent survey by Tonavito and Ali um, says that th we have more than 1,500 textile tools on the site, but mostly from funerary assemblages or not from secure context. So it's very difficult to, to make a context analysis of these findings. The widespread presence in the reports of Connolly spindle walls and the lack of detailed publications open various questions, and especially, can some of these tools be in non-functional context? So the, what I would like to propose you is a, an attempt to differentiate the finding context in textile tool production, textile tool storage, and textile tool actual use. Mm. So the textile production will be only in the actual use. This is not easy, uh, and obviously the results here are based on the general character of the examine structure, structures mostly. So textile tools production. Um, the proposal, my, my proposal, is that the steatite buttons are found within ivory carving and jewelry, not from my proposal, it's not what's what happened. Um, steatite buttons are found within ivory carving and jewelry making work areas or related repositories. Uh, my proposal is that there is a connection with the carving activities for palatial craft production. Mm -hmm. And this is proved, let's say, by the presence of both finished and unfinished stone connolly in a Mycenaean building near Nafplio. So we've, we, had, we had at least one workshop doing this. Um, at Mycenae, um, one of the best candidates for this is room 36 for the um, service area of the Cal Center. Um, you see the relevant data here. We have 55 connuli, 11 of them are un unfinished, apparently. And we have different indicators of work activities. Among these, also 80 be beads in glass and stone, ivory in process, and other. We also have antler tools with point pointed antler tools that are found nearby. So they could have been beaters or something related to textile activity, who knows. Um, the area has been um, interpreted as repository for craft activities, and there is a possible connection with cart. In the same area, we have worked and unworked steatite nodules from the same area. So um, my guess here is that since we have the beads, we have worked and unworked steatite nodules, that this area and somehow uh, collect the evidence of people working on various stuff and also producing spindle walls. I'm not saying that they were doing there. Uh, I'm, I'm not, not trying to locate the activity, but the general evidence can suggest this. Uh, the same can be, can be told for the artisan quarter. Um, the uh, investigations by Milonas, and you have all the text by Milonas in my, my back. Again, a very important, I mean, rest of what, what is left of a remains very important workshops with many, with many different activities being uh, performed. And among all, uh, among these we, uh, we have ivory chips, opal stones, a large piece of green steatite from which many smaller pieces have been severed, uh, and then small beads and ivory and glass beautiful carved and so on. So we apparently we have a carving workshop there, among other th things. And my suggestion is that they were using this steatite to 
make spindle walls. So let's go to textile tool storage and distribution contracts. Uh, the structure are larger than mass storing administrative units. Um, my idea is that these the textile tools coming from carving workshops were stored in these areas to be distributed to textile workers. It's a hypothesis. And another hypothesis is that there is a link between the um, uh, distribution of wool to the workers and distribution of spindle walls. This is not only my idea, obviously, as you see. I, and I don't comment references, otherwise we won't finish, but I mean, there is, you see. Uh, one best candidate for this is the ivory houses. You know all what is, what is, what, what's about, so I can jump to the description. So my proposal is that the, in the ivory houses, we can see the old picture from the carver's job lot to the textile worker, workers. So we, then we don't have mention of uh, spindle walls from the West House. We do have spindle walls from House of Shields, along with stone and faience vases. So possibly we have textile tools stored there. So they came from the, uh, the workshop, it was stored there. Uh, we also have, from the same structure, the text, Pucateria, Klatz, sent to Thebes. Mm. House of Sphinx is more or less the same stuff. So we have ivory inlays and stone vases. Stone Connolly with tool marks, one clay wall, a possible wall loom weight. So again, more or less the same situation. From the house of the oil mentioned, we have again spindle walls from various rooms, this time really clearly from the upper floor. Um, from the text, we know that they were distributing wool and oil as we saw, and to the textile workers. So for the house of oil mentioned, we can even suggest that we distributing the tools with the wall to the textile workers. This is the most, most or less the idea. Um, another storage area could be the North Quarter. From the recent excavations uh, of what was left, uh, again, different uh, indicators of different activities, among which uh, 200 glass beads, a satellite connolly, clay connolly, a wall, uh, bone points, so again, we can have, we can see that there is a mixture of carved items and textile items possibly stored again. The same for the North storerooms. And I think it's not necessary, we can jump, I think. So this is the storing context, and then we, got, we go to the dubious context, production, storage, or even use. Um, and this is house theta from the Southwestern complex. Um, there's a structure who yielded many different indicators, but it's very difficult to understand if they were actually production, producting things or storing or whatever. And then we have the two groups of 20 commonly in spindle walls. And debris of unworked ivories, bore stars, various items of glass. So again, we could, they could have been working the stuff or just storing or perhaps even using, it's not, it's not clear. But it's very, it's an important cluster of, of spindle walls, at least. Use context, um, where uh, if we don't have a lot of craft activities and large-scale storage, so we, we say that it's residential, basically, this, <laughs> that's very, a very difficult uh, issue. So in the Panahia houses, especially house two, we have, this is a large household, uh, we don't have um, important indication of craft, or craft activity, no storage, but we have 15 stone buttons, only three apparently from secure context, and they are again from the upper floor debris. And there are spindle walls from the other two panel houses and the, from the area. So possibly here they were using the spindle walls. Um, at the same idea, basically, could be proposed for the House of Platius. Again, no craft activity, no storage activity, possibly drink, I don't know, and again, quite a lot of uh, corn only. So this is the picture. Unfortunately, the, the color we, we, cho we chose with the illustrator are not really telling. Um, so you have the product, the possible production in purple, then the storage in red, and the um, possible fabrication in brown, uh, used in brown. But it's 
different periods, so it doesn't really. So uh, these are all these are all contexts for which I don't have data. And so possibly there are spindle walls there, a loom weights, but I, did, I don't know. So if, if you know there are, please just tell me <laughs> so I can help them do the work. Some caution is needed. This reconstruction reposes some doubtful evidence and uncertainties as many. The identification of use context, especially actual textile production areas, is particularly problematic. While in some cases, spindle walls were actually found on the floor or in the destruction layer immediately above it. In most cases, they come from the fillings, and it's very, it's very difficult to tell if they belong to the ground floor, to the upper floor, or even if they were washed there from some other room building. Uh, the difficulties in documenting the upper floors are of the main importance here, since in theory, especially webbing, spinnables or webbing, especially webbing, would need good light conditions. Um, so we can imagine that um, these activities were taking place in the upper sector of the buildings, um, as we saw in Akrotiri, where the major concentration loom weights was in the upper floor of the West House. So the hypothesis that the missing textile tools area were actually on the upper floor of the examined structures, especially because textile workers and textile working units are supposedly to be located in town, according to Lina B. Tex. So if the Lina B. Tex tell, tell us that they, they should be there and we don't find them, those are, they should be perhaps on the upper floor. That's the hypothesis. So let's go back to Alexandra and her colleagues. Why are they receiving the Mimia? So again, this is the evidence, the distribution of beddings and special type of oil to textile workers. And it has been also pointed out that oil could be used for spinning better and to, to, to give the wool some, mm, to, to, make, to, to make the wool be spinned easier. Um, so we have Eropakaya and Dagetiria, Puine, <laughs> that is, that are textile workers. Um, and they were, why they were provided with beddings? The, the parties have been, this has been suggested already, they, possibly because they were to stay in the palatial premises, possibly in the upper floor, the same palatial buildings, if not in the iron houses themselves. And they received beddings, and they are mentioned by name because they received the stuff personally and will be on hand. Mm. So there is a direct control of the workers by the uh, administration. And also we have the class sent to Thebes. Mm. That's not to, not to forget. Um, from the publication of the ivory houses, we know that the spindle walls, the house of sheets, house of the oil merchant, are described as scratched and worn in most cases, but originally polished. So possibly they, were, they have been used. We also have a possible loom weight from the House of Sphinxes. And according to the recent survey by Tornavida Valley, we can have a non-functional role of the walls in shield and sphinxes, but possibly spinning in the oil merchant house. So again, the hypothesis is to see in the oil houses also, in addition to all many other stuff, also a textile management unit. So they were stored and distributing the wool. They had special oil for spinning and spin the walls to textile workers. They were hosting the workers in the premises. They give beddings, possibly controlling their work directly so they don't take any record of it, but this is quite uh, hypothetical, I can understand. Both spinning and webbing could be attested. And after all that, they were managing the output, sending some of the products away. So to sum up, um, we know that Mycenae and Thebes see that they are most involved in collections, storage, distribution, administration of anything, everything, and in carving, assembling, polish, or craft products. The bottom cannoli and stone spindle walls are made within the same carving work areas than jewelry, so there is a sort of cross craft. They are manufactured according to palish standard. Um, for textile production, so they can ensure homogeneity of textile tools and so homogeneity of the threads and fabric produced. They are stored in stone administrative units and distributed to various work groups, even single workers. And some of the main units in the citadel may have also textile work areas. And the actual textile production can take place both inside and outside the citadel. But all these, this is the palatial all this coexists with more domestic production, always. And the, the two things are connected in most cases. 
and it's finished. Thank you very much, molte grazie. Thank you very much. Um, the organizer told me that since we are running out of time, the discussion will be at the end of the afternoon, uh, the discussion of this session at the end of the afternoon. So now it's uh, the moment of Diana Wardle telling us wonderful things about Nestor's Cafe. <laughs> I brought my alive Agamemnon with me in order to change the slides, so I hope you'll forgive me. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to the organizers uh, of this conference, which has been superb. But I'm particularly excited by it because half a century ago, I worked in the British Museum. And I worked in the British Museum on, in a little room with no windows. It's an old building. with no windows and no lights either. And I was employed as a draftsman. So you can see that was very useful. And I was given a whole load of pottery to draw. You've never seen anything so boring. It was brown and boring and dull. And as I looked at it, I realized that it wasn't at all. Actually, it was decorated underneath. So I said to my, I'm what you call line manager now, I suppose, I said, look, this is decorated. She said, so I said, can I wash it? And she said, no, you're employed as a draftsman, not as a conservator. I said, well, you're wasting your money. And she said, I was in my very early 20s, and I wasn't very tactful. And uh, anyway, this is the stuff, and it came from this funny site called Tharos. I had no idea where Tharos was, and they didn't bother to tell me because I was so low. I didn't need to know anything like that. Anyway, here it is, and here I am half a century later. So exciting. Now, um, I, I put those rather uh, dull pots at the bottom. I mean, the, the monkey's marvelous. And, uh, and as you see, it's a good job we discovered he was decorated. But the one at the bottom is, I have to apologize now to, to this person in the British Museum because I was in my 20s and exceptionally rude. She said to me one morning when I got back in, she said, in that kind of voice that you hate, I want to talk to you. Oh no, oh no, what have I done now? And she said, I told you not to wash the pottery. Well, I haven't washed the pottery, I just wiped it with the wet cloth, which is useless, I may say, like, like, you, like you told me. And she said, you have smudged the paint. And I looked at her and I thought, my God, this woman, is senior to me and employed and an expert. And I said, you stupid person. I said, that happened when it was made by the potter. Well, that didn't go down very well, as you can imagine. I, so in fact, when you look in the publication, you will not see my name mentioned and the things that I drew because I got blacklisted very much so. So I do apologize to her now in half a century later she was a stupid person. Anyway, um, that's a digression. Next, please, Ken. Now, here you have Nestor's cups, both of them. And I'm not going to talk to you about either of them. I've just put them in, so I'll show you how very intelligent and well-researched I am. And there it is. Next, please. 
What I'm going to talk about is the, because it is a Schliemann uh, meeting, um, the cup that Schliemann found in the shaft graves, well known to every single one of us. Um, and I leave that there for 10 nanoseconds because you really don't need to read it. You must have read it 100 times before. Next. Here we have two versions of the cup. One is the one that Schliemann publishes on the left, and the one is that Schuchart uh, has straightened it out to, to have it there. And it, it is a understandable that Schliemann thought that it was Nestor's cup, and it's a pretty good name for it. And I see no reason why it should be changed. So, next, please. It has, uh, you, you, you see on your left, you have a very strange um, uh, Nestor's cup. What we have is a disc of gold. It's made from a single disc. This is a really clever vessel. You know, um, you have to realize that these primitive men who ran around in skins going, oh, 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 were extremely fine craftsmen. Now, trying to explain that to the general public is not easy. But they were. This is beautifully made. This part of the cup is fabulous. Now, it had handles, and I have a little story to tell you, which perhaps goes like we are at a banquet with Agamemnon and various other people, and they are drinking away, and he has his new goblet. Now, his new goblet is completely hollow. I mean, most of you will know this, but some of you might not know that when you pour the wine into the actual Nestor's cup, it goes right down into the foot. So it's a good heavy one. So that, again, is another thing matching with it. And he may have said, and this is completely hypothesis, that I want, I've seen these, these cups with rather interesting, what we call cotton reel handles, and I want one, I want two on mine. So the next one, please. Now, I've actually found um, uh, examples of these. I'm not, I'm not inventing totally. So here's the one with two handles, and maybe that was what it was. So he goes back to his banquet. Now, they haven't been put on very well. They're good. They're good, but they're not quite as good as the original cup. So he goes back, and... He has another banquet, and he drinks rather too much, and he falls over because the cup is a bit wobbly, and it looks crunched up. So he calls for his man of all work, and Ken, you see, he, there was, there was his, this is the one I mentioned. This is where the handles are. It's a bit difficult, a bit awkward. Where they have the, the rather bad bits of 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 sticking of these cotton reel bits because the cotton reel bits were a design fault. And although they are pinned in at the top and pinned in at the bottom into those two plates of the handle, they, they, they wobbled, they came off. And obviously in one of his more drunken moments, he pulled it out. And they went back and they kind of tried to glue it in by squelching, which is a very technical term, uh, the gold round the edge. And you can see that in the top left one. Um, and again, in the one below. Now, this really didn't work very well, because in this second uh, party he's having, it, it falls over again. He's not very careful. And they, can I have the next? Uh, or that is just to show you that there it is hollow inside and he puts on these supports. Now the supports are not put on by a, a first rate craftsman. They're put on by somebody totally different. And I think we can be pretty sure, and Aki Skoumas is also pretty sure that these are later additions. So you go back again. Please Ken. No back. But at Thank you. Forward. The one here uh, on the left at the bottom, you can see the edging of the gold off that, of those support handles, um, rather badly attached to it there. 
And actually, when you look carefully at them, you'll see they're not cut out very well. Next, please. And next. And here they are, attached at the bottom, and the thing there. Now, he's got it all done. It's all ready. It's going to be great. Um, <coughs> looks a little odd, perhaps, but, you know, never mind. He uh, has another banquet. And you remember I told you that it's hollow. This, this vessel is hollow right down into the foot. So when you pierce it in the top with rivets and rivets at the bottom, as you can see there, there's the rivets at the top, and you can just see the rivets in the bottom. Um, if you don't get it perfectly and you wobble it a bit, you get your wine spouting out of the foot of the vessel. Now this is all slightly unfortunate. And uh, there, there are the rivets at the bottom. Next, please. And I, and I kind of imagine, you know, the, the crushed up one that Schliemann found was him in rage, crushing it. He was obviously a strong man because gold is not soft. We all think of gold as soft because we all think of, 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 of very thin gold that we put on picture frames and things. But actually, this gold is thick. It's quite thick and it's quite strong. And when you think about it, your wedding ring lasts your life. And that's gold. And so, you know, it's not a soft metal. Now, while that's all frightfully interesting, what I really wanted to tell you was that after, it is a bit confused because uh, we had COVID. I suspect you might have had COVID too, like we all had it. And all the libraries and all the museums and all the everything was shot was closed and weren't able to get to do anything. And uh, it's still half closed now because they're using it as a marvelous excuse. Can't do anything. COVID, you know. So what I had found many years ago at Lisa French's house um, was a, a goblet, the one of the four goblets, a reproduction of it. Well, that's not terribly exciting except it was made in Birmingham, and Birmingham is where we live. And we thought this was very strange, and so we went to investigate it further. Now, it turns out that that one is a Gileron one, and I won't go into Gileron because there are people who know far more than I do. However, they, 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 they drew for, for Schliemann, they drew for waste they drew for Arthur Evans, they made all the, the wonderful reproduction stuff that we had, and they did, um, they taught, and they taught the royal children to draw. I mean, it wasn't much they didn't do, really. Well, they even uh, made the coins for, some of the coins for Greece. So they made uh, a copy of this. They made a copy of all sorts of things. Can you turn it on? Next one. Uh, including this particular one, which uh, is a gift. I mean, they're in solid silver, these, these Gileron ones. And this was a gift from Olga, Queen, Queen Olga, to somebody. And I, I don't know who it was, was for. I found it on eBay. Uh, I had been working on the stuff in the museum in Athens, actually holding this marvelous gold stuff, which was a great thrill. When um, we got back uh, uh, that night, and Ken was leaning over the, um, the computer from the back, and I said, what on earth is this Billieron? And he went, Gileron. So there it was on the internet with, with the, the, uh, the, the signature of Olga, and it is very definitely hers, even though you know, one is in Greek and one is in English. It's her, quite definitely her signature. And they obviously gave them as, as diplomatic gifts. Now, Gileron was in a perfect place to exploit this, and ha happily did so. Next, please. But in the same time, they, Gileron was a, a great businessman and was working with uh, the Germans in the... Uh, 
what's it called? M the metal fabric. I've forgotten the name suddenly. Yeah. Um, and and in, in, in Baden Wurttemberg, they were doing it in Gieslingen. And they, um, and, uh, they, they were making reproductions in, electric, in, an, in like electric plate. And he was making all the things, and here are his catalogues. Uh, and the next page will show you some pictures of the stuff he is making. And they're, and they're good. I think that, that uh, Gileron must have, have provided all the original things, all Gileron's workmen. It's not totally certain whether he did it or whether he had a, a, a skilled load of workmen doing it. And, and there is the Nestor's cup. Next, please. Now, the odd thing about this is that we have in Birmingham um, a firm called Elkington, or called Elkington Plate. And this started uh, probably the same time as the ones in, in Germany. But they were making already a large number of classical things. Now, we don't know why in England they were excited by, by the classical things. They made great, wonderful reproductions. This is a it's in the Met, this one. Uh, absolutely glorious. My, my grandmother had one, and I unfortunately don't have it. Next. And uh, they made them like this. Uh, the one on the right is a Rothschild one, but he didn't put the right wine next to it. They, they had um, a lot of, of, of these in this sort of size, but because they were only electroplate, they were very second rate. I think if Rothschild has two of them, they can't be that second rate. But I, I suspect they, 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 got, they all got lost. And the most famous one is the one um, called the, the Elion Salva, or the Troy Salva, it's also called. We don't have it. We have a drawing of it. Um, but we don't have the original, and we don't have any copies. It's most extraordinary. Next. So here we are again with my uh, solid silver cup that I possess uh, next to the original, which was quite nice. It was just after this, that day after we took these photos that we went and we found the, the Olga one. Next, please. So Birmingham, great silversmithing, or a great industrial city, but also this is the part of the silversmithing. And you can see the, the buildings, they're quite glad, it's quite grand for factory buildings. And uh, there were this, was this firm called Nathan and Hayes. So this is George Nathan and Ridley Hayes. Now, we are around about 1880, 1890, 95 perhaps. And they, they worked until um, 1920, I think, is the last time he goes, and then they get bought up. And this firm specialized in, in reproductions of antiquity, but they did them in genuine metal, not in, not in um, a plate. Or well, plate, in the English term, is what they made them in, not in, you know, uh, other, the, 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 the fake stuff. So they, at that time, there were a lot of exhibitions, grand exhibitions in England, in industrial stuff, and they got a, a reputation for making all these fantastic um, replicas. And uh, it seems a very strange thing. Now, at the same time, you've got uh, Schliemann, who's just dying at that point. Um, as, the, as the, the German stuff is coming back to, to Greece to be distributed by, by the Gilerons. And they, they, they don't seem to have connected in any way. I mean, Elkington didn't do, as far as I know, any of the, the reproductions, although they were making these Trojan salvers and things. And this funny little firm in, in Birmingham is, is making these things. They're very good reproductions. I may say that he made some awful ones as well, but he, by and large, made very good ones. 
Now this one is the one, to, and I have it here to show you what they were using them for and why they were interested. We know already that they're grand classical salvers and making copies in there. So here, they're, they're, this is a little ordinary person, one who's got a christening cup, perhaps. You know, a, 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 it was given to him by his godfather, I don't know. Next one, and, it, and, it, and it's written on the bottom. This one is written, not all of them are. Next. Now, you, you, if you do know, I apologize, but if you don't know, we're very lucky in England because we have all our silver is hallmarked. And therefore, we have the dates absolutely of, of whenever anything is made. And there's the Birmingham one, and the hallmark, the main, do you know it's Birmingham, is the anchor. And the one on the right is Chester. Now, Chester is just down the road fr from us and was the earlier one. And so most of the stuff that we're, I'm talking about is hallmark Chester. Because you go where you're familiar. And the new lot, I have the anchor here. Now, we are the city that is, all, that is the furthest from the sea in any direction. So why on earth would we have an anchor? Well, the story centers around a pub, as these things always do. There is the, the worthies of Birmingham petitioning in London for a, uh, a hallmark, their own hallmark. And this is in the 1700s. And they met in the Crown and Anchor, which is the name of the pub. And they were also there with, with Sheffield, uh, people from Sheffield. And when it came, they got the permission to get their own um, silversmithing, hole marking uh, factory. They, um, they tossed a coin as to who got the crown and who got the anchor. So that's a little story tells you that we got the anchor. Now at the bottom, it, that is the anchor is Birmingham. The next one along is silver. We get a, a, a lion rampant like that. Uh, and then we have, and I can't even see this from this angle. What's the next one? Oh, the year, the year. So each year we had the, an alphabetical letter. Either the uh, typeface is different or the, uh, the cartouche in which it, is, which it is in is different. So you can always tell. So even if you've got a small fragment of that, it's gone so rubbed away, you still got it. Then you have, um, sometimes they, there's a duty mark, that one there, and then, of course, the manufacturers. And really, it's, it's, it's very useful. We're not always lucky enough to get Giron putting the date on for Queen Olga, which is 1903, so we know the date of that one. It's about the only one we do, I think. Next. They also made other things. They didn't just do Mycenae and stuff. So they did the one on the right, which is um, a copy of the earliest piece of hallmarked silver in England that isn't a spoon. Um, and the one on the left is what we call a font cup. But I also have it on to show you what kind of things they were they were giving they were giving these for. That one is a, a, a wedding, a silver wedding, but it was. A wedding that was done long after that cup was made. So it was on when that cup was second hand that it was done. So they, they continue to, to have a use. Next. And other people were making them too. This is a London firm. Um, and it, it, it too has a funny story because the, the cup. Uh, it, it is, is three years older than the inscription. And you ask yourself how and why. And it's wrong. It's wrong. Now, the reason I have it in to point out that it's wrong is we don't know why, where, or why, or how Nathan and Hayes got hold of these designs. I, the only thing we can do is that they came here and, and, and sketched them and but they weren't on exhibition. So that didn't work. They're not from Mycenae. They're not from Schuckart. They're not from any of these things that we all know so well. The famous illustrated London News illustration, which we've seen twice, 
um, when they put out the uh, Schliemann stuff in the, in the Bank of Greece. It's not there. It's not on that lot. So it couldn't have been like that. So far, we're completely stumped. We just have no idea where he got these from. Next. Uh, he, I have always looked out for um, influences. You know, I'm always looking out for influences everywhere. And the one on the left there is the, what we saw earlier, the little cut, the, the, the Acropolis treasure. But it's shrunk to this side. They've got very keen on little ones down to there, and it's got crossed golf clubs. So we know what that one was given for. The next one has got one handle, not two, and it's got a shrunken stem. So obviously that one was preferred. Next. Now, it, it, Nathan and Hayes were brought up by Blankensee. Blankensee, who they, they'd worked, you know, they, were, they, lived, they lived nearby and were working all together. Um, they took over the, the manufacture of these, still using Nathan and Hayes on the, on the whole model. Mm. And quite interestingly, uh, set up in Spain and in England and somewhere else. But not anywhere that the German stuff was in competition with. So next. Oh, that's another picture. There is the Bafier Cup. The, the, still the most famous one is the Bafier Cup. The most popular. Everyone wanted it for the best bull as a prize or, you know, to some farmer. Um, most of them, though, went to classic students. Next. Now, this rather splendid little array, which is the S in Nestor's Cups, um, is from the Ashmolean. I went down there, just, just not so long ago, and we got them all out. We got the ones in the Ashmolean out, and even those they didn't know they had. The one on the left is my one, my first one, uh, from Nathan and Hayes. The second one is Olga's, with from Gilleron. Third one is Arthur Evans's. It's a famous cup, you see. Arthur Evans's copy one there, and the third one is another Gilleron one that is in someone has obviously given to the um, Ashmolean, and they didn't know they had. So next. And this is what we, you find on the base of these. My one's just got a couple of hall marks on it, just to tell you that the base is separate. You were supposed to hall mark it if you could take it off and sell it somewhere else. Um, and I can't see which way it goes. The bottom one, I know, is Arthur Evans's one. Um, the Gilleron one has got the baden württemberg stamp as well as Gilleron's name. And Gilleron's one hasn't got anything on it. My Gilleron one has 800 on it. So it's intriguing. And they're very similar. Next, please. Um, I hope by the time we come to publish, I might have discovered some more things about it. Uh, it's difficult to know. Uh, whether I will, because so much got destroyed in the war. Um, I hope that we can find out where they got them from. And if anyone has any ideas, I would be delighted. And also, Akis and I, Akis Bumas and I, would be very delighted if anyone would like to fund us to make a gold one. <laughs> I just don't think anybody will. Uh, I keep trying to, f to persuade the bank, one of the banks, that it would be a good idea, that that's just what they need. But then whether we'd be able to hand it out to anyone, we're not sure. So it was, it was a fascinating little thing that Schumann has set in motion by discovering these things. You know, he's, he's, he's good and he's bad, but the spin-off is quite intriguing. It's, it's not really what you expected. And although we see plenty of, of Vavier cups in particular in um, all the tourist shops, 
you don't bother to trace back the whole, the whole story of them. People will. Someone will write a thesis on it. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You managed to put together myths and reality. Yes. Yeah, that's splendid. Thank you very much, Annie. Now let me introduce Anthony Muroni, who's going to speak of uh, Monte Prama e la Sardegna che verrà. Si ricorderà. Professor Perna. Aspettiamo che si. Hello everyone. Good morning. Apologize, but uh, my English is awful. It's impossible for, for me to make a speech in English because my English is not very fluent, is not very well. <laughs> and then uh, a friend, uh, a friend uh, support me for translate uh, my not scientist speech. Uh, buongiorno a tutti, grazie per avermi invitato, grazie per essere qua, ho sentito, ho ascoltato con grande piacere eh, le ultime relazioni del corso della mattinata, io sono un po' fuori luogo, perché non sono uno scienziato, sono un povero giornalista che è stato chiamato a gestire quella che si propone di essere un'organizzazione che cerca di dare una mano per affrontare una stagione nuova nel mondo della gestione dei beni archeologici in Sardegna. Eccolo qua. Questo era chiaro. Okay. Eh, il Ministero della Cultura del Governo Italiano, la Regione Autonoma della Sardegna e il Comune di Cabras hanno voluto la nascita di una fondazione che si occupasse della valorizzazione di un parco archeologico naturale come quello che sorge a pochi chilometri da qua, nel Sinis, in un territorio che ha sedimentazioni archeologiche che partono dal Neolitico Medio, dal V secolo a.C., con Cucuris Arrius, cultura di Buonuighino, e poi proseguono con l'arrivo della civiltà nuragica, con la straordinaria scoperta dei giganti di Monte Prama, datata quando ormai la civiltà nuragica stava esaurendo la sua spinta propulsiva, o forse era già finita, dunque tardo nuragica, quasi contemporanea alla fondazione della città di Tarros, città che è stata via via fenicio, punica, romana, e che ha, diciamo così, vissuto fino a circa all'anno 1000 d.C. So as you possibly you understand many things, but anyway, so the, um, uh, I don't remember the organizations, the Minister of the Culture and the, the region of Sardinia and the, and the municipality of Cabras, they, are using, is it, does it work? What should they do? Okay. Uh, they decided to um, protect, to, to create an organization to protect the, the, the let's say, the, the heritage there is in the area of Sinis, uh, where we have both uh, uh, natural and archaeological uh, heritage. And this is an area that's been inhabited since the Middle Neolithic 
to to now. <laughs> uh, we um, yeah with what we say with, with many. I mean, in Rajic period, I mean Neolithic and um, all, all in between, and the New Rajic, and then obviously the area of Tharos, the, 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 the Phoenician colony of Tharos, that was uh, that lived until the 10th century uh, B, uh, AD. Yes. Mm. Nei giorni scorsi la Sardegna e quest'area della Sardegna sono balzati all'onore delle cronache non solo di chi come voi si occupa di archeologia per mestiere, per studio, ma del pubblico per le nuove scoperte che hanno riguardato il complesso delle statue che nella dizione popolare vengono chiamati i giganti di Monte Prato. Un complesso, un complesso, prego. So, I, I, forgot, I forgot the most important stuff, obviously, so that they, they found this complex of big statues, giant statues in Monte Brama, and the complex has been dated by the, let's say, the last phases of the neurologic period. It is more or less in contemporary with the Phoenician arrival. Um, let's say this is the, and uh, yeah, so this is, has been developed quite recently. Yes, and they found quite recently, I mean, I think last week, I mean, I mean yeah, last week, uh, two more statues in the, the same complex. Ecco, mh, per eh, arrivare alla, al cuore delle cose che vorrei trasferirvi, vorrei comunicarvi, sulle quali spero ci sia occasione eh, prossimamente di confrontarci, con la vostra comunità, io ho voluto che la Fondazione Monteprama avesse sin da subito un rapporto col Centro Internazionale di Ricerca delle Civiltà Egee, perché il modello, il modello proposto è un modello che può aiutarci a fare un salto di qualità, anche qua. Il modello di confronto tra il modello del centro internazionale di ricerca e il confronto tra la comunità scientifica di sì. Anglia. Uh, ok, so the, um, the fondazione. Bon. Ma da se vuoi che lo Lo devo tenere qui. No, no, lo tengo qui. Ok, scusate. <laughs> Sorry very much. Um, so the, the idea of the uh, fondazione Monteprama um, is to have a continuous feedback with the wide public and the specialist public. And that's why uh, they decided to be immediately to have, to have, to, to have a, a good connection with the Circe Center uh, so they can reach both audience, let's say. So he is wishing, I mean, the foundation is wishing for a continuous feedback with our uh, world. I mean, it's for specialists trying to interrogate the situation being contacted with them. La scoperta delle statue di Monteprama è datata ormai mezzo secolo fa, quasi 50 anni fa. Però nel corso di questi 50 anni non solo le attività di scavo, ma anche le attività di studio, di ricerca comparata, cioè di molto banalmente la datazione di queste statue. La eh, comparazione di questo modello di complesso scultoreo con quanto accadeva nel resto del Mediterraneo occidentale e nel Mediterraneo allargato. Tutta una serie di studi avanzati che possono andare avanti solo se c'è anche un forte collegamento interdisciplinare che riguarda non solo chi è preposto alla, alle attività di ricerca sul campo e poi di tutela e di conservazione o di valorizzazione o di promozione, ma qua manca in questa fase, fortissimamente manca in questa fase, il ruolo delle università, il ruolo dei ricercatori locali e internazionali. C'è una comunità allargata che possa essere coinvolta negli studi avanzati, più avanzati di ricerca anche con un incontro fra più discipline, non solo quelle legate all'archeologia classica. So the, the discovery of the statues is, of my, is now uh, 50 years, uh, sorry, I'm <laughs> completely done, 50 years um, 
ago, thank you, 50 years ago, but in, in between, let's say, since the beginning until recently, it has, there has been very few um, connection with specialists. So the, um, all the study of the evidence and the, the datation and the, the conservation, valorization, all this has been done without um, with very few help about from the researchers, let's say. It's, it's more, was most the sort of intendants, I understand, and less the, the university. So now the, we have the, the, the foundation and the, the, the university have the possibility to start a new way of proceeding and to, to have um, a more interdisciplinary approach with people working in Sardinia and in the area of the wider Mediterranean and different specialities. Mi spiego meglio prima di andare a concludere con una proposta di confronto che magari può essere sviluppata in successive occasioni, un appello quasi che voglio fare a voi e alle vostre comunità. C'è molta attenzione anche da parte dell'opinione pubblica, del pubblico nei confronti degli scavi. La gente vorrebbe che noi scavassimo, scavassimo, che, che tirassimo fuori tutto quello che è possibile. Perché non siamo ancora riusciti, secondo me, a far capire che fare eh, una ricerca scientifica, una ricerca archeologica, non è solo scavare. Dopo che si scava c'è la necessità di restaurare, ma per restaurare bisogna anche capire a che periodo cosa, quello che abbiamo tirato fuori dal sottoterra si riferisce, come ci è arrivato lì, a che modelli, se ci sono modelli comparativi della stessa datazione eh, in una determinata zona geografica che può essere vicina o allargata, come nel caso del Mediterraneo e della civiltà nuragica, e poi ci sono tutta una serie di altri, pro, di altri processi che è necessario fare nell'immediatezza, cioè è necessario creare un ciclo virtuoso per ogni campagna di scavo, perché altrimenti eh, si inceppa il meccanismo, se noi scaviamo e basta, e poi non sappiamo cosa abbiamo tirato fuori o cosa vuol dire, non sappiamo dove metterlo, non sappiamo come restaurarlo, non sappiamo come collocarlo all'interno dell'Atlante e della storia, non abbiamo fatto niente, anzi stiamo creando un problema invece che risolvere un problema. Dunque il mio appello, lo sto facendo a tutti, lo faccio anche a voi, che avete un ruolo molto importante nel mondo della ricerca, il mio appello è questo. Io vorrei che ci fosse un'attenzione particolare, non solo in Sardegna o non solo da parte della comunità sarda, ma di una comunità scientifica allargata. E che questa comunità scientifica allargata si sentisse in diritto o si sentisse anche in dovere di proporsi per aiutarci a studiare il nostro parco archeologico naturale e i nostri bellissimi scavi e le nostre misteriose statue di Monteprama. Lo dico anche per uscire da un circuito vizioso nel quale ci siamo infilati, e cioè la polemica su chi scava, perché scava, perché scava lì e non lì, su chi restaura, perché si restaura lì e non si restaura lì, mentre ci occupiamo di tutte quante queste cose che sono avvilenti, che non hanno nessun significato uh, scientifico, stiamo trascurando tutta una serie di altre cose che sono importanti e dunque finisco dicendo che l'appello è alle università della Sardegna, alle università italiane, ma alle università di tutto il Mediterraneo. Sentiatevi a casa vostra, cioè sentiate Monte Prama, sentiate il Sinis come un qualcosa che è importante anche per le vostre ricerche, anche per i vostri paesi, per le vostre università di provenienza, perché se riusciamo a capire cosa è successo qua, Forse questo ci aiuta anche a capire cosa è successo in giro per il resto del Mediterraneo. Grazie a tutti. Yeah, I, I think it was quite clear, isn't it? <laughs> so I don't know if I should, should I translate. This was quite clear. Uh, I do. Okay. Yes. Yes. Pascal is going to say okay. Okay. The, um, the, there are two parts actually. So one part is the relationship with the public, because the, 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 commu the community here would like that the excavations Monte Prima just continue and continues and continues and continues, so they, 
to, to find everything, but obviously, as we know, uh, they can't do this because they have to understand before. I mean, let's excavate something, studying, and then understand, and then go again on the field. So this is the main problem. So they should, we should create an awareness in the community that it's very important to study before, to, I mean, to alternate study and excavation, otherwise you, you lost the, the evidence, actually. Anyway, so that was the first part. But the, the most important part for us is the, the, the plea is, made in, is making for everybody from the university in Sardinia, the universities all around the world, uh, to feel at home at Monte Brama, to invite them to come and discuss the evidence, um, because it is obviously, as, as all ancient heritage, this heritage is a common heritage for everybody, and if we understand better Monte Brahma, we can understand better what's going on in the Mediterranean, let's say, and vice versa. So just um, just take care of Monte Brahma, let's say like this. Acceso. Uh, Uh, prima che va via volevo giusto dire una cosa, mi ha fatto piacere quello che ha detto per una semplice ragione che ieri mi hanno chiesto perché, uh, proprio un collega forse Taler mi ha chiesto perché questo colloquio qui ad Oristano, al di là del fatto che io sono uno specialista soprattutto di scritture, al di là del, dell'occasione che erano i 200 anni della nascita di Schliemann, ma proprio perché su 45 studiosi so, ci sono 42 studiosi stranieri tra uh, autori e coautori. Quindi è proprio perché ci tengo molto che il mondo della Sardegna, poco conosciuto fuori, venga conosciuto il più possibile e questa sarà un'occasione per avere una gran, un audience molto molto più grande in tutti i paesi del mondo, dagli Stati Uniti alla Turchia, alla Germania, all'Austria e alla Grecia. Grazie. Dove è Fulvia? Dove è Fulvia? Ful Chiudi tu? La sessione, scusa. <ride> il tuo onere d'onore. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, um, um, tell me at what time shall we come back here? Shall we come back here at 3 o'clock? So, uh, lunch time, we come back at 3 o'clock. We have had a splendid session. The discussion will be fascinating. And so thank you to everybody, uh, the speakers and uh, the splendid public. Thank you very much. One pen drive, one pen drive. Who uh, I forget one
Yes. Così hanno cominciato. Ma non è uno zoom, è il primo zoom. No, 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 no. Salta il primo No, no, non è zoom, perché è lei che presenta, gliel'avevo detto che alla fine parlava la signora. Allora, parlo il parlo Sì, la signora parla benissimo, anche da me. Leggerà lei il testo e va avanti lei con le mani. Direttamente alla signora. Quindi noi condividiamo questo Sì, è come se fosse una sua relazione, semplice, ah, okay. però che va, che va via Zoom, basta. Però eh, eh, non è collegato ma... No, non è collegato. No, perché a mal di culo credo che non lo so se si, parla, se si collegherà. Ah, benissimo, lo ascolterà solo, perfetto. Ok, va bene. Parita l'immagine però, parita l'immagine, non c'è l'immagine.
Today I have the unusual pleasure of introducing myself <laughs> to introduce a paper that I shall be reading for Massimo uh, Coltraro in the footsteps of Aeneas, Hendrik Schliemann and his archaeological explorations, and note the plural please, in Italy. First of all, I'd like to convey uh, his personal thanks to the organizers of this conference, Massimo Perna and Robert Latineur, uh, who accepted his talk on a hitherto unknown aspect of the scientific activity by Schliemann in Italy. Uh, Massimo deeply regrets that he can, cannot be here with us in Oristano for this conference due to personal health problems. In the last five years, a renewed interest on the figure of Schliemann has been uh, evident in the academic and more in general in the Italian cultural behavior. Uh, in the main biography on Schliemann, there are some rare mentions of Italy. According to his notebooks, Schliemann spent long periods in different parts of Italy, especially in 1858. Uh, his first visit to the country when Italy was not yet a, a United Kingdom, and again in 1868, in a long journey before his exploration of the palace of Odysseus at Ithaca. Today in this paper, uh, I am now speaking as Massimo, uh, do not intend to reconstruct both journeys carried out by Schliemann in Italy. In some papers, However, and in uh, my book published in 2018, I focused on the influence of the Italian academic cultural framework on the first scientific training of Schliemann in terms of his stratigraphical approaches uh, to archeological excavations, and even more so in terms of his reconstruction and interpretation of Trojan material culture and its relationship to late Bronze Age mainland Italy. The aim of my paper is to reconstruct the archeological activity of Schliemann in Italy in the last months of 1875, starting from Sicily and moving towards central Italy. Main sources of his unknown field activity are contained in mostly unpublished documentaries stored in some Italian archives. In this slide, yes, uh, I show the main archives that I have examined and that are added to the Schliemann archives at the uh, Genedios Library at Athens. An important source is the Central State Archives in Rome, where the official correspondence between Schliemann and the Italian government is stored. Specifically, of great interest, is a group of letters by Schliemann to uh, Ruggiero Bongi, Minister of Education. Further, important archives are the Luigi Pigorini Archive in Padua University, which includes eight letters of Schliemann uh, to the famous Italian archeologist. The archive of Archigenesio, and of the Archaeological Museum, both in Bologna, complete this important evidence. During the long period of the Priam Treasure Affair, between late 1874 and the first months of 1875, Schliemann was eager to dig again, obviously because of his contretemps with the Ottoman government, Troy was out of the question. At the same time, Greece was also difficult as Schliemann was out of favor with the Greek government too. The last opportunity was for him to carry out some digging activity in Italy 
where he was in favor with Giuseppe Fiorelli, general director of antiquities. Uh, we know of two cases of such activity. The first was the exploration of the island of Moccia in Western Sicily, which was analyzed by Iselin in a paper published in 1968. The second case is that of Albano Laziali, where uh, contemporary documentation was uh, published in the main scientific journal of, the, of Italian prehistory at that time, the Bulletino de Palatnotologia Italiana in 1875. Further, field excavations by Schliemann have come to light through the examination of unpublished documents stored in Italy. According to private letters to Fiorelli and to Minister Bongi in 1875, Schliemann was ready to move to Italy, having chosen Naples or Rome as his permanent residence. At the same time, he proposed a new and more ambitious scientific program to be submitted for evaluation to the Italian government. As in the private notebooks and in some letters mentioned by E. Meyer in his Heinrich Schliemann Briefeschel, the project was addressed uh, to the reconstruction of the travels of Aeneas and his chosen companions in the Western Mediterranean. In the project presented to the Italian ministry, Schliemann traced the travel of Aeneas to Sicily and to mainland Italy. And he also mentioned completely and accurately a wide range of literary and historical sources. The, uh, the Italian government approved the plan for two reasons. The first was to accept the, a German scholar who was becoming truly popular in the cultural Italian behavior. An important role was played in this by the Italian aristocrat Giovanni uh, Gozzadini, who accepted Schliemann into his personal cultural circle at Bologna in 1868, where Schliemann had the first contact uh, with local archaeology, uh, visiting the Iron Age necropolis at Villanova, uh, previously explored by Gozzadini. The Italian nobleman exerted a deep influence on Ruggiero Bongi, as private letters confirm. Moreover, and I dare say rather helpfully, a Schliemann would bear the entire cost of the expedition, and he would have left the archaeological material that he found uh, to various Italian museums. A second reason relates to an ideological and political dimension at the time. The project on the steppes of Aeneas and his Trojans was truly compatible with the interests of the unitary state of Italy, which aspired still to the conquest of Rome as capital of Italy. Aeneas, according to Virgil, was the oldest founder of a new dynasty, and his long travels after the collapse of Troy symbolic symbolically represented the reunification of Sicily to mainland Italy. The Italian government thus authorized Schliemann to carry out field activity in Sicily, and in October 1875, the new Trojan adventure could begin. According to letters, private and public, and unpublished documents stored in the Italian archives, we can reconstruct the impressive field activity carried out by Schliemann in Sicily during October 1875. The first excavation was located at San uh, uh, Pantaleo, a few miles north of Marsala in western Sicily. It was thought to be identified as Moccia, being one of the oldest sites in Sicily where a, a Phoenician colony had been settled. In 1968, Benedict Iselin published parts of the notebooks of Schliemann on the excavations at Moccia. In relation to his picture, we can now add new information coming from the Italian archives. First is the reconstruction of Schliemann's activity in various parts of ancient Moccia, where Schliemann explored some houses of Punic settlement and a section of the fortified walls. In the notebooks, 
evidence of attention to stratigraphy is totally absent. However, there was a specific interest in as aspects of ancient urbanism and planning of Punic settlements. The second opportunity was to identify the archeological material coming from this first excavation, uh, which is now stored in the Archaeological Museum at Palermo. Related to the journey of Aeneas, there is the famous sanctuary at Arici of Aphrodite, mentioned by Roman sources as a religious place settled by Trojans fleeing from Troy. In two days, Schliemann with Giuseppe Polizzi uh, archaeologist and savant of Trapani tried to open some trenches at the bottom of the ancient fortified world, walls of Monte San Giuliano, modern Erici. The results were very disappointing. In a letter to Polizzi, Schliemann writes in Italian, in Erici la città di San Giuliano è situata giustamente sull'antica città e così scavi vi sono impossibili. There is no evidence of the archaeological material found during these excavations. It is likely that some objects were given uh, to the collections of Conti Pipoli in Trapani. According to one letter of Schliemann to that Italian nobleman and uh, to the re inventory register of the Pipoli collection, uh, there what is some evidence of a group of objects uh, donated in late October 1875. Schliemann was also searching for the tomb of Anchises, father of Aeneas, and he was convinced he would find it in the area around Segesta. Uh, this city was largely known thanks to the magnificent and well-preserved Greek temple. Schliemann opened three trenches in an area south of the uh, temple, but the results were sparse. Moving to Palermo, Schliemann decided to explore at Himera, the plateau where a large accumulation of stone columns could indicate the existence of a temple of the Greek period. In this case, the cultic building would be identified with the Temple of Victory built after the victory by the Greeks over Carthaginias in 480 BC. In the same days, Schliemann sent a letter to W. Helbig, where he explained his wish to relate his name, or I think to attach his name, to the discovering of the most important monument in archaic Sicily, which celebrated the military victory of the Greeks. He also spent one day of activity in the Punic settlement at Solunto near Palermo. Unfortunately, we do not have any more information about that. Following the advice of the Committee of Sicilian Antiquities, Schliemann moved to ancient Camarina, southern Sicily, Sicily, where he explored five tombs of the Archaic period. In a letter to J. Leon Mar of 31 October 1875, Schliemann writes, quote, after the discoveries at Troy, the cemetery at Camarina appears so small and so much more recent, modern. This concept of modernity in terms of a contemporary age is well documented in other letters which Schliemann writes during his journey in Italy in October to December 1875. His main concern is that the discoverer of Homeric Troy cannot join his name to other discoveries which, although important, are not useful to reconstruct the prehistory of the Mediterranean. More interesting is the field activity carried out at Syracuse in November I have here 1975. I think we'll make that 1875. Schliemann was authorized to dig a large part of the fortified wall in the northern part of Epipoli. These walls are dated to the late fifth century BC. All this apparently had nothing to do with the explorations of the oldest remains or those deposits of prehistoric interest. 
Schriemann explained the reasons in two letters. The excavation of the walls at Syracuse was a place to practice and to better understand structural elements of ancient fortifications in, his, in view of returning to Hisalik Troy, where he would explore the Trojan walls. Schliemann writes uh, that to do a, he will do a series of diggings, quote, alla maniera Trojani, uh, in his notebooks with specific reference to the importance of small and deep trenches for investigating stratigraphy. The last excavation in Sicily was carried out at Taormina, Tower of Mina, where Schliemann explored a regular stone wall, which can be identified with a part of the late classical fortification wall of the ancient city. Some years later, in 1888, Arthur Evans, during his journey in Sicily, describes this part of the oldest fortification wall of Tower Mena, Mina. Uh, before moving to explore evidence of Trojan presence in Latium, Schliemann did some digging on the island of Capri. This otherwise unknown activity has been reconstructed by myself, that is Massimo, thanks to the correspondence between Schliemann and the anthropologist uh, Giustani Nicolucci. The Italian scholar invited the German scholar to explore two sites where a local savant, Ignazio Cerio, had identified relevant assemblages of obsidian tools. Schliemann and Nicolucci described the Cerio collection stored in Capri. And according to the letters of both scholars, it seemed that Schliemann opened some trenches at Le Parat, Le Parate and around Villa Jovis, where his interest was not in the Roman imperial villa of Tiberius, but more specifically in the Nith Neolithic deposit under the late Roman building. The close and friendly relationship um, between the Italian scholar and the German one uh, have invited Schliemann to explore ancient Arpinum, Arpinum in southern Lat Latium, where the impressive uh, uh, fortified walls show affinities with Mycenae and Tyrans. The Italian project on the footsteps of Aeneas ends at Albano Laziali, near Castello Gandolfo, south of Rome, where Schliemann was invited by Luigi Pigorini to explore a necropolis dated to the early Iron Age. Schliemann supposed that the area around Albano was the place of Alba Longa, the settlement uh, ruled by Ascanius, Aeneas's son, and his Trojan descendants before the foundation of Rome. Obtaining the permission of the ministry, Schliemann focused on land, on land owned by Carlo Meluzzi. During the work for renewal of his vineyard, workers found a large amount of prehistoric pottery. Schliemann explored the land in four days, opening many trenches. The conclusion is that a necropolis dated to the late Bronze Early Iron Age was, was built, and the ground was covered by a volcanic eruption probably in the Roman period. Uh, the activity of Schliemann um, was stopped by a local, uh, was argued against and stopped by a local geologist and archeologist, Michel de Rossi, who published a paper in which the German scholar was accused of falsifying data. In the same days, the German scholar informed the main scientific uh, institutions uh, that he had found signs of the first Trojan presence related to the oldest history of Rome. The most important aspect of Schliemann's activity at Albano is that the archeological material now stored in the Museo Prehistorico et Ethnografico at Rome, registered in 1875, was mistakenly assigned as a gift of Michel di Rossi. Yeah. The recent reassessment of such pottery assemblages confirms that this belongs to the Schliemann excavations. 
To conclude, Schliemann's archaeological activity in Italy in the year 1875 is not an, an episodic fact. It responds, a, a, a fact of, of, of an episode rather, I think. It responds to a well-structured scientific project addressed to the reconstruction of the Trojan presence in Italy. Schliemann started following the mythical tradition and he was deeply convinced he would find tangible signs of such historical process by investigating the Bronze Age material culture in Italy. The first contact was in Emilia Romana since 1868, when Schliemann focused on the evidence of Terra Mara culture and its Anatolian origin. I refer to my previous research in which I've demonstrated the oldest interest in the Middle and Late Bronze Age in mainland Italy. The reopened question of the permission to return to Troy Hisarlik in 1876 was the real reason that prompted Schliemann to leave Italian archaeology. However, in the biography of Schliemann written in 1881, scattered references to some archaeological sites and museums in Italy confirms that this previous interest was still alive. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Over to you. Back to me again. I now have the pleasure to invite someone who is here and will read her own paper, uh, Dr. Kale Kaliopo Sari, of the Center for Textile Research in Athens. In the land of the min Minions, Schliemann's legacy at, at Orchomenos. Thank you very much. Is this? Good afternoon. I would like to thank you for having me here in Orchomenos, which, uh, as you are going to see, is a rather neglected site. Uh, Orchomenos is um, one of the three cities that Homer described as uh, rich in gold, and as expected, it uh, awakened the interest of Heinrich Schliemann, who, after his discoveries in Troy and Mycenae, uh, in uh, 1881, went to Orchomenos intending to reveal uh, similarly uh, rich findings. He and his wife, Sophia, brought famous architects with them and managed to reveal the vaulted tomb, which was Christian treasure of Minias. Lord Elgin had previously tried to remove um, parts of the visible monument, but had not succeeded. The side chamber, the side uh, chamber of the Tholos tomb, which is considered analogo analogous and contemporary with that of Atreus in Mycenae, contains a unique ceiling decoration, a dense spiral com composition that may imitate a precious textile, a Mycenaean inspired decoration that has often copied in Egypt. This exceptional design has been also used to cover the bronze door of Schliemann's grave monument in Athens. <coughs> After recovering <coughs> um, the tomb, the tomb, yeah, uh, he made various uh, test trenches at various nearby locations to meet um, analo analogous remains, which, however, didn't bring the expected results. But what uh, Schliemann noticed right from the beginning of his project was a sequence of layers with uh, ceramic finds similar to these of Troy. Among them uh, was a kind of monochrome 
black, gray, or yellow, handmade, or will-made pottery, which he immediately recognized and compared with that of the royal tom tombs of Mycenae, but also with that of the sixth uh, city of Troy. Schliemann asked, <coughs> but need, uh, uh, did not get a permission uh, for a new investigation at Orchomenos, and so he never returned to the place. The finds of his ex uh, expedition are kept in the National Archaeological Museum. Many years later, in um, 1903 and 5, the Bavarian Academy of Sciences under Bulle, Furtwängler, and Ritzler began excavations at Orchomenos with a similar aim to discover comparable monuments to the treasure of Ominias, significant finds of the Mycenaean period, and eventually to locate the Mycenaean palace. They op opened uh, 20 trial trenches, some large and some smaller, to meet the dromos, the chamber, or the palace of the Mycenaean ruler, who was supposed to have been buried in the Tholos chamber. Their efforts <coughs> did not succeed but something of great importance was achieved, a stratigraphic sequence which for the first time on, the Greek, uh, on Greek ground corresponded to that of Troy. Paul Reinecke also participated in the campaign of uh, 1905 and studied the finds and the stratigraphy. His notes kept until, until today in, um, in the Bavarian Academy of Sciences are precious for understanding the context. The excavation of the deeper habitation layers revealed clusters of circular structures, the so-called Rundbauten, which were interpreted as dwellings by the excavators. They were built on a layer <coughs> of rich pottery um, uh, of various styles mainly black polished and matte painted that were later attributed to the late Neolithic era. To explain their circular shape, Boulle, in a very thorough early ethnological approach um, used contemporary circular uh, buildings such as uh, dwellings in Kurdish and African villages and the huts of Sarakatsani and blacks. The next two architectural uh, layers were characterized by the so-called um, oval buildings that with our current knowledge and terminology we date to the early and middle Elladic period known today as absidal houses. The outlines of the foundations were never completely, were not completely preserved and thus the impression of the oval shape remained. The most distinctive feature of these layers was uh, a large number of pits uh, filled up with debris and ashes um, known as botroi. The finds here were dominated by early Ladic pottery, mainly the local ur furnace of early Ladic II, from which a whole series of vessels was restored, and the local pottery of Agia Marina style uh, dated to the early Ladic III period. A revision of the stratigraphy was done by Emil Kunze, who, after a small supplementary excavation in the area of the circular buildings in section K in um, 28, um, aimed at testing the stratigraphic sequence. He stressed that the Neolithic deposits at the site do not, does not uh, uh, lie in strati stratified order, but is all brought in as fill in early Ladic times. Therefore, the roundhouses should not be of Neolithic date, but they belong to the beginning of the Bronze Age that, uh, and that they were covered by debris brought from elsewhere. However, we have to acknowledge that there are problems with this documentation and assessment. First of all, Kunze was not present in the first excavations and had not personal experience in the context of the extended, extended area uh, with uh, seven almost complete circular buildings. He then never took in account Reinecke's 
uh, detailed notes on the finds to see which pottery and in what qu quantities was found at the level of the circular houses. His trial trench was very small, I estimated as an area no larger uh, than eight square meters. Another problem was that Kunze's uh, trench was too close, if not at the location of an old trench of Schliemann, which uh, the first excavators had encountered and documented. They had even recorded an unexpected find at the bottom of the trench, a Greek traditional shoe still worn at their time, uh, Tsaruhi, which is illustrated even on the stratigraphic profile of section K. Therefore, I think that we should not accept Kunz's amendment without constraint. Another reason that is um, um, for that is that since, there are then, um, since then, no other sim similar buildings have been found from early Ladic II era, perhaps with the exception um, of the circular building of Voidokilia. The circular, uh, circular building of Tiryns, which, uh, with, uh, with which Rundbauten is often compared, has a very different concept and shape. On the contrary, if the Rundbauten would be dated earlier, they could be compared with various Neolithic structures from the very early Hirokitia in Cyprus to the Halcolithic of uh, uh, Eastern Aegean, such as Poliochni Nero, Mileten Mirina III. The pottery notes from the first excavations finally uh, clearly show that the layer of the uh, circular buildings um, outside, uh, because inside they were empty, uh, contained a large number um, of Neolithic pottery and less early Ladic. Another discussion uh, about the Orcomenian Rundbauten was created by Spiridon Marinatos, who in a very meticulous study argued that these are communal granaries. He compared them with multiple examples from ancient Egypt and other areas. This interpretation may be sound, but it cannot be considered as an indisputable fact, since the vaulted uh, shape is not necessarily associated with functionality. In Egypt, where many granary models are found, the vaulted and the rectangular um, uh, coexisted. The clay model uh, from My uh, Milos, the closest example in the Aegean, um, dated in the middle um, uh, Cycladic, early uh, Cycladic date, um, differs at the base, which is footed to be away from the ground. The final dating of the Rundbauten will affect also their use, since if they are indeed earlier, as previously discussed, the uh, parallels are not discussed as granaries, but rather as dwellings. The oval buildings on th or the layer of the Bothroy should belong to the early Ladic uh, III era, but the uppermost probably already belongs to the middle Ladic because both early Ladic and gray minion pottery was uh, found together at this depth. Given that the vast ma majority of the Minian pottery of Orchomenos belongs to the mature style, to use um, Dickinson's uh, terminology, the upper oval bouton um, should be dated in an advanced Middle Aladic phase, I guess uh, Middle Aladic 1 to 2. The stratigraphic layers. Um, uh, the stratigraphic layers that we consider today as belonging to the Middle Bronze Age were named after the, um, by the excavators Elta Mykinis, the, that is, early Mycenaean stra strata. This was probably because they were found below the Mycenaean and because the rich uh, ceramic finds layer, especially the uppermost, showed close um, relevance to the Mycenaean uh, pottery. Although today we uh, know that Middle Ladic uh, uh, was an era with quite different setting, we can say that the old name was culturally and chronologically uh, close to reality as the finds of the last architectural phase, 
the orange one, uh, can be attributed to the beginning of uh, the late Bronze Age. Three succeeding um, architecture, uh, architectural layers were distinguished and marked by different colors as was customary at that time, um, later also Polyochni. These are blue, uh, yellow, and orange. The buildings of this period were rectangular with at least two rooms built close to each other with narrow empty spaces and paths between them. The extent of the middle Eladic occupation reached from the top uh, to the foot of the hill where the Tholos tomb is located. Of these building phases, the middle, the yellow, corresponding to middle Eladic <coughs> two, uh, was the most robust, uh, while the earliest, the blue, had uh, much thinner walls. <coughs> The uppermost uh, marked with orange was the weakest and heavily damaged and should rather um, be dated with the, within the transitional period to the late Bronze Age due to the dominant polychrome local style of LH1 and the high amount of the Mycenaean intrusive shirts. The study of the excavation documents showed that the yellow architectural phase should correspond to Middle Eladic II the blue with an earlier um, middle Eladic phase, and the orange with the transitional phase to LH1. <coughs> In the trench cave, east of the Tholos, a burnt house yielded middle Eladic complete vases in situ. Um, amongst them, uh, high stem goblets and, um, of the two basic uh, shapes, and one pithos imported from Aegina, creating the only um, close middle Eladic context on the side, contemporary with Aegina 9, Lerna 5, Lefkakia 6, and Lefkanti 4 to 5. A feature of these layers um, was the co coexistence of the gray and the matte painted pottery, which at that time seemed to be both local products, but later it became clear that only the gray pottery was indigenous represented by an overwhelming majority, and the matte painted was imported from the islands, mainly from Aegina and Kea. The growing influence of the Cycladic pottery on the mainland subsequently contributed to the creation of a local mainland monochrome or polychrome style, the hi a hybrid creation from, the, from Cycladic and the local yellow minion ware. The amount of gray pottery in these three layers was so large that the excavators named it Minion in line with the name of the burial monument, which was connected with the tribes of uh, Minions christened by Schliemann. Nevertheless, we have to emphasize that the name Minion is given by them and not by Schliemann, as he never refers to gray pottery or the other color variants of, by that name. Mythical and toponymic names were much favored, uh, favored at the beginning of the 20th century, and scholars back then um, uh, were writing not only about Minion pottery, but also about Minion settlements and Minion achievements. The end of the investigations um, in this area has, how, however, prevented the term Minion to become a cultural definition like the Minoan. 50 tombs uh, were found in the investigated area. They were typical examples of the Middle Bronze Age burials, that is, simple pits, seats, and pithos tombs without or with very few offerings. They were scattered between the walls, sometimes opened at a small and sometimes at a deeper level. The first impression during the excavation, suggested by Reinecke, during the 1905 campaign was that the tombs were opened above the last layer of, of middle Eladic houses. However, while this uh, first statement was recorded in the publication of uh, 1907, it was finally claimed by Bulle that the tombs uh, were opened during the use of the buildings and that the deceased were buried uh, between the walls and under the floors. In reality, and based on the recorded deaths, 
none of the 50 tombs is inside or under a wall, and their irregular arrangement in indicates a random com connection with the architectural remains. Moreover, their large number is incompatible with the living pattern. However, this view was followed by uh, the next excavators of other Middle Atlantic sites, and for a long time, it, is, it was believed, and is still sometimes believed, that the Middle Atlantic intramural tombs, in the sense of a contemporary use with housing, were a particular element of the Middle Atlantic social organization. However, this stratigraphic puzzle seems to be weakening uh, within, with the recent excavations, revealing more and more a pattern of abandonment of the Middle Atlantic settlements and their transformation to, into cemeteries. The, this phenomenon can be interpreted as a vigorous and extensive demographic event, one step before the uh, Mycenaean supremacy, rather than as a phenomenon of social and ideological nature. Much later in the 70s and early Mycenaean burial ground, contemporary to the soft graves of Mycenae, was excavated by Theodoros Spiropoulos, and, next, um, and this was next to the uh, theater, and quite close to the treasury of Nemeas. This was a strong uh, indication showing that the whole area was turned into the cem uh, cemetery at the transition to the late Bronze Age. An unanswered question is still the location and form of the Mycenaean palace, which has not um, yet been discovered, but which, based on traditions, um, the Homeric po poetry and sporadic by, but characteristic um, uh, finds, uh, we strongly uh, believe that exist. These are the Mycenaean finds, and here the locations. Is it at a high location on the foothills of Acondion or at the level of Skripu Church and the excavated building with the frescoes? And then is there a prehistoric fortification in Orchomenos? The possibility of a palace on the hill is not uh, ruled out. Given that the, uh, despite the ex extensive trenches of the Bavarian Academy and many test sections of uh, Schliemann, there is still a large area on the hill unexplored. The Mycenaean remains, however, were minimal on the much investigated slope, and it seems that the prehistoric activity l reached only the beginning of the late Eladic era. Therefore, if the palace was on the slopes of Acondion, it would be on a higher level or maybe on a slope of another orientation. Looking north at the, um, to the springs of Harites, or looking south at the Copais Plain. If the palace would be, would be located at the foot of the hill and the excavated building with frescoes is a part of it, we would have a different model from other Mycenaean citadels where palaces were built at the, high, at the highest points of the sites. This alternative image, uh, however, is mitigated by the fact that the altitude at that uh, zone was also much higher than the Copais Plain. In such a case, the effective drainage works of the Mycenaean period would ensure protection from flood. Unlike the other um, sites that uh, were first investigated by Schliemann, um, but the um, excavation and study continued, the site of Orchomenos was not systematically studied, except for uh, restoration and rescue works of the archaeological service, which are ongoing since an archaeological park around the ancient remains is still in progress. The uh, ceramic finds of the old excavations <coughs> have been published, but quite selectively and mostly not associated with the stratigraphic data. Entire series of finds have uh, unfortunately remained unpublished, such as the prehistoric tools from the site and some other finds of later periods. Orchomenos still hides secrets 
mainly, mainly related to the stratigraphic sequence and the use of space in prehistory, which cannot be answered without new excavations. Although there is no, um, there is no systematic research program for our homenos itself, um, some other excavations in the wide area, such as the recently excavated tomb in, um, tomb in uh, Presilio, the excavations at Gla and investigations at the eastern side of the Copais Plain promised to indirectly shed light on the importance um, of the site and the area. Uh, with this and with the hope that uh, systematic research in the field um, um, will continue one day, I am closing this uh, presentation. And um, even if it has been uh, already a long time since uh, my involvement in Orchomenos, I would like to express my gratitude to all those who suggested, supported, and facilitated my study. And thank you very much for your attention. We do have some time for discussion. Uh, obviously, I, I can't answer any questions on the first paper, but I don't know if uh, Dr. Um, uh, Coltraro is present on Zoom. Can you see, perhaps, if he is? Also, we discuss some of the things for if we can catch him, it would be wonderful. Excuse me. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right. Can yeah. you see the PowerPoint? Is everything okay? Uh, great. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, before we start, Dobbiamo smettere perché non cominciano prima abbiamo discussioni. Oh, sorry. You can't hear very well. Thank you. Prima della discussione. Okay. We have the discussion now of the three papers of the, this morning. We starting from uh, GPC Price. Uh, you can ask if you have the uh, question, okay. uh, we follow, okay? Okay. Well, let's see if you can wait on, aspettiamo the question. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions that will be on Gypsy Price's paper on revitalizing the vittles, these studies of animal subs subsistence at Mycenae? Yes. Um, Right. Um, the paper of Emanuele Alberti, Alessandra, and the others, textile work areas at Mycenae. Who would like to start with some questions on that paper? Yes. Oh. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I wonder if you could uh, tell us uh, a few things about uh, the reconstruction of the Mycenaean loom and things we have discussed, of course, um, uh, about the, the number of the loom weights, if it is really representative, if, if the number of the loom weights would um, help reconstruct uh, um, production and, um, and, the, and, and type of loom. <laughs> So as, uh, yeah, okay, the, as you possibly, you all noticed, uh, I hadn't, haven't speak too much of loom weights because we don't have them. <laughs> so the, uh, okay, the, the main question is, uh, possibly you know all this, but anyway, during middle Nordic time, uh, there are basically no loom weights recorded for Hladic area. So we assume that they were using something else possibly an horizontal loom or something like this. This is, this is a, well, it's, it's a, it's a discussion going on, but I think it for, uh, so, okay. And for Mycenaean, during the Mycenaean period, um, some loom weights that is more, there are more or less with, as the Minoan ones, so inspired by the Minoans, start appearing during Mycenaean, in, in Mycenaean citadels and Mycenaean sites, but not so many. So it's clear the uh, Mycenaean palaces, Mycenaean textile production were, was keeping the ancient tradition, the middle Nordic tradition of horizontal loom or two beams loom, I mean, a, a loom that doesn't, uh, doesn't leave any trace. And also, they were also adapting the Minoan or Minoan-like textile style of production. So it's a quite, quite a mixture of things. So what we can say only is that we, we have spin the wool, so they were spinning, we assume they were wedding because we know from text <laughs> they were wedding. And possibly they were using two different type of, two or more different types of loom. Of looms. So this is the, but basically we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as I understood, you suggested that uh, because um, there are m basically this steatite uh, spindle walls, Connolly, which are not very heavy, and you suggested that only luxury uh, spinning would take place, the production of more luxury textiles would take place in Mycenae. So maybe this was the case also with wedding, so that the production was simply somewhere else for coarse uh, kind of textiles webbing. Okay, so we have to, uh, yes, we have to separate what was going on in the center, let's say, what was going on outside. But also we have to think about the different information we have from different, from different linear B documents in the various sites. So it is clear that in, let's say, in Hladic area, uh, Mycenae and um, and Thebes, most of the production should have been at the center because we don't have mention of people working outside. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from the palatial point of view, okay, the palatial organization of textile production. But in Knossos, for example, we know that there were a lot of textile group workers, uh, group of workers in the wider territory. They were monitored as well, but they were working around in the, in the villages. Um, so we have to assume that this, yeah, a branch of the production was on the palatial control with specialized tools, and so part of it was also disseminated in the, in the landscape. At the same time, we have also other type of, of I mean, it, 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 there's not only steatite is more spindle wars, it is majority, we also have other types of spindle wars. I mean, there is a high, um, strong bias towards small stereotype stuff, but it's not the only thing. They, they, they produce everything. We have to keep in mind that in linear B tablets, especially in Pylos, I think, um, the palace was collecting from villages a certain type of textile cloth, very simple. It's the number one, four, six of the <laughs> linear B ideograms. And we assumed it was being produced by households in, let's say, day, day by day, and then given to the administration for as tax. So we have to combine the two, the two levels of 
levels of production on many levels. What's very important, it, my scene is not so important, but from Thieves, from it being a bit information from Thieves, we understand that the, and from source, that the organization of textile production is really an overlapping of different levels and different um, contract uh, conditions. So it's really an historical palimpsest. Thank you. Um, you almost answered uh, what I wanted to ask because there is always this question in the air to what extent the textile production was centralized and under control of the, of the policies. But now the last three sentences actually explained it that to a certain degree, yes, to a certain degree it was in the surrounding villages but then uh, coordinated by the palace and to a certain degree it was also independent. Do I get it right? Okay, perfect, thanks. Thank you. I think we should uh, have in our mind that anyway, many people worked uh, in uh, this kind of uh, technology, how should I say, because uh, many people need to be dressed. So anywhere, apart from the centralized uh, industry of the palace, uh, so it is very natural to be f uh, for uh, spindle whorls or loom weights to be found in different places. Uh, another point I would like to, to bring into the discussion is that uh, the spinning and the uh, uh, textile making leave different kind of, uh, of um, uh, remains. Um, spinning is uh, related with the spindle horse. And this is a very, very long work. Many women, many women or men, I don't know, worked in this for many hours. Whereas the loom uh, needs uh, more skilled, more skilled workers, is more demanding, and uh, looms uh, uh, there were no in uh, perhaps in every there there are there were no so common, but looms of course uh, needs many worlds, twenty or thirty. That means that even if we found one hundred looms as we found in Akrotiri, that does not mean that there were many looms. It could be only three or four. Uh, so um, the point is, uh, um, ah, another, uh, another uh, perhaps uh, in index is that uh, looms and, uh, and the spindle whorls are, are, uh, are, uh, are very, um, uh, they live along, it's not, uh, it's not something, it remains, it is possibly something that it is not, uh, it is, uh, the, yes, uh, yes, that means that um, even if we find some loom or in the, in rubbish, in a, in a house, but it does not mean that, with loom, yeah, loom weights uh, are often broken, not the small, the, not the whorls because they are small. That do, does not mean uh, that uh, there were l uh, many, many workers, many textile workers, I mean. Perhaps just the rubbish went in. And, mm. and another thing I would like to remember is the work of a friend of us, uh, Sofia Bakirji, who is also working in um, for textile, in the textiles, and she thinks that the Konuli uh, may be cultic um, objects because they are often found in graves, uh, and in graves it must be offerings. I mean, nothing else. Thank you very much again, and I thank you for remind us of how complex is all this. Uh, clothing uh, process. Uh, Massimo, Massimo, right. 
can we take questions from the maybe, Zoom? Maybe Yes, but I, uh, so y I mean, yes, I yeah, it, we thank you very much for raising for remember us many many points about this the common yeah that we should keep in mind. Uh, the question of I, I I left aside the economy question because it's really. A vexata question, but at the same time, the shapes, they are, they are two different, they take two different shapes. One shape is for ornament or body reasons. The shanky one is not for spinning, and the conic one are um, probably for spinning. So we can separate this, and it's been done by Lawrence Armstrong, the, the basic study about that. So we think we can separate stuff. Yeah, at the same time, I, I'm working both, I, ha I worked in Thebes and in Malia, so I have both the minor and the Mycenaean uh, perspective, and there's no comparison. I mean, loom weights, are, are if, in t if in Crete each side gives you 50 fragments, let's say, uh, I think in Thebes we have 10, <laughs> so it's really less. I mean, it, it possibly they were using something else, we have not understood, understood what they were using. Thank you, Emmanuel. I think we have time. We can have one more question, perhaps from the Zoom. If in, if uh, Jania has raised her hand, can you can you come on and ask your question, Ife? Hi, hi from Athens. Nice to see you again. Um, I wanted to say, although I couldn't understand most of the things that were said because the sound quality was not very good, I would like to say that I found uh, Chia's paper very interesting. I wanted to raise two questions, though, which I probably won't be able to discuss because I won't be able to hear afterwards. Um, the one is the weaving. I remember because I collaborated on this Mycenae thing about the, um, uh, about Mycenae, uh, on the weaving and textile tools and so on and so forth. But I remember on the mainland as a whole, we have a huge problem, huge lack of loom weights. <clears throat> Which doesn't mean, of course, there is no weaving. Uh, and there could be stones used for that sort of thing, but I find it very difficult. I find it a mystery because I find it very difficult to believe that uh, when the Mycenaeans have adopted so many Aegean um, standardized tools and uh, techniques and so on and so forth, they would not adopt um, the clay loom weight. So that's a big thing. So at Mycenae, like in most centers, we don't have any evidence of actual weaving or very little, you know. Um, the second is about spinning and about spindle walls. Uh, I'm afraid that the numbers that we have including the ivory houses, are very small to talk about industrial production. And I'm beginning to think, the more I think about it, and after Kim Shelton's paper yesterday, when we discussed about pottery production in the Mycenae in the uh, 13th century, I'm beginning to wonder whether we're talking about decentralized production. Don't ask me where, because there is nowhere in the environs that we found masses of spindle walls or um, loom weights. But in the big centers, I think including Terence, but mostly my city and Pilos, we do not have evidence of weaving and spinning on an industrial scale. And the linear B documents um, verify the fact that the palace was interested in large-scale production. So what's happening here? I mean, the 16, 18, uh, 20 spindle walls in my houses or in other houses in the, on the Acropolis, um, and mind you, the northern storerooms, <clears throat> the stuff that were found in there was had fallen from the palace probably, it was not stored in the Apotheki in the storerooms there. But I can't see it as anything else than domestic and occasional production. So maybe we should start thinking more about that or rethink the whole issue. Um, that's all I had to say. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry we have no more time for this particular paper, Tom. I see your hand, but 
I, I think we have to move <coughs> on to the next, or we won't have any questions. Uh, Gypsy Price. Yes, Gypsy mm -hmm. Price on um, revitalizing the Vittles, and we have Emmanuel on that, yes. Well, so as a typical question from a textile person to uh, an archaeologist, it's always the same question, so <laughs> it's almost ridiculous, but anyway. So do you have an idea about the, uh, because you, 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 you focus your attention on the analysis of uh, cattle, uh, if I remember well, and uh, what about, the, because obviously what we're interested in is the possible um, use of the wool, so which is the mortality, mortality pattern, do you say like this? Mortality pattern for, for sheep, if you have any idea. The answer is yes. I mean, we have a lot of stuff about sheep and goat because there's a ton of them. For that particular question, I'm gonna turn over to Jackie Meyer for the survivorship curves and to look at the kind of herd dynamics as far as aging and sexing is concerned, because that is your wheelhouse. Um, I can, if you wanna talk about it afterwards, we, I do have a lot of isotope stuff from sheep and goat too that tie into that question but we should hit her stuff first before we elaborate further. <laughs> I was going to say, definitely ask Gypsy about the isotopes for the caprines. They're very interesting. Um, we've been working on sorting out the, the sheep from the goat. We, first of all, we have more sheep than goat there, which is a good signal also that sheep were more important since goats are easier to raise, especially in this environment. Um, and our mortality profiles are more uh, prime animal dominated at this point, um, but this is, analysis that's that's really underway uh, but we do have we do have lots of young animals not only the sheep and the goats the caprines but also the pigs at the house which i think supports more of our argument also that that pig production was really the primary um, animal rearing strategy at the house yeah and i mean if you want to elaborate on the caprine or the sheep goat in particular i mean we can't parse out which is the sheep and which is the goat in each of that sample so oftentimes we say caprines just because you can't tell the difference um, but at pets house we do have two kind of distinct groups of caprines where they are obviously being managed slightly different so they're tapping into two kind of um, caprine economies where one is obviously being raised and managed in one way, and one is obviously being raised and managed in another way, and one potential um, uh, one potential kind of explanation uh, or narrative that can be tacked onto that to explain it would be that um, they are tapping into this larger kind of palatial flock economy where it's something that's being raised for wool, but then it eventually has to be culled because they don't live forever, and then could be maybe transferred into something like rations uh, in, um, exchange for perhaps a pottery delivery <laughs> um, or something, you know, something that's being given out um, and accessed via exchange um, that's being redistributed or something uh, from palatial flocks. I mean, there there is evidence to suggest that at least a portion of the caprines are being tapped into through that network, if that addresses your question. Yeah. Hmm? Do we have any other questions on the vittles? Uh, and animal subs, uh, subsistence. And if not, then we'll move on to Diana Wardle's paper on Nestor's Cup, a, a master class in how to build a solid gold cup that will stay together despite drunken play. No one? Then we can jump past the paper that I read and go to uh, Calliope Sari's paper, uh -huh. uh, absolutely fascinated on, on the round buildings and in the land of the minions. There surely will be questions on that. I think everyone wants their coffee break. Okay. <laughs> it's a long session. So thank you all very much. We will be back in how long, Massimo? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, coffee.
Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. Um, I believe Alina Kardamaki is first. Yeah, she's there. So we proceed to our final session on Tyrans, saving the best for last. Sure, <laughs> sounds good. Um, I, our first paper is going to be by Alina Kardamaki of the Austrian Archaeological Institute and the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and Alkesti Pape Dimitriou, the effort of the Argoid. Um, they're going to be speaking on the upper citadel of Tyrans in the late 13th and early 12th century BCE, new evidence from the area of the Western Staircase. Good, and it's up. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Alina, whenever, whenever you're ready, you can start. You can share your screen full screen. Perfect. You may Great. start. I think you know, you already know the first slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, before we start, um, we would like to thank very much Massimo Berna and Robert Lafiniera for inviting us uh, to this uh, conference. Uh, the history of the Tyrinthian Ag Agropolis is unequivocally connected to Heinrich Schliemann, who after a short visit in 1876, started the systematic excavation of the palace in 1884 and 1885. Although the conference is dedicated to his memory, our talk today will actually be about Schliemann's colleague and close collaborator at the site, Wilhelm Dörpfeld. This is because early excavation adherents cannot be discussed without referring to Dörpfeld, the ingenious architect who was invited by Schliemann to oversee the excavations and conduct the architectural study of the archaeological remains. Dörpfeld's involvement in the excavation of Tyrins was pivotal, not only because he already had gained experience in archaeological research through his work in Olympia and Troy, but because he was also an enthusiastic and inspired architect who immediately realized the significance of stratigraphy in archaeological study, a fact which becomes obvious throughout his work. We owe Dörpfeld crucial knowledge for his observation during this early excavation of the site. Dörpfeld's research and excavation results are included in chapters five and six of Schliemann's book, The Prehistorische Palast der Königin von Thierings. There, Dörpfeld describes the Cyclopean wall and the buildings of the upper citadel, and he analyzes building techniques methods and materials. Dörpfeld very soon developed a deep understanding of Mycenaean engineering and architecture, with many of his results being still accurate and valid. In very few instances, like the one to be presented today, modern excavation research can follow up directly on Dörpfeld's steps. This is true for the area of the Western Staircase, and especially the so-called structure fee located directly above the entrance of the staircase. In this whole area, a large-scale project of restoration was conducted in 1998 and 1999 under the direction of Arkesis Papadimitriou and the Fury of Nachplion, during which previously unexcavated deposits were investigated. The staircase was described by Dörpfeld as side entrance, Nebenaufgang, as opposed to the main entrance of the palace in the east. The west staircase was, according to Dörpfeld, intended for use by pedestrians only and was protected by a thick cyclopean wall with an imposing round projection. From the staircase, which, like the terrace to the east, was covered almost entirely by the fallen stones of the wall, only the first 65 steps were preserved. And although Dörpfeld identified its foundation further to the north, the exact course of the staircase remained for a long time a working hypothesis. 
Dirtfield assumed that the staircase first had a north-south course and thus before the square tower in shaft B that he interpreted as a cistern. It must have turned to the east and then through a postulated gate, it would have reached the middle citadel or it would have led to the palace through staircase X. This hypothesis was rejected later by Kurt Müller, who assumed that the staircase retained its south-north course, leading to the square tower and shaft B, which he interpreted as a wolf's pit, wolf's grube. Regarding structure B, Dirtfeld encountered there one of the richest deposits in terms of pottery and fresco fragments that he had excavated. The structure itself, he interpreted as part of a pathway leading to the circuit wall, while the rich pottery deposit discovered there was identified as refuse dumped from the palace. Later work in the area of the staircase by Gerhard Rodenwald and Müller brought to light the famous Tyrinthian frescoes, the corpus of which, of which was significantly enriched in 1999 when the excavation of the last remaining part of this fresco dam in the northernmost part of its staircase took place. The same excavation ultimately confirmed both Turpin's suggestion that the terrace of the staircase was used for the discarding of debris from the palace and that the staircase had an east-west wing leading to the middle citadel. Moreover, the 1999 excavation finally resolved a long-lasting question on the date of the frescoes, which was securely placed in late July 3B2 and assigned to the final phase of the palace, contrary to earlier assumptions that the frescoes must have adorned the walls of an earlier building. In addition, the new excavation led to the identification of a layer overlying the fresco dam that was closely related with the earliest late Helladic Frisic cleaning and rebuilding activities following the destruction of the palace in the upper citadel. According to Bergfeld and Müller, the almost eight meter thick protruding wall with an access to the square tower was perhaps the most significant aspect of the whole structure in terms of military strategy. On top of the wall, a wide parapet must have existed that would have allowed easy and unprohibited movement to defenders targeting, targeting attackers outside, but also inside the staircase if necessary. According to Dirkfeld, the parapet of the west wall must have been accessible through the western staircase. At the middle of its course, approximately where the last preserved step was found, Dirkfeld postulated the existence of a path with structure fee being part of it, leading backwards towards the circuit wall. On the other hand, a direct connection with the palace through structure B, V, was rejected by Dirkfeld due to the great height of the citadel wall there that would have been difficult to overcome. Excavation in structure V in 1998 gave us the opportunity to elaborate on these issues and investigate Dirkfeld's idea for the use and function of structure V. Very important was the collection of new data concerning its construction date. This new material is valuable since well stratified and closed pottery deposits from the construction phase of the terrace were lacking. At the time of its excavation, the highest exposed part of structure fee was 1.20 meters, while from the original destruction debris discovered by Dirtfeld, only the lowermost 10 to 20 centimeters were preserved. 
the original thickness of this debris, judging by other areas of the Western Staircase, must have been as much as 1.5 meters. The new excavation exposed several previously unidentified features. The first was a pebbled surface that appeared in the inner corner of the structure. It was lined under an approximately 20 centimeters thick undisturbed deposit containing typical destruction debris and was best preserved in the central and northeastern part of this area. In the south, the pebbled surface was largely damaged and its extension to the west is unknown as early excavation there had reached deeper levels. The pebbled surface that seems to represent a final palatial feature that was detected in other areas of the terrace as well. However, most of the times it was missing or heavily damaged, and this is probably the reason why it was not identified before. The second feature related to the appearance of the structure itself. Although in Dirtfeld's plan, but also in later publication, walls of feet are illustrated as freestanding, in reality, these have only one face and an inner field with smaller stones that abuts to the citadel and the exterior wall respectively. Their width is 1.5 to 3 meters. This type of foundation is characteristic for staircases and has been well documented in several other locations of the Western Staircase. Evidence for the continuation of the stone structure further to the north existed before and was also identified in the course of the new excavation. But the preserved remains are too scarce to allow any clear interpretation. Another new feature discovered in 1998 in the interior corner of structure P was a stone lined pit 20 centimeters deep and 75 centimeters big that appeared in the level of the pebbled surface and was carefully closed by gray stone slabs. The foundation of the structure P was also investigated. After the pebbled surface and the underlying field were removed, the upper surface of the stone field of the terrace, terrace, staircase terrace was rebuilt, consisting of carefully placed stones often giving the impression of pavement. The walls of structure feet abound with the terrace that's confirming contemporary construction. While the field placed between the pebbled surface and the upper part of the terrace was containing splinter deriving from the construction work. Regarding the chronology, the new excavation provided valuable evidence both for the date of destruction but most important, the date of construction of the structure field. The destruction debris discarded on top, on top of the pebbled surface comprised a typical assemblage of the final late Hilladic 3B subface or late Hilladic 3B2 late, with characteristic depot types such as group A, group B, rosette depots, and many fragments from several closed and open bases. The rare, represented by single elements, presence of stylistically more advanced features, such as the deep ball A with monochrome interior, fits perfectly well to the pottery repertoire of late Hilladic 3B2 lay. Late Hilladic 3C early 1 pottery, as the one identified during the 1999 excavation in the layer overlying the fresco dump, was entirely missing. Either the area of structure P was abandoned after the destruction, or most likely the presumed late Hilati 3C early 1 level had been removed in 8085. Worth noting among the material from the destruction debris is the group of Cretan trans posterior jars with several fragments bearing linear B inscriptions. The study conducted by Peter Day and Martha Temponi suggests that these vessels all derived from two main regions in Crete, 
namely Western Crete in southwestern Mesara. Cretan trans postigrad guards are not only among the best preserved peasants of the excavated material here, but they are also very frequent, once again confirming the existence of flourishing trade between Crete and the Argoli until the last days of the pylons. They also support the hypothesis expressed by Joseph Maran in 2005, according to which the Cretan containers were stored in the interior of the citadel, contour during late 3 b 2 late, contrary to earlier practices known from Mycenae, where storerooms with side spaces existed outside the citadel. The original amount of the Cretan jars in the inner corner of Phi is unknown, but it was certainly much larger since the 1998 excavated debris is only the lower, lowermost part of the original deposit. The pottery found in the field sealed by the peppered surface provides a terminus antic then for the construction of structure B in early phases of late Vladic 3B2 or late Vladic 3B developed according to the system of periods. This is the subphase during which, based on secure evidence from the lower citadel, the third major building program of the citadel took place after a major destruction event stroke the pylons. While the shared material from this field is not abundant, the presence of Rosetti Bohr as the latest epochological feature seems to suggest that the pebble surface was laid during the subphase. It should be noted, however, that deep balls with monochrome interior, although very frequent during late Hilladi 3B developed, they are absent from this construction field. Turning now to the final point regarding the original appearance and the function of the stone structure field, this should remain hypothetical. As already noted above, Dirkfeld assumed that structure was, was part of a pathway leading from the staircase to the exterior circuit wall. Dirkfeld suggested that the path was accessible by the middle of the terrace since the steps in this part of the staircase and the preserved upper part of the structure were approximately at the same level. However, stone structure feet was most likely originally higher and had an upper part that was destroyed after the debris was discarded in its interior corner. This becomes evident first by Durfell's observation that the discarded material with the broken bases appeared only in the interior corner of the structure, and second, by our study that did not yield any joining search between the inner corner and the upper part of the stone structure. One possibility would be that stone structure B was the southernmost extension of a solid stone, stone substructure carrying a wooden path, possibly 1.5 to 2 meters wide, accessible from the staircase to the west and leading through a wooden staircase to the parapet of the west wall. This path may have been accompanied by a wooden balustrade that would have been necessary in order to provide security in a passage that was running close to the edge of the terrace. In terms of military strategy, the presence of a wooden staircase accessible from the west staircase and lead, according to Dirtfeld, the narrow rectangular rooms designated with letter U directly above such a field, were basements ideal for the storage of foodstuff. It is not inconceivable that many containers with local but also imported goods like the transport here at Dutch from Crete were stored there. If this is true, one could imagine that instead of carrying these heavy bases through narrow staircases and corridors inside the palace, they could have been easily brought to the staircase terrace and from there perhaps pulled up and brought directly to the storerooms. The triangular area defined by structure fee 
with a pebble surface was probably unroofed. Here, a small group of fragments or well-preserved bases was found directly on the surface and may indeed represent in situ material. Worth noting are two identical alabaxa, and here we saw one of these, a type of basis not very common in regular settlement deposits. Moreover, the presence of a stone-lined pit containing ashes, many animal bones, and an animal figurine could represent a vaulted deposit, and the whole find could indicate the existence of a rich ritual niche just above the entrance of the staircase. To conclude, what can the small find presented today tell us about the first excavator experience and great pioneers of their time? First, they did try to explain and interpret their discoveries the best way they could in order to offer a realistic as possible picture of life and appearance, both in times of wars and in times of peace. Second, still more than 100 years later, their ideas, writings, suggestions and hypotheses remain for us a valuable source of information. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to have questions and discussion later on at the end of the session, so don't go too far. <laughs> um, so our next paper, um, uh, Melissa Vetter's paper will not be presented today, so we're going to move right along to Joseph Moran, um, director of Tirens, uh, to see what he's going to tell us about what could Schliemann have known. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when almost 140 years ago, Heinrich Schliemann and Wilhelm Dörpfeld excavated on the upper citadel of Tirens, they succeeded in documenting and defining the architectural layout of a palace centered on a so-called Megaron that until today is regarded as a classic example of Mycenaean imposing architecture. This lasting achievement, above all of Dörpfeld, contrasts with the almost total disinterest of the excavators in the exact documentation of the find spots of movable objects within the excavation. As a result, these early excavations by Schliemann and Dörpfeld left us an exemplary documented but virtually empty palace that in itself offers little possibility for any kind of contextual and chronological investigation. Given the fact that since then, only very few other Mycenaean palaces have come to light. This was and will remain an irreparable blow to research. However, my paper will not further elaborate on the loss that Tyrins has suffered due to Schliemann's excavations. Instead, I would like to focus on the wrongfully long forgotten chronological models used by him and the ensuing generations of archaeologists working at that site until the 1930s. In exclusively relying on the chronographies found in ancient literary sources, Schliemann inferred the date of the destruction of the Palace of Tirins around 1100 BCE. He arrived at this date due to his conviction of a linkage between that destruction and the Doric invasion, or what he also called the uh, return of the Heraclids, which according to the literary, literary sources that he consulted 
was thought to have taken place some 80 years after the Trojan War, for which Schliemann extrapolated a date of 1180 BCE. Regarding the chronological relationship of the different types of pottery from his excavation, Schliemann disagreed with the view of other researchers that Mycenaean pottery predated geometric pottery. Instead, he argued that geometric pottery had reached the argolith as an import as early as the time of the Mycenaean palace and had been used alongside the Mycenaean one. After the destruction of the palace, he thought, geometric pottery continued until it was superseded by the black glaze pottery of the Hellenic period. It would be unfair to criticize Schliemann for such chronological errors, since at his time there were still only very few archaeological and historical clues available on which an absolute and relative chronology could have been based. What is astonishing, however, is that even in the four decades after Schliemann's premature death, all excavators working in Tiryns continued to follow central tenets of Schliemann's re chronological reconstruction. They equated the end of the palace with the one of the Mycenaean period and assumed that the geometric one started immediately or after a short interval after the palace's destruction. On the one hand, there were scholars such as Wilhelm Dörpfeld, August Frickenhaus, and Kurt Müller who assigned the destruction of the Mycenaean palace to the 8th century. On the other hand, there was Georg Caro, who, similar to Schliemann, dated the destruction of the palace much earlier, namely to the 12th century, and postulated a start of the geometric period already around 1100. In other words, the excavators at Tiryns never contemplated the possibility of a longer span of time separating the destruction of the Mycenaean palace from the geometric period. This chronological misjudgment is essential for understanding why until fairly recently building T was mostly interpreted as a late geometric or early archaic temple, although Karl Blegen already in 1921 had proposed a latest Mycenaean dating for that building and thus had rightly envisaged a continuity of the Mycenaean period after the destruction of the Tyrinthian palace. It seems to me that Schliemann's successors in Tyrians continued to advocate an immediate temporal proximity between the Mycenaean palatial period and geometric times mainly for two reasons. First, they were unwilling to abandon Schliemann's guiding idea of using the Homeric epics as a direct source for understanding the Mycenaean period. Second, they could not imagine that the crystallization of the Homeric poems could have started about half a millennium later than the destruction of the palace, and that the intervening centuries had been largely forgotten by the ancient Greek literary authors. It was only when excavations in Tiryns were resumed in the 1960s that a new generation of excavators accepted the existence of a long interval separating the Mycenaean palatial period from the geometric one. Yet, the general negative view of what was called by then the Dark Ages as a period of abandonment, decay, and decline that prevailed in the 1960s and 19, early 1970s prevented them from recognizing the special nature of Tiryns in the period after 1200 BCE. This only changed with Klaus Kilian's excavations between 1976 and 1983 in the lower town, and especially the lower citadel of Tiryns, which for the first time highlighted the outstanding role of the site in late Helladic 3C, and as you all know, he uncovered a whole sequence of palatial buildings and then followed by a very impressive late Helladic 3C settlement also consisting of several phase up phases. In the course of his reassessment of the late Helladic 3C period, Kilian stressed the unusually large and carefully planned late Helladic 3C lower town estimated by him to be around 25 hectares, and he agreed with Blagan's hypothesis of building T representing the last imposing post-palatial -my post Mycenaean building. It was Sigrid Dega Jalkozzi, who since the 1980s has spoken out in favor of perceiving the post-palatial Mycenaean period as crucial 
for the emergence of an attitude that exalted the past and bemoaned the loss of its greatness, a phenomenon that later would also find its expression in the Homeric poems. In pointing to the yeah, she pointed to, uh, in pointing to the explicitly male and heroic context of many of the images of later Laddick 3C middle narrative pictorial vase painting, she argued that these images were likely to have been motivated by orally performed epic heroic poems of that time that formed the precursors of the much later Homeric ones. The analysis of the appropriation of palatial period movable and fixed archaeological features by late Aladic 3C societies convinced me of the correctness of Dega Yalkotz's views. And I only want to point to Building T, uh, built among the ruins of the palatial ruin and of the palace, and or the, the Tyrion's treasure with this uh, magnificent signet ring of the palatial time, clear signs of the reappropriation of much earlier symbols of power. This led me to argue that due to the peculiarities of the political transition between the palatial and the post-palatial period, forms of imagining the palatial past must have arisen in the 12th century that combined what Jan Asman has called founding and counter-present memory, and that employed material traces of the palatial past in inner societal discourses and practices, which post uh, which uh, through which post-palatial elites tries to bolster their legitimacy. By tracing and analyzing changes in string instruments from the palatial to the post-palatial period, Manolis Mikrakis identified the period after the fall of the palaces as the most likely time of the emergence of the oral epic in the Greek world. He also argued that, I quote, in such a historical setting, Stories about the glorious past and current adversities recounted during feasts would be the most useful means of forging and holding together narrative communities." End quote. Concerning the question at what stage of the post-palatial Mycenaean period an exalted view of the past may have emerged, Dega Yalkozzi pointed to late Aladic 3C middle. Due to the indications for a consolidation of political conditions, but also in the light of the already mentioned clues for narrative elements in the pictorial decoration of that subphase. Indeed, in the 1980s, especially the evidence from Tyrians seemed to suggest such an identification of late Aladic 3C middle as the period of a significant post-palatial recovery. Since in the lower citadel, a systematic architectural development occurred only during the second half of late Hellatic 3C early. Here you see the, um, the first uh, rebuilding after the palatial, su su substantial rebuilding after the pa palatial catastrophe in the second half of late Hellatic 3C early in the lower citadel, and it reached its greatest density during late Hellatic 3C middle. The first part of late Hellatic 3C early in the lower citadel, by contrast, was characterized in Kilian's excavation by a low density inhabitation consisting of makeshift dwellings built inside the ruins of palatial period buildings, which seemingly confirmed the image of the early post-palatial period as one of abandonment and stagnation. And here to the left, you see these rather insignificantly looking buildings of the early, later Latic 3C early one phase or subphase. Yet insights gained in Tyrians over the past three decades emphasized the need for a revision of this gloomy perception of the time immediately following the palace's destruction. It became evident that the described sequence of events in the lower citadel cannot be considered as representative for the historical and social changes at the site as a whole. Concerning the upper citadel, after the unexpected radiocarbon dating to the to the post-palatial Mycenaean period of building T, um, research by Alina, Elina Kadamaki has enabled a more closer dating of that building within later Latic 3C. Based on the in-depth analysis of the pottery from the debris layers along the western slope of the upper citadel, she dated the post-palatial leveling measures prior to the reuse of the palatial ruin to later Latic 3C early one, 
and proposed the dating of the construction of building T already during this earliest part of late Helladic 3C. And this, these are the slides you have already seen in Elina's paper with her differentiation in Alkesi Papadimitriou's excavation of zone two belonging to the late Helladic 3B2, final phase, subphase, and zone one, according to her, to the earliest 3C early. And here is the pottery of zone two and zo some of the examples for zone two and zone one pottery uh, from this excavation. Such a sequence of events fits perfectly to new evidence from the northwestern lower town that stands in striking contrast to the situation in the lower citadel, since it impressively underlines the capabilities of the new elites of the early post-palatial period. The Greek-German excavations under the direction of Alkestis Papadimitriou and me between 2013 and 2018 have led to the differentiation of two building horizons dating to late Helladic 3C early and late Helladic 3C developed respectively and both consisting of two subphases. The excavation demonstrates the excavation demonstrates that already during late Helladic 3C early 1, an entirely new part of the lower town was built, thereby fulfilling plans to develop the area to the north of the Acropolis that had been conceived in the final palatial period and that also included the famous river diversion of Tiryns as a precondition for using this zone and building on it. What is surprising is the systematic way in which, based on this pa palatial preparatory work, during the earliest part of late Helladic 3C, a new architectural environment was created that in, that in this density and complexity is unprecedented in post-palatial Tiryns. And here you see the two subfaces within late Helladic 3C early in to the left, the earlier subphase, and to the right, the later subphase of late Helladic 3C early in our excavation. And then when I was referring to town planning yesterday, lower town planning, you see what I mean? This was totally created on a preconceived plan, um, something which I do not yet see for the palatial period, strangely enough. In this settlement of the earliest later Latic 3C early, we encounter already during that phase the so-called handshake crater, that's the name we, g we have given to it, and as an outstanding example of figurative vase painting. It demonstrates that the origins of pictorial vase painting with a narrative context content revolving around the activities of warriors go back long before late Helladic 3C middle and were probably based on palatial period pictorial traditions but developed them in completely new directions. This fact has hitherto escaped the attention of researchers because so few well stratified fine complexes from the earliest part of the 12th century BCE had been known. In conclusion, it can be said that at least in Tiryns, a reassessment of late Helladic 3C early seems unavoidable. Evidently, the newly formed elites of the earliest post-palatial period initiated ambitious building projects that do not fit at all with the image of abandonment, destitution, and decline that in the past has often been associated with the early 12th century in Tiryns. It seems that in the immediate aftermath of the palace's demise, the efforts of rebuilding concentrated on the upper citadel and the northern lower town, while the lower citadel was not yet integrated in overarching building activities. Moreover, already immediately after the destruction of the palace, clear references to the palatial past can be observed. Constructed around the throne of the great Megaron and adjacent to the complex of great court and altar, Building T was ideally suited as a place where, amidst the palatial ruin mound at meetings of the noble families of Tiryns, the precursors of epic poetry extolling the past that were postulated by Dega Yalkotzi and Mikrakis may have been performed. The ritualized feasts taking place in the northwestern lower town shortly after the end of the palace employed a vessel such as the handshake crater as their centerpiece that provides evidence for a joy of storytelling and an interest in, ex in an explicitly male, heroic imagery, features that were previously thought to have arisen only in late Helladic 3C middle. This indicates that the origin of Mikrakis' narrative communities that formed the basis of the emergence of 
oral epic, oral epic poetry glorifying the palatial past can be traced back to the decades immediately following the demise of the palaces. Accordingly, what Schliemann could not have known is that the end of the Palace of Tyrans was many centuries removed from that of the evolution and crystallization of the Homeric poems. We shall never know whether Schliemann, had he been av aware of this long interval, would have questioned the validity of using the Homeric poems as a source of historical knowledge about Mycenaean Greece. The fact is, however, that subsequent generations of archaeologists working in Tyrans did not revise Schliemann's assumption of a temporal connection between the Mycenaean palaces and the geometric period. They did this, I suspect, because they relied too heavily on the ancient Greek literary sources and wanted to cling to the illusion that the Iliad and the Odyssey were really talking about the newly discovered world of the Mycenaean palaces. In this way, they were unable to recognize the crucial fact of the continuity of the Mycenaean period for about 150 years after the palaces had been destroyed. Exactly during this period, new forms of social memory arose that were directed towards the palatial past and probably already were based on the fusion of founding and counter-present memory, which much later also became a typical feature of the Homeric poems. The crystallization of the Homeric poems seems to have been the end point of a development that is likely to have begun as early as the first decades of the 12th century with orally transmitted forms of poetry that have not survived and must have arisen from the new situation after the collapse of the palaces. This led people to exalt certain traits of the palatial period and to try to link themselves to it by taking possession of palatial period elements for purposes that were intimately related to the peculiarities of the social and political circumstances of the new volatile world surrounding them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. And last but not least, Ulrich Thaler of the, I'm not going to say it, the Roman German Central Museum of Mines. <laughs> Uh, the house that Oduseu built on the Medic Megara and building biographies. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, I'd actually like to start by uh, warmly thanking our organizers, Klaus uh, Moderna and Robert Lapinen, for the sheer pleasure of being here, and that is my being here, and I think I need to follow that up with thanks for the patience of your still being here, <laughs> which is also greatly appreciated. The heyday of the Megaron might, with some justification, be dated to the last quarter of the 19th century AD, at least from an Athenian perspective, with, for example, the Megaro Andrea Singru, the Megaro Stathatu, or the Megaro Mela, and no less than six stately residences by Ernst Ziller alone, including one occasionally still called the Megaro Eriko Schliemann. Recalling the transposition in my known archaeology of the term villa from current architectural terminology to Bronze Age buildings, we should not be surprised then that Heinrich Schliemann and Wilhelm Derpfeld, when uncovering the Palace of Tyrans, decided to designate the central suite of rooms Megaron. But, of course, both the Athenian and the Tyrensian naming actually reflect the same preoccupation with constructing a cultural identity reaching back to Homer and beyond, both for the still young nation state and as a cornerstone of Western civilization. Homer 
As a primary point of reference is readily apparent from Schliemann's 1885 publication in which Derpfeld set out the basic characteristics of the architecture in question. Axiality, the court in front, vestibule, antechamber and main hall with columns and circular half. As to borrowing the Homeric term, Derpfeld states that the poet's description of the palace of Alkinos in particular, and I quote, agrees very well with the arrangement of the Megaron at Tiryns. Most probably, he continues, the ground plan of the Megaron at Tiryns was a typical one, occurring in an identical manner in many heroic palaces, end quote. While the latter remark was to be corroborated by the remarkable uniformity of the Megaroth in order of their discovery, Tiryns, Mycenae, and Pylos, it is of course well known that the Homeric perspective led to distortions of the excavator's perception. A characteristic example is Derpfeld's straight Homeric reading of the Tiryns bathroom's most convenient location. Again, I quote, before entering the Megaron, a visitor could reach the bathroom at once from the west colonnade of the court. When washed and anointed, he went through the same corridor to the anteroom and thence into the Megaron, end quote. Derpfeld was convinced that excavation had uncovered one of the rooms in which the Homeric heroes actually bathed and anointed themselves. And yet, Kurt Müller easily refuted the existence of any door into the anteroom of the bath other than the one clearly indicated by the monolithic threshold on its western side. And he concluded, the bathroom is not associated with the Megaron and we cannot identify any connection of a ritual or other kind between it and the Megaron, end quote. There are, by the way, two other rooms with drains that would actually be well positioned for ritual cleaning before entering the presence of the Wanax. But even in the most recent publication on the bathroom from 2012, it is the latter that remains a putative way station for the journey-worn guest. A different route for tracing the impact of Schliemann's work is through reception in visual media, in which Tyrion's became, by default, the prototype for reconstructions of Mycenaean palaces. The background image of my slides, Franz von Reber's 1898 reconstruction, which Brian Burns, of course, beautifully deconstructed at the 2006 EPOS conference, is a point in case. Another one is the distinctly Homeric take reflected in J. Henry Middleton's cross-section and plan of a megarant from 1886. Based on the understanding that, in the epics, women enter the megarant from behind and or above, Middleton felt compelled to offer a second door where archaeology documented only one. Thus, he reconstructed the Orso theory mentioned in Homer halfway up the wall, reached by a ladder in what we today identify as the position of the throne. Derpfeld's response to Middleton was somewhat reserved. He refused to engage in controversies which, I quote, the excavations afforded us no materials to explain perhaps a bit of a contrast to his own discussion of the Tyrion's bathroom. More importantly, however, what today may seem like an oddity from Schliemann's days actually continues again to be directly reflected in research for a very long time. Dorothy Gray's 1955 reconstruction of a Homeric palace still sought to reconcile Homer as its primary source with Mycenaean archaeology and it not only retains the Middletonian also theory, but almost seems to amalgamate Middleton's reconstruction with a plan of the palace of Pylos, as it had been uncovered by 1954. Tellingly, ideas encapsulated in images are not merely transmitted, but actually recombined. As a more recent example, the reconstructed interior view of the Tyrion's Megaron by Peter Connolly documents yet more clearly. It is based on images that are not deconstructed early relics, but very much part of the current canon of our discipline. The chosen point of view, which does little to make sense of the architectural context, is clearly derived from Peter Young's oft-reproduced reconstruction of the Pilos throne room. 
Connolly does avoid a noticeable flaw of de Jong's illustration, that is the transparency of the near walls required by the chosen perspective. But in transposing the reconstruction to Tyrins, he also adds an independently transmitted Tyrinthian mistake. In preparing the 1912 reconstruction of the Tyrins Megaron floor, the partially preserved grid of lines had deliberately not been continued right up to the hearth since there was no indication, as Gerhard Rodenwald later explained, I quote, what artistic solution might have reconciled the square grid with a round hearth, unquote. But as the Megaron floor at Mycenae soon demonstrated, and that at Pilos would later vividly confirm, Bronze Age craftsmen had not worried about this problem at all. Thus, a mere seven years after publishing the reconstruction, Rodenwald reflected that expecting some solution to the assumed artistic dilemma had been zu griechisch empfunden, too Greek a sentiment. Nonetheless, the 1912 reconstruction continues to be reproduced without changes and even transposed into new reconstructions, such as the one by Connolly. Burns is clearly right to remind us that, I quote, like the excavator's report, the illustrator's reconstruction can last long beyond its original publication and continue to shape perceptions of the Greek past, end quote. Indeed, not only reconstructions, but also plans may be rather more insidious than excavator's reports and that they are probably replicated less critically and more faithfully. To remind us of this, I think it's helpful to think of archaeological illustrations as memes, not in the sense of law cats, but as originally defined by the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. As clearly defined cultural entities and seemingly self-replicating units of transmission, capable of recombination, archaeological illustrations fulfill central criteria for an identification as memes. Clearly, we need to be critical and self-critical with regard to our use of archaeological illustrations and to the messages they encapsulate. Another very successful meme is of course also found in the term Megaron itself. Even in Homer's epics, the Megaron could be a tent, a hut, or a palace. It could designate the men's or the women's quarters, house basileis or geese, or just simply mean at home. The archaeological use of the term Megaron quickly became just as versatile. Even within Schliemann's monograph on Tyrins, the term is transferred to the early Bronze Age building in Troy previously designated Temple A. The excavator of the Mycenae Megaron, Christos Zundas, also contributed to the chronological and geographical expansion of the terms used when in 1908 he identified Neolithic Megara in Thessalian Sesclo and Vimini. Considering this diffusion of the Megaron in little more than 20 years after the excavations at Tiryns, it is not surprising that a century later no single definition of the term is followed in the literature. Besides the core unit of a Mycenaean palace, the term is also used, as summarized by Pascal d'Arc, to describe a broader group of rectangular buildings accessed through a porch formed by Ante on one of the narrow sides, <coughs> and sometimes even to designate seemingly any rectangular building that is more monumental than expected, either for its time or its region or its site. A crucial point criticized by Dark is, of course, that designation Megaron for buildings with no clear typological associations with the palatial Megara is sometimes linked to explicit claims of Greek ethnicity. Situated in what is today Turkish-occupied northern Cyprus, the Megaron identified by Porfirios Dikeos in the Ashla building of Sector 4 West in Engomi provides a case in point, a point in case. Um, by the time, however, that Dark repeated his call pour l'abandon du terme Megaron in 2005, we had already learned in one of the nicer ironies of Aegean archaeology that Mycenaean Greeks had indeed used that very term themselves. In 2001, Katie Dimakopoulos' Midea excavation discovered an inscribed string nodule of canonical type with the inscription Opa Megarode Asonio. 
The suffix de in megarove indicates an allative form that is a, destina a destination. Apparently, a sealed object was to be delivered on behalf of Esonios to the Mekaro. Whether this designates a room, a building, an institution, or indeed a place name remains uncertain at present, but an association with the palatial sphere is clear. Moreover, Mekaro is established as an emic Mycenaean term by the Medea ceiling. By contrast to the etic perspective of the ideally impartial outsider, the term emic, coined by anthropologist Kenneth Pike, designates the inside view, the perspective of the social group under study, their rules, explanation, and categorizations. In prehistoric archaeology, the extraneous etic perspective of artifact typology is, of course, a typical one, but has also received critical attention for a long time which recently has been coupled with a growing interest in archaeologies of the mind in explicit efforts to identify indigenous or emic categories. For Eugene Archaeology, Julie Ruby's 2010 discussion of indigenous, uh, indigenous Mycenaean pottery types is a highly relevant case study. She analyzes both Linear B records of ceramics and the way pottery was grouped and stored in the administration and storage presuppose capitalization on the part of those actively involved. As to my topic, both the Homeric Megaron and von Reber's rather Doric Megaron and ethnically, ethnically Greek Megaron Cyprus are all etic concepts when applied to Bronze Age buildings. But there are at least two points of departure for building towards the reconstruction associated with the Mycenaean term Mekaron. The first concerns the derivation of the Mycenaean palatial Megara. In last year's Sundva lecture at the Swedish School in Athens, Jim Wright offered a very interesting perspective by placing the palatial Megaron not on one of the branches of a typological family tree, but at the intersection of two architectural concepts. A long-established distinction of axiality, represented equally in rectangular and a spiral building, and a more recent fascination with the architectural and communicative affordances of corridors, most vividly illustrated by the main building at Vla or the southwestern building at Ulos. This, I think, is far more promising than discussing what early predecessors might still be deserving of the label Megaron. Today, however, I want to focus on the second point of departure for an emic understanding of Mycenaean Megara, the simple and aforementioned fact of the surprising uniformity of the palatial Megara of Corinth, Mycenae, and Ulos. Regardless of any putative predecessors, such uniformity is inconceivable without a clear mental prototype, that is, an emic concept of what this building should look like and what uses and encounters it should permit. Although pertinent experiments by geographers have mostly focused on larger scale contexts than individual buildings, research into so-called mental or cognitive maps, that is the embodied memory of a person's point of view experience of a familiar place and setting, is very illuminating. One crucial feature of mental maps observable in experiment B allows to draw such setting is a clear tendency towards simplification. In a Euclidean sense, this may result in distortion or, for example, the straight lines of sight inscribed in street sections, but in experiential terms, it can be seen as a reduction to the sensual. And looking at the palace of Corinth, a reduction to what is experientially essential seems to me a good way to describe the relation of the secondary, smaller megaron to the large, main megaron. Some elaboration is lost, such as the vestibule between porch and classroom, or the internal columns, but the house, the emplacement for a throne or similar seat, the column courtyard in front of the building, and the actual access are always preserved. I have argued elsewhere that moving from the door of the house to the side opposite the throne rather than towards the throne itself was the norm for visitors in the palatial megaphone. Would most likely be preserved in the smaller Corinth Megaron. 
while in the main medley the term Rockpole is surrounded by ornamental bands delineating a wide and unobtrusive escape, the eastern side of the secondary medley is also played apart by a band embedded in the clear grid. As a less elaborate version of the large palatial medley, two and six secondary medley are paralleled by Magaron A at the same intervening. In reduced form, it preserves Support that in front of the porch with the skeleton at the heart. Even its integration into a large rock section of the that goes back to what Jim Wright spoke about, that is, the connection with ancillary rooms in the three corridor, is directly reminiscent of those found in the Palace of Dia. Similarly, the Menelaean one of Sparta need not be seen as a typological link, but can help us approach the realist understanding of what is an essential element of the Megaron and what can be considered a new elaboration of the most famous example. Refocusing on Pyramus, the second industrial divergence from the four sides of the large palatial megaron can be identified in the post palatial story of the Orangutai. Again, the builder's intent to direct readers to a very less elaborate form of the spatial setting of the large palatial megaron appears evident. But we don't see the most Rather than part of a larger megaron, the Anjidal is a freestanding megaron. Uh, rather than part of a large compound. It would be the freestanding megaron. Regardless, again, of any putative predecessors, I maintain that it is specifically the reduction documented by the Anjidal which suggests that indeed, from a Mycenaean point of view, being freestanding or integrated into a larger complex is in not what makes or unmakes a megaron. Now, pursuing an inquiry into the original user's perspective on prehistoric material culture beyond the level of emic typologies leads us from shared cultural perceptions to the individual level and thus to the discussion of object biographies. The concept is, of course, familiar to epic traditions, including the Homeric one, both in the form of a genealogy of ownership, and we heard about the helmet of Odysseus, and we might add as an example um, Agamemnon's scepter produced by Hephaestus and handed down from Zeus via four previous owners. But there's also the form of a horizontal transmission of exotic goods, as evidenced by the finest mixing bowl in all the world at the funerary games for, pra for Patroclus. The potential of discussing object biographies in prehistoric context is best illustrated in Mycenaean archaeology, I think, by John Bennett's consideration of how precious objects acquire their value. Two exemplary pre-palatial cases are an ostrich egg writing with Phaeon's applique dolphins and an Egyptian alabastron turned upside down and into an Aegean bridge spouted jar, both from the shaft grades in Mycenae. Now even without written evidence, these vessels clearly tell a story of exotic origin, bespoke production, Aegeanizing transformation and uniqueness, and it is easy to imagine a parallel biographical narrative of ownership. In the palatial period, however, um, entirely different non-biographic objects appear to have acquired high value simply through being palace-made. Bennett's prime example for this are blue glass beads, distinctly non-unique objects, serially produced in palace workshops by the Kuwama Walker we heard about from a fairly novel material imported under palatial control. But at the same time, strongly biographical objects like the pre-palatial examples continue to be curated um, within the palaces themselves. The palace almost seems to have aspired to a dual, a dual monopoly on A, the distribution of distinct non-biographic precious objects, and B, the ownership of biographically charged heirlooms. Now, acknowledging that architecture is a category of material culture which is intimately and recursively linked, not just with the construction of broader social realities, but also personal biography, biographies, leads us from object biographies to building biographies. At the intersection of the spatial and the material turn in the social sciences, building biography have garnered growing attention in prehistoric archaeology in recent years. But again, the concept would have made a lot of sense to Homer too, uh, as is clearly illustrated by the well-known episode of Odysseus' immovable, be immovable bedpost 
which signals how closely his and Penelope's shared biography is tied to the materiality of their home. As a more recent and personal example, if this architectural image conjures up memories for some of you, and I'm thinking of the speakers in this session in particular, then it also illustrates the close connection between the built environment and the construction of biography. This shows a detail of what, as the former Tyrion's big house, was rather charitably called the Proitu Megaron. The academic tradition satirized in this name, that is, the heroic naming of Bronze Age architectural contexts, uh, continues to reflect the hope of Schliem and, uh, and other pioneers to tie supposedly known heroic biographies to specific architectural contexts. But as with object biographies, a helpful perspective on prehistoric building biographies is, I maintain, more likely to be gained from considering the mechanisms through which built contexts embody and shape biographies. Today, however, I cannot demonstrate in extenso, and I think Kim will agree, that building biographies in the latter sense are a potential key to, let's call it a neo-Homeric perspective on Mycenaean architecture, and specifically the Megara. But I still want to illustrate that they may well turn out to be by offering an example of how we might be able to tie specific, meaningful acts to the preserved architectural record. As the center of the Megaron in architectural, praxeological, and symbolic terms, the hearth in the Pylos throne room preserves no less than five successive layers of stucco on its rim, all repeating essentially the same ornamentation. In the secondary Pelian hearth room 46, there are four distinct layers on the rim, whereas in the Mycenae Megaron, Winifred Lamb was able to tease out five stucco layers for the floor, and six for the center of the hearth, but the stunning 10 layers for its ornamental rim, with up to three resting on the same floor layer. Such a concern with renewal well beyond the functionally necessary calls to mind that Hittite textual sources, KUB 29.1 in particular, testify to the symbolic and possibly magical importance which the Mycenaean Greeks' eastern neighbors attributed to the act of plastering, as well as to the building of the hearth. Detailed rituals are prescribed on the occasion of the construction of a palace, but are thought to have also been linked with the renewal of an existing one. Against this background, um, I think it's highly tempting to link the repeated replastering of the Megaron hearth to events documented in Linear B texts that may have warranted the symbolic renewal of the palace, especially, of course, the inauguration of the Wanax, apparently reflected in Pilos tablet UM2. I do not want to speculate on charting a dynasty, that is, the construction of a family biography through the sequence of layers on a palatial half, but a slightly suggestive final note should be permitted on the occasion of Heinrich Schliemann's anniversary. If the Mycenaean palaces guarded biographically charged objects as jealously as Bennett argument, Bennett's argument indicates, then a phenomenon like the apparent profusion of megaroid buildings in post-palatial Tyrians, beyond building T, the Antenbau and the Acropolis, could be seen to indicate that those families among the post-palatial elites who had neither a palatial biography nor the building that went with it they may well have felt the need to start building biographies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ulrich. So, we're um, discussion about this questions for this session. I, we should start with Elena Kardemaki, who's on the who hopefully will be on the Zoom. Are there, we'll, we'll get her up there. She's the first one at the top. Are there any questions for our first paper, our first speaker? And is there one in here? He's clapping.
Well, I'll, I will take the, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Alina, um, I wanted to ask you about, you, you mentioned about the use of, of wood stairs and the possibility that that was potentially not a very good idea uh, in that area. Is there, was there any indication, in fact, that there were some remnants of burned wood or anything like that? Um, any record, it's probably all gone from the early excavations, but something that would actually indicate that that was the case. If she can hear me. No, no, uh, Elena, you might, you, yeah, no, 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 I can hear you. Uh, uh, well, uh, if, if I, if I heard co correct, you asked me if there is any indication for, for burned uh, wood? Yes, or, yes, it's, yes. yes. Um, there is, uh, and first of all, there is a layer of ashes um, in the whole area, both in this uh, structure P, as well as in other parts of the staircase. Um, and in several other uh, instances, there has been also, um, there have been found parts of beams, wooden beams, mm -hmm. um, that are burned. Great. But no, that's great. I, it reminded me a little bit of the north staircase at Mycenae, which started out in stone and then also had a wood, wooden element. So I was mm -hmm. wondering about mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Thank you very All right. much. Hold on one second. Uh, yes, Elena. One of the peculiar things about the western staircase is that the postern gate at its bottom, which provides access from the western part of, of the town, does not preserve any indication of how it was to be closed, which either indicates a lack of preservation or it indicates a lack of means to close it, which a lot of people have assumed is the case. Now, if you have this outer ward situation, the swinger, so to say, in the western staircase, that's not really a problem if you attack anybody coming up the staircase from all sides. But the moment you have structure fee and a connection from within the western staircase up to the parapet, even if that is ephemeral, that could be a problem. And I was wondering whether you might want to comment on that. Um. I don't know, Ms. Papadimitri, Papa perhaps would like to comment? Uh, yes, this is, uh, we also think that this was really a bold decision to build <laughs> something there, even if it was a, a, a wooden staircase. And I think we, we did discuss about this find so many times. Um, it was kind of mystery for me why to build it there because either and, and, and of course we will never know if it was also if there was also an access to the upper system directly most probably not um, but uh, even having an access to the, the the parapet of the exterior wall it's very bold yes I agree <laughs> Uh, it, it looks like a typical foundation for a terrace or a ramp, so it must have been something like that, providing access to the to the the exterior wall. Great. Any other questions? Okay. If not, thank you. Thank you, Lena. We'll go on to uh, the second paper, Joseph Moran. <clears throat> so, thank you so very much for your uh, presentation. I was very surprised and very happy to discover that the confusion you mentioned at the beginning between Mycenaean shards and geometric uh, period uh, is exactly the same we have over Thera and Therasia. Uh, so, what I can tell you about this, because we know we have already researched that, although I'm not, uh, I haven't come to an end uh, with that, uh, it doesn't begin with Schliemann. It has begun with uh, Alexander Konze, who has studied vases from Melo at a time where he confused that with Santorini, with 
there. They didn't know, the provenance was not very clear to them. And uh, he described them, uh, both from Melo, first from Melo, then he went throughout Europe and studied all geometric findings he could find at the time. He, he was the first to describe them as a class of bases, and then he said there is a period, that's the geometric period, and this is prehistory, and this is pre-Greek, and this is uh, Aryan, of course. So uh, there has been a huge fight uh, during the second half of the 19th century uh, in between the, what can I say, uh, the establishment of the German school, you know, the people like Konzig who became the director of the, of the uh, then Imperial Archaeological Institute, and then people from outside, either friends, but not all French people, but scholars like uh, Salomon Reynac, he, that would drive him crazy, or um, Alois Rigo in the, in the um, German-speaking uh, sphere, who was a historian of art. I mean, he is remembered, who very strongly opposed that, and who said, but there is something else there, this is not possible. And Schliemann actually uh, fell on the, somewhere in the middle, they, they, they somehow allowed um, Kant and the, the establishment of the German Institute to say, yes, this was Greek, this was pre, this was Homeric, this was, uh, and that's, but that's why there is the confusion. And I was very, very interested to hear, because I was, exp I mean, it didn't happen on Thera because they started digging, so it, it remained there as a theory, but I'm not surprised at all that happened in Germany. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is uh, very important to see that this was embedded in larger discourses in the last third of the 19th century. Um, I think for, as for Schliemann himself, the, the evidence that he found in Terence, um, it seemed to suggest a direct proximity between geometric and Mycenaean architecture. Um, so probably it was, it, it, I, I think it's, it's understandable why he reached this conclusion. What I find more interesting is that this pr uh, that this continued and that it was Blegen who was not from that uh, school from the German that may point to what you are suggesting um, that, that this came from the outside uh, Blegen's idea that there may have been a post palatial period as early as 1921 which was refuted by Kurt Müller and also the Georg Caro didn't believe in that um, the German, all these German excavators, uh, except Rodenwald, he had this racial connotation of, the, of, of certain features of Mycenaean Greece. The others, in Schliemann, it was not lively, not, uh, d d don't know about this, and uh, Georg Caro also, as far as I know, it wasn't that, uh, was not mixing in this feature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a very interesting analysis of the way things may have developed in Tyrans. I'm guessing that the word may is still one that we should be using. But going back to the very first communication we had from uh, Tom and Vasilis, they were emphasizing the issue of the routes by which Bronze Age realities became Homeric myths and um, Homeric memories and what the possible routes were and the way things were distorted. And you started off by telling us that in the early years of the last century, different scholars proposed different time spans between the new Mycenaean discoveries and geometric Greece with the dates derived from Herodotus and Thucydides. And I have always wondered that we are stretching memory a very long way, as Susan Sherratt did some years ago by suggesting that the finds in the Grave Circle A were the inspiration of the Homeric epics, a time span of, what, 800 years. Um, but I think one of the fascinating things about our discipline is the number of times we're challenged by new information. Um, 
some of you, I'm sure, will know that um, radiocarbon dates from northern Greece, published about two years ago, suggested that we should be collapsing the um, early part of the Iron Age and that the dates for early geometric are more likely to be near 1,000 than uh, 900 or 850. And at the same time, we have learnt that the Greek alphabet in its earliest forms matches most closely not the Phoenician alphabet of the 8th century, but the Phoenician alphabet of the 10th century. And clearly there's some issues here about have we got our chronologies right? And to me it would make the whole of these issues about the transfer of memories and so on if we could think of Homer, you know, regardless of the dates provided by 5th century historians, if we could actually think of Homer um, or the Homeric construct as being a lot earlier than the one we are going to. And we could also entertain the possibility, uh, why are the Greeks borrowing writing as early as the beginning of the 9th century unless they're going to use it for something? And here, of course, we move into an area of total speculation. But these are the kinds of new bits of information, if confirmed from other directions, of course, that may well invite us to rethink the whole of the issue of how does Homer relate to the Bronze Age? What is the time span involved? And I suppose my question to you is whether you have considered any of these or, uh, or not, these issues that definitely uh, impact on our understanding of what's going on in what are no longer the Dark Ages, but very much full of information. This, of course, the, uh, you were referring to the Sindos, Sindos chronology in, in northern Greece and Macedonia. Um, so of course, this radiocarbon evidence is there and it's unexpected. I don't think that it can be harmonized with what we know of interrelations between the different phases of the Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age which are very well tied through Italy or through the Balkans with Central European dendrochronology. And so the Urnfield culture, the earlier part and the later Urnfield culture are very well dendrochronologically dated. And I see, th I, I, I cannot explain why these dates are uh, so high in Sindos, but I, at the moment, I, 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 I cannot believe this. And I think something else must be involved. We have also other such theories, and there's a lively debate in the er about early Iron Age chronology, and uh, most other groups refute these dates. But of course, we have to be open-minded. Fact is, though, fact is though that that the original formulation of Schliemann's and Dörpfel's view, and of the of the late uh, their successors that the palace comes and then the geometric period for the argolith is, is certainly wrong, as you know better than me. Right? There's a long period of later light C and also sub-Mycenaean and pro especially proto-geometric. And this is, this is quite a sound, it's, it's based on a sound relative chronology. Yes, we, it would be helpful to have an absolute chronology, also to refine the absolute chronology in the argolith itself, there's a lack of C14 dates, we try to apply C14 dates also by, by Bayesian uh, sequencing, but unfortunately the sequence we had in the northwestern lower town was not long enough to apply these statistical means. You need 100 years at least, and we only had six or seven centuries, very dense occupation, and so the it's, it's not reliable enough. This is work for the future. Uh, it would be interesting to know how long this dark ages really lasted whether it was 500 years, 400 years, or less. At the moment, I see I'm, I'm, I'm tending towards the longer span. Yeah. Other questions? Tom? 
Tom, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I am here. And uh, I'm adopting a Marlon Brando look. <laughs> uh, but a uh, streetcar named Desire. I, I, I wanted to um, just say some words to uh, the, not just Joseph Moran's paper, all the papers this afternoon, I uh, mean, uh, morning, still my time, were really spectacular. Uh, really, th these were the h very high quality papers and have me thinking uh, in, in, in new ways of <laughs> about many things. Uh, but to Joseph Moran, I, I really, uh, again, uh, uh, I have my mind uh, t uh, turned into a turmoil uh, by this. A and I think that there, there are uh, m many questions to be raised. One, uh, you know, we, we do have clear indications that a vibrant oral poetic tradition uh, was already in place, I think, as early as the uh, 15th century BC. Uh, the, the, it's incontrovertible that we have hexameter lines that when we return them to the form, that linguistic form they would have had in the 15th century works perfectly as hexameter lines. And Vasilis Petrakis and I discussed uh, the, the, the line that had been uh, isolated uh, by uh, Case Royk and, and, and talked about and, and reconstructed. So uh, the challenge then becomes to uh, wonder how at this crucial period um, a, a new form of oral poetics uh, uh, came about. Uh, in the, uh, the, the three C structure at Tiryns, uh, whoever was then now in charge uh, of the society, whatever power figure would be occupying that building, could see all around him uh, the evidence of destruction and ruin. And, and this would certainly have uh, affected the kind of... Um, of, uh, of oral song that would then be generated at this time. Uh, I'm sure that there is a continuation uh, of the f forms of ritual action and uh, communally focused ritual action, the feasting uh, and, and the song performance and so forth. Uh, and, but again, it also is a, a, a hard fact that pre the destructions, uh, uh, of the, the, the palatial centers. There is a vast power distance between Anax and Basilux. That is absolutely clear. And, and Vasilis and I uh, pointed to the line in Homer, as we now have Homer, which speaks of uh, a, 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 a Basilus anason using a, a, a participial form. And, and so something like that kind of transformation must have taken place, but, but it really makes me wonder what is going on in the 3C period in terms of power transformation. Did the person who was a power figure at that moment uh, still title himself as a Wanox, or, or uh, did, did one of the uh, local power figures that were known as Basilus at what point did, did that transformation take place? Because in Homer, as you know, Wanox is used very, very specifically. I mean, it's used of Agamemnon, but that's an acknowledgement of him as an extremely high uh, position power figure among the others. But we do have other regional leaders uh, referred to as Basileis. So, I mean, I don't, have, I don't expect Yosef to <laughs> answer any of that. But I do want to say that, that your presentation uh, really, um, it, as I said, new questions. I think the last respondent also uh, brought up the fact that these are, uh, are new ideas. I do have a uh, point with regard to the, the final uh, speaker, uh, but I, uh, I've already gone on long. And, and I, should I wait until then, or should I just shut up? <laughs> or should I ask the question now? I think you should definitely not shut up. <laughs> um, we all enjoy that very much, your comments. 
I, I probably I cannot uh, answer your question, but I will try to share my ideas on what you're saying. And, and um, you're absolutely right that uh, poems and poetry go back way into the earlier parts of the Mycenaean period. There's also uh, imagery, like in Pylos, the throne room, pointing to at least uh, singing and using the lyre. Um, yet the, the argumentation of Mikrakis, he pointed to the change in the lyre form, the reduction of the string numbers, and that words became, uh, gained a new meaning um, in relation to, to, the, to the actual music in the post-palatial period. So what I think happened is that these, these poetry in the, in the post-palatial, in the early post-palatial period, it was based on, on the palatial one in, in certain regards. I'm sorry, uh, I, I cannot hear what your answer is, but it's for the benefit of the people in the okay, hall. Okay, that's, that's very but unfortunate. We have a very, very hard time uh, hearing. Oh, that's, and it's that's, not that's very unfortunate. Like so I think what, what, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I'll try to be louder. I think the what is that the that whatever they they sung in the early post palatial period was based on previous forms of poetry of the of the earlier of the palatial period and earlier times but the new element is that what i call in using asman's terminology the counter present memory a new perception of the past and i think this was the new element coming in in the early 12th century um, and I think this was the reason for this is the decapitation of the of the former political highest political level, and this highest political level in the Mycenaean palaces was w whether some of them survived is we, we will never know, but I think the the, the 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 loss of information, the loss of memory in the highest political level, this paved the way for new ways of imagining the past. So that explains why the past, palatial past was, must have been very far removed even for people f of the early 12th century because the actual people who were f previously using the Megaron, they, n they have not survived. Um, and the new personnel, they had a different stance toward the palatial period and only had limited knowledge of what was going on in the, in the sanctum of the of the of the uh, that's why the, the cru I think this is the crucial change in in bringing a new giving this poetry a new turn. Um, yeah. Um, uh, also, the way the building T was built, they didn't dare to build. Uh, they didn't want to build the palace, so they wanted to have this building amidst the ruins of the palace of the ruined mound. This must have sent a very strong signal. They didn't attempt to touch this palace previously and not to build it again. Whether they, mm -hmm. this, we cannot see, exclude that this was also a negative stance towards certain elements of the palace. Um, this, that this veneration may be one aspect, but certain ele elements of the post palatial society may also have, have um, been part of the destruction of the, of the palaces themselves. And so I think the, it was, yes, there was, of course, earlier poetic po poetry, but it, it gained a new turn in the, po in the earliest part of the post-palatial period. Yeah, thank you. Tom, hold on in a minute. Thank you very much for this very, very educative, at least for me, um, presentation. As, as Professor Palema and um, Petrakis started, and of course you mentioned again this Homeromania, which gave birth to the first interpretation and reading of the Mycenaean world, I suspect that it, it took long to be abandoned also because of the Greek human factor, which I want to uh, propose as a working hypothesis, and this is Sophia Schliemann. Um, you see, one would expect from Chundas, I mean, looking at his, his records and his publications, especially the ones in Thessaly, to have studied the stratigraphy post-mortem Schliemanns, of course, and, and, and uh, propose some, some differentiations from Schliemanns' um, um, uh, narrative. But Tsudas left early. He was elected academic in 1906 and then never excavated again. And then we were left with 
Valerio Stais, who never said in public, there's no mummy, but he knew there was no mummy in tomb five. There was a skeleton um, um, exhibited. And there was also Panagiotis Castriotis, Sophia's brother, who was the director of the museum from 1925 until the early 1930s. And then Sophia died in the early 30s. And then we have a new archaeology on the Mycenaean narrative. Uh, this is a working hypothesis which we would love to explore, uh, some of us in the future. How much was easy for anybody to go out and say, okay, there is the epic, but also we have a late Bronze Age here, like they do in Middle Europe. Let's see the stratigraphy and let's try to uh, narrate it differently. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Joseph, for a wonderful paper. And actually, I'd like to follow up on something that, that uh, Tom Palaima said. And it's the, uh, effectively, you are, cre you are relating the Homeric tradition to the early, late Atlantic 3, 3C1 period in Tyrians. However, whereas the Homeric tradition is, let's say, a, a broad Greek phenomenon, the situation in Tyrians is highly specific for this, uh, this early period. So do you think this is due to, let's say, archaeological uh, circumstances, the fact that we've had these, uh, the, these excellent excavations, especially also by yourself and Klaus Kilian and others, or do you think this is a phenomenon that, that let's say, the Tyrians phenomenon in this early period is wider spread among the uh, uh, um, uh, Greek palaces, the Mycenaean palaces? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was not, I, I, I'm not suggesting that the Homeric poems were created in Tyrion. So that, um, I think that the, the certain kind of poetry with a strong heroic uh, emphasis, this, this get, got underway in the 12th century. And the Homeric poems, of course, they are, because they are much later, their crystallization, they reflect a different, different time. Um, I think the argolit may be a special case, and certain other re uh, other regions um, of the former palatial regions. Messenia has suffered a much bigger setback after the after 1200s, even de depopulation, as it seems. Um, Boeotia, big question mark. There may be, uh, I'm sure that there may be out there other cases, interesting other regions of the, that s do not seem to have had palaces like Eubea, Achaia, Elis, these Ilia, um, how they fit into this picture. And I cannot tell you. I think there are many surprises ahead. Uh, uh, the the argolid may be indeed a special case and may explain why this until the uh, crystallization of the Homeric poems uh, is so prominent, the Argolid. And it's also the, it left the most visible ruins for later generations, something which was also uh, emphasized by Tom and, and Vasilis. The Argolid, with their, uh, the, the citadels themselves, they ensured that these sites stayed in, this, in the memory, while other sites, Pylos, um, Thebes, Thebes may also had a f fortification, but it's not that prominent. And uh, so there are several reasons why the Argive citadels played such a major role. One of them, that they had this deviating, that they were the only palatial, seemingly the only previous palatial region that did not suffer that heavily, or seemingly did not suffer that heavily as other regions. And the second, because they, co by coincidence, they built with Cyclopean masonry that was the later generations were unable to use as stone quarries, or from a certain point also did not want to use as stone quarries because they, they uh, venerated this, these ruins. Yeah. So I think there is a special, c the Argolid may indeed be a very special case, and, um, but there may be other regions. We have large lacunae in other regions, in Attica, in, in Boeotia, and in other parts of the Peloponnese. So there are surprises ahead. 
I think so. Tyrant is a special case and it rises in importance after 1200. And I think this has something to do with the power power struggle between Mycenae and Tyrants and the reason why the, the destruction happened. Um, and uh, I'm not the, the first one to suggest this. But uh, it's, it's really striking that what we see in Tyrants of course, Mycenae was also important in 3C, but th this kind of, of new building initiatives is really um, very special. We would like to know the uh, closer dating of certain um, rebuilding activities in the Megaron area of Mycenae. Yeah, yeah, the so-called geometric building of Zundas, uh, which may, like as Lisa French has, in my opinion, rightly suggested and persuasively suggested a Mycenaean, latest Mycenaean building. But it's even if it's the latest Mycenaean, something which I think is the case, it, it, it's not as bold and it, it does not dare to use the, the Megaron itself and also not in the Megaron plan. Um, what they did here in Tyrians is also a direct reference to the previous building and they included, they built the entire building around the throne. That's really something very special. I know. I'm going to ask for some questions for oral work first, and then we'll circle circle back, back around. So let's ask for questions about our final paper, Ulrich's paper. First of all, anyone in the room, and then we'll go to the screen. You could have left Tom first, but uh, uh, <laughs> thank you for a wonderful paper, uh, Ulrich. Um, and it's a great idea to apply object biography to the, uh, the, the Megaron building. Um, the problem with object biographies, of course, is when does it become to be conceived as such? At the beginning of an object's life, during uh, its object life, or at the very end of it? And as archaeologists, we usually see, you know, we usually look backwards at the, at the very end of it. So my question is, is if you take this object biography, and especially in the Tyrion's case, essentially the layers of plasters on the various hearths that you that you showed would indicate that this 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 biography started much earlier or do you think it's something that is a conception at the very end of the megaron stage perhaps even and then we come back to the the, the previous uh, discussion um uh, in in later latic 3c thanks for that comment um, I think the first thing to, to keep in mind here is that the users need not conceive of something as an object or a building biography for it to be analyzed in those terms. I mean, perhaps, perhaps my final comment was a bit misleading in that way, but I was just too tempted by the pun on building biography, so sorry for that. Um, no, y you live in a building and it becomes, in I've long avoided using the term entangled, but it does become entangled with your biography <laughs> and that will leave traces. So uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to consider the first replastering as, as the first page of your family biography, but still it, will, it, it may well be that page. Um, I hope that at least partly answers your question. You, you also see examples, for example, in the case of communal graves, that you think, okay, at the initial states, they were planning a long-term history. And um, perhaps you could even conceive of the Megaron as such, or, 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 or the, the, uh, the central palatial buildings as uh, uh, as such, but this is getting speculative. I'm sure there are more. Uh, thank you for your answer. Okay, Tom, it's your turn. Tom, ask your question for Ulrich. Uh, well, again, not so much a question, but uh, food for thought or uh, speculation. Uh, and again, great praise. I, I think uh, your point about uh, emic and etic is extremely important. A and that brings me around to uh, the Mekarode uh, Opa uh, Isonios. Um, so we have, these ceilings are often connected with uh, animals uh, or uh, we don't know what this particular one is connected with, but OPA work 
generally in the ceilings from the Thebes ceilings is bringing a sacrificial animal uh, up to uh, the quality uh, that it would be uh, first be inspected to be a pure and perfect animal and then it would be uh, uh, maintained so that it would be suitable for sacrifice and then some of the ceilings as you probably know uh, the uh, the person who's um, responsible for hepoing the animal, the opa is just a nominationis for the process of hepo, which means to bring anything like uh, armor or an animal up to the perfect condition for its uh, being able to be used. So it, there, it probably is connected with some kind of, uh, I mean, if I had to speculate, uh, it, it would be uh, an animal that for whatever a reason uh, Isonios had to uh, produce for a sacrificial ritual. And it's going to the Megaron. Uh, the importance there is that uh, is your uh, point about trying to figure out what the emic use is. Uh, in my paper in the Ellen Davis uh, Festschrift, I spent a lot of time <laughs> uh, with, with the word Megaron. So we know it's part of the uh, what we might call the palatial vocabulary. Uh, the uh, person who wrote that ceiling uh, was, uh, I think, uh, undoubtedly uh, connected with the palatial center, and people are coming in to deliver their materials, and he's j jotting these things down. Uh, and uh, so it's part of the vocabulary, and therefore, you know, your idea of what does this mean. I think uh, I was convinced after doing a survey of things in Egypt where the word pharaoh means the big, the big room. <laughs> the, so the pharaoh is, is eventually associated, uh, you know, in Egyptian thought with the big, the big room. The big room. Uh, and Megaron, I think there's, that, that it is a, I really believe, uh, uh, but that's just my belief after having looked at all the evidence that Megaron really is a substrate term. Uh, that is one of these terms that the Greek speakers ad adopted, adapted from the existing uh, pre-Indo-European population, but then also uh, fashioned in such a way so that uh, the Greek word mega, big, uh, became part of the, uh, the association. And then when we look at what a megaron is, um, I, again, I'm, uh, there's a uh, Greg Nage, who's one of the most fertile and inventive thinkers, uh, points to a passage in Sophocles, Electra, I believe it is, where Agamemnon has a dream. And in the dream, he is taking the scepter uh, of the uh, house of Atreus, you know, which by the time Agamemnon is wielding, it is no longer alive. But he plunges the scepter into the hearth, and the scepter is renewed again. A and the, the best speculation as to what uh, wanox might mean and what uh, the, the word for king in, um, in, 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 in uh, Hittite might mean has to be a, an association with fertility. And so Naj and I, I think, both think that the instead of calling uh, the Megaron uh, form uh, in the Mycenaean period a throne room, we would rather call it the hearth room. And the hearth is the crucial thing. Okay. The hearth is the center of fire. The hearth is the center of warmth. And, and in this symbolic act that I th is, produced, uh, is preserved in the Electra, the hearth can actually reinvigorate the uh, the royal scepter can bring it back to its uh, life uh, as coming from a tree and so forth. So I think when uh, you know talking about what the emic uh, connotations would be for for Megaron, uh, and this would be important even for any kind of three C survival of the form. Uh, you know, these kinds of factors, the linguistic factors have to be taken into account. So along with the architectural history, uh, the, uh, we have to uh, keep in mind that I think in the middle Hellatic period, uh, 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 the substrate population had something in mind as to what the megaron or, or the, the word that the Greeks shaped from it uh, was. And uh, 
Uh, that's all I wanted to say. But I, I really do believe your uh, your emphasis on on the emic meaning of these important terms is uh, is uh, a, a very very fine point to to emphasize. Um, as food for thought goes, that was a three-course meal, which I look forward to nibbling at for quite a while. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just pick up on the one point um, where I might have been playing a bit fast and loose in my PowerPoint, at least, if not in the text. Um, I think there are two emic concepts we need to talk about, and they are separate at this point. Uh, one is the term megaro, and the other is the building. Um, it, 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 it's very tempting to assume that there is an identity, but really what excites me about that nodule from me there is just that this term, which has almost been demonized, is now proven to have had a reality. We still cannot link that reality to the, to the buildings we still like to call Megaron. But the, for, to me, more important point is there must have been a strong emic concept for whatever that building was called. And it doesn't have to be Megaron, but there was a clear concept in people's minds. Thank you again. Any other questions for Ulrich? Hold on one sec. Thank you so much, and I, I really think this concluding uh, Tyrian session was the, almost the perfect conclusion of, the, of this conference, really e extremely thought-provoking. Just two notes before we're getting a bit late, but, and this is for you, Orlich, and, uh, and Kostas, uh, interesting thoughts on the afterlife of the Homeric idea. The application of the Turin model in Mycenae we do not really know, but we have good evidence that this is Derpfeld driven specifically. And Judas doesn't usually do that, but in his first season in my scene, in the Practica of 1886, he has a footnote and specifically acknowledges and thanks Derpfeld for helping him figure out the architecture, and that's the year of the Megron. <laughs> so it's quite an interesting point, but this is, this is not independent. This is, this, is a, this is a string of discoveries in which at least the first two steps, the same scholar is involved, and we all know the role of Jebfeld in shaping our idea of Mycenaean and architecture. It is immense, and we, we are still not past his, his, um, his inheritance. And so, by, with, the, with the discovery of the next Mycenaean palace in Pylos in 1939, we have a hat trick. It is very easy to think that the Megron is typical of every Mycenaean site, which we really do not know for sure yet. Now, uh, coming to axiality, uh, you know, because we talked a bit about it in the coffee break, but I would go even further personally than Jim Wright, and I think axiality exists only if we isolate the Megaron as a module, which I am not entirely against it because it has this profound uniformity among the three palatial mega, but I will come to that too. But is, it, is this really a good idea? I mean, to isolate the Medugon as a module when you have it embedded within these winding routes from the gates to the great court before the Megaron, this is really not axial, as we were saying. So the axiality may be a mirage of our own attic uh, need to isolate the Megaron because we strongly think of Megaron terms because of Derpfeld's influence. That's an open question. And about uniformity, I have written about it. I still, I'm still impressed by the fact that this is in a level that we're not familiar with in Mycenaean architecture, the three palatial Megaron in the Peloponnese. And we still don't know if this is a Peloponnesian thing. We still don't know what the Megaron. intrusive Megaron in Pylos has to do with the Archelid, as Jerry Rutter has once said, it may be a Mycenae conquest. I, I'm not as bold as to say that, but this is, this is one opinion that has been expressed. But the pictorial programs in these three Megara are not that uniform. The ground plan is, the hearth is, the hearth decoration is similar, but the pictorial prog programs 
a major feature of your experience within the building, as far as we can tell, and keeping in mind that the evidence is very fragmentary, do not look that uniform. So I wonder if you have any comments on any of that. And I'll add in how many people actually would have seen that. Sorry? <laughs> um, that was extremely interesting, and I need to follow up on that a bit about Sundas, Stenk and Dirtfeld in particular. And obviously, uniformity does not mean exclusivity. I mean, we have Ayos Vasilios. We do not need to talk about the Megaron Palace as an exclusive and overarching concept everyone had to follow, but still there is a concept there which at three places, they did follow. Three at least, and at Dimini really, I mean, we need to be careful not to talk about the Megara at Dimini because Megaron B, in my opinion, does not deserve the designation. If deserve is a term, it just doesn't fit. But Megaron A, that is so clearly the same idea again. Um, you spoke about the isolation of a module and how that might play into the whole idea of axiality. And of course that has to do, as we discussed, with the whole idea of the godlike plan perspective. But to me it is crucial that there is a degree of similarity which plays into the experience of the space. And uh, for example, that goes to facades. There are visual linkages between the propila interiors and the Megaron facade, which I think must have been not from the perspective of the plan, but from the perspective of approaching all those um, built entities with two columns in antis, which must have been uh, uh, sent, sent a very clear message, and that is, I, I, I'd like to emphasize again, this is not about the plan, this is about the facade, so it's about experience. Also as to experience, the, the programs of decoration may have been somewhat dissimilar, but no, no, not may have, they were. But again, I think the way they were experienced does have similarities, and of course that's something I've, I've uh, developed more extensively in that paper about the uh, circular, the, the clockwise movement around the hearth. It seems that at several places, at least part of the Pictoria program could be read or even had to be read in a clockwise fashion. So. They may have been very dissimilar in the details, but again, the experience comes back to something very similar. Thank you. I think that some, somewhere in the Odyssey, uh, it is mentioned Scotina Megara, dark Megara. Uh, what, in what sense Homer says that? What did you know about the dark megara? Well, I, I, I can answer that very briefly. I, I honestly can't say. Uh, just anecdotally, at the, at the wonderful Karlsruhe exhibition on the on on. Uh, the Mycenaean world, there was obviously this lovely reconstruction of a Megaron which was given a bit of clear sky in the clerestory and that was, they had some sky left over from a previous exhibition so that was not a conscious decision by the <laughs> organizers of the exhibition to bring light into the Scotina Megara <laughs> but it was just economizing um, and I'm afraid that's all I can really re offer as a response. <laughs> And I want to come back to the, what Vasily said. Uh, I think the axiality fits, is, is really there. And it's, it, it makes sense if you look at the, the wider way how they reach the Megaron. And uh, my suspicion is that this, this meandering, this strange meandering, is part of making the people aware in the final step that this suddenly you have the direct route. And I think this is a Minoan element that is related with the Minoan Hall, with the Minoan throne room, which has similar meandering in Knossos before you reach the final axiality, the main building with its axiality. So I think the axiality also makes sense in the way how you reached it as the final part, which is different 
And finally, before, before that, you were really not seemingly going around in circles, and then from a certain point onwards, in, the th in, in very late in, in Tyrants, probably also in Mycenae, you are suddenly in this axis. And then you're drawn into the Megal. And in the throne room in Knossos, I think it's the same thing. It's actually the same experience when you go down into the cult center. You're meandering around and ramped around and then suddenly confronted with an axial building. Do you have any other comments you want to make at this point? Um, Peter, yep, you've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, I have a one um, addition. Um, I don't know if any of you has ever wondered uh, why is the throne on the right when you enter um, and eventually not on the left um, because um, at Troy, but um, I think it is now Troy 3, uh, Goxo Sashi ex excavated um, an additional megaron which is now covered by this um, thing, uh, the membrane, um, and there on the right side is a podest in the, in the middle of the long wall, which has been tentatively interpreted um, as a podest for, a, for some throne or whatever. Like there were no remains of the throne, but the podest is there. Um, and I think this information got lost um, in, in Aegean archeology. span And I don't know how it can be linked, uh, but I, I thought it, this is a, the right <laughs> place <laughs> uh, to stress it. Troy 3, like uh, Korfman called it uh, the latest Troy 2, uh, but I think uh, with uh, the work that uh, Sinan Unluso has done, uh, I think it moved into earliest Troy 3 now, if I'm right. Yeah, it's, it's early Bronze Age, 2B in Aegean terms, let's say. And I have also a general thing, but I don't want to, b but which is uh, different. Uh, so if there are further questions uh, linked to this question, Okay, good. Um, I've been tempted, not the whole time, but certainly today, to open a kind of a Pandora box about Schliemann himself. Um, because listening to the other papers um, and the descriptions, what he has done and what he has not done, um, and also talking to you during the coffee breaks, um, I had the impression that at Troy, uh, we have kind of embraced him much more and we are not so critical of what he has done and I keep thinking why this is so. Um, and um, my current interpretation is that um, it could be because of the type of site that 16 meters is high enough and no matter what he did, um, he still managed to recognize the the major strata, even if it's one meter each, um, as opposed, let's say, to Mycenae or in Tirins, where he came and, and he directly excavated as if one stratum. I don't know how much deposits Schliemann dug away, but maybe it was only one meter in Tirins, maybe it was one and a half meters, but it was not 16 meters. Um, and so, so that's one thing. Um, and then when, because it, also, Josef made it very pregnant, the point that um, we cannot associate any of the finds with the, with the rooms. Um, and that, admittedly, we cannot do also at Troy, but at least thanks to his diaries, um, and because we know where he excavated and we know how, uh, how he moved uh, within the, this Schliemann Trench, and thanks to work of Donald Easton, we can reconstruct a lot but that has been again guided by the, the structure of the tell, that the citadel is a, is a tell. Um, and then at one point, um, he opened up the, and excavated much of the center uh, of the early Iron Age citadel um, and the Megara. And there again, we cannot associate anything with the Megara. Um, but, um, and here I would like to kind of, I don't want to say blame Derpfeld, but mention Derpfeld that already in Tirins, Derpfeld was there. And also in later campaigns at Troy, Derpfeld was there. And also the final 
campaign, which excavated most of Troy 6, was done by Derford himself, and we still have not a single vessel pinpoint to its origin. Um, so, uh, because uh, sometimes I get asked, even back from the students, like, how comes the Chiliman didn't know how to excavate better, and that there has been already the excavations in Pompeii, and which are wonderfully documented. Yes, there was Tamatakis, who knew how to document, respectively had this concept that it's necessary. Uh, but um, how we conceptualized uh, intellectually Schliemann, what you have done in your introductory paper, um, it's simply to me, because Derpfort for us is also a, a god, um, and it's interesting that he didn't, even though he documented so many other things, he didn't have this feeling for the pottery or for the finds. I have no answer, but I just wanted to express it here. Thanks. So, are we, we satisfied, tired, ready to hand back over to Massimo? Thank you all very much for this, for this wonderful last session. Let's have a hand for our speakers and our questioners as well. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Robella Finer left me the task to close this conference. His wife is just arrived in uh, Cagliari Airport. I would like just to say that uh, it was a privilege for us to know, to see the result of your research in the sites first excavated by Schliemann that we have honored in the last three days, it seems to me, correctly. I would like also to thank all the colleagues that follow us, join us by Zoom with uh, some <laughs> problems sometimes. <laughs> And in particular, my friend Maurizio Del Frail, that suggests us the name for this uh, uh, conference with the joke between uh, Icne and Icnus. Uh, Robert Lafiner will send you soon, uh, you, you can uh, be sure, very soon, a paper with uh, the details about the publication. By the way, we will see tomorrow for the excursion to Cagliari Museum at uh, to Barumini. Important, the bus will leave exactly at 8.30. I underline 8.30, because, uh, just a moment, at the Mistral Hotel, when we uh, uh, had the lunch in the last three days, okay? Just there. Uh, now relax you and enjoy your stay in Sardinia with us. Thank you very much. Messaggio di chi? Ah, ok, thank you very much. Hi Tom, see you. I don't hear you, you have the microphone off. Ok. Bye. I was saying I still have the Marlon Brando look. <laughs> I want to say, uh, for me, I, uh, Iphigenia and I have been uh, <laughs> s sending emails back and forth about uh, the topics that this has uh, prompted us to be thinking about. So um, it's, it really is, was a very stimulating conference. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Arrivederci.